Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships for 2024. And you reckon 2023 was good? 2024 is going to be massive. Welcome to round one, the Hugh Gidney Memorial Meeting. And it's being put on this weekend by the MG Car Club. And got to say, they have started off with a very, very high benchmark. We've enjoyed a fantastic private practice day here on Friday. Great days qualifying and racing yesterday. And we have got a full program today. Let's have a quick look at the calendar for the year. Round one, obviously, here this weekend. Round two, Winton, March 16, 17. Booked my accommodation last night. Got it at the right price. So if you're going, book tonight before uh, anyone else starts to get their bookings in. Phillip Island, May 17, 18 and 19. Back here at Sandown for the uh, Australian Sports and Association event, 23, 24, 25 of August. Then September at Phillip Island, 2022 20, of September and Calder, 26 and 27 of October at the end of the season. Without too much further ado, we have got the uh, sports cars out on track and they will be joined in a combined grid just to throw any confusion out there for anyone with the 944s. It, uh, it was a good race yesterday in both the categories. So looking forward to how this goes here. We've got Jack Attlee, which we all know and love, calling the um, Porsche 944s for this one and a new person on the commentary team for this weekend will be Emma Dean. We pass over to our commentators for the first race for Sunday morning. Welcome Jack, welcome Emma. Good morning Darren, good morning everyone. Wherever you're watching all around the world on Blendline TV and welcome to the iconic home of horsepower, Sandan International Raceway. Good morning, Emma. Good morning, Jack. Great to have you with us. It's great to be here. Yeah. I'm so excited. These guys, uh, we had a couple of DNFs yesterday and on screen there in the 76 Toyota, 86, we've got Miley Miller, 15 years old. She couldn't get out yesterday because of some engine trouble, which is devastating for her and the crew. But fingers crossed today goes off without a hitch and she has a great race. Absolutely, yeah. It'll be great to see Miley move up the field there. It's going to be an interesting race. Uh, as we've said yesterday, it's slightly different for round one this year or for this uh, round of the championship. We've got a combined grid. You've got two real distinct classes here. You've got the cup cars and the 911s up the front of the class. And then, of course, you've got the Porsche 944 category which will start from a second grid. They'll start 10 seconds later than the grid in front. There is a, a fairly high speed difference. We've had a slight off already with King Richard there, Richard Howe and the number eight, 944, just warming up the tyres as they get out to the grid. It's pretty cool conditions this morning, so that's going to be imperative. They really need to warm up the brakes, warm up the tyres, which is why you see the cars squirming all over the place, I guess, but uh, they're trying to get the heat into these tyres, into this uh, cool Melbourne conditions. Yeah, um, UVs are at, a, at a low, it's the lowest point it's going to be today. Uh, one o'clock yesterday, the track times came down or came, went up a little bit, I guess, yeah. um, because of the UV and the heat coming off the track. The uh, tyres on the Porsches on these 991 Cup cars need to come up a bit and that Audi R8 LMS that we've got out there definitely needs to get some warmth into those tyres because he's starting from the back after having some problems with the V-Box yesterday. Uh, so him and Andy Hall, both DNFs, Andy Tudor in the Audi and Andy Hall in the um, white and green cup car. They're Absolutely. coming from the back, so that's going to be a battle to we're, turn one. We're definitely looking forward to seeing those two guys coming through. Andy Tudor there in the Audi R8 and Andy Hall, as you mentioned, they're very, very experienced campaigner and Porsche race car driver. And uh, he will certainly be, I'd imagine, scything his way through the field pretty quickly. We're gridding up already. It's, uh, we're straight into it this morning. So the cars are virtually set. We're in the starters' hands and we're waiting for race two of round one of the 2024 season here at Sandown. Yellow flags are just starting to wave. Marshals are in position and we're waiting for the lights. You've got Daniel Reynolds who will start on pole from Steven Sluger who will Andrew Smith head the in field. Third. Robin Bailey in fourth. We've got Sal and Bronyo in fifth in the Toyota 86. 16 years old, looking to do scholarship 86 program this year. Certainly a challenge for those drivers. But look out for the Audi, look out for Andy Hall as they charge their way through the field. Iconic scenes here at Sandown, looking down the long front straight here. That's where you're going to take advantage of the slipstream. Yeah, ideally for uh, Andy Tudor, if he can slip in behind Andy, if Andy Hall makes a move up in the middle of the pack, 
should be able to slip in behind and, and trail. <laughs> Let's hope crossed. so. All speculation <laughs> at this stage. You never know what's going to happen into turn one here at Sandown. It's hard on the brakes as you head down this long straight, but um, they'll know pretty quickly. So we've got a slight delay by the looks of it on the grid there. We're still waiting on the lights, but um, we've, and we may have had a spinner on the outlap. We've got a fairly lengthy delay. They're holding the guys there at the moment. So we've got a slight delay. Engines are getting very warm. Just on that. Yeah. We're just Pete Lawrence, sorry. Oh, that's it. We're waiting on Pete Lawrence in the uh, M4 comes. GT4. And he's peeled off. Peeled off. So uh, he's not going to start the race by the looks of it. That's a shame. That's, that's a, real a real shame. That's a real shame. To have that beautiful... Uh, first race weekend in that car. Beautiful M4 off the grid. But here we go. All set now for race two. Let's see the matchup between the 3.891s and the 5.2 litre Audi. Can't wait. Absolutely. Revs here rise. We go. Lights are on. Here we go. In the starter's hands. And they're away. And they're off. Looks like Reynolds got a great start there off the line. Not a lot of wheel spin. One of the Toyota 86s oh, yep. did miss the start a little bit there. Andy but Tudor has slipped in behind Andy Hall, now in behind Steve Sluger. Got a good start. So did Robin Bailey wow, yeah. in that 370. Fantastic. So you'll see Reynolds there will take the lead into turn one. Looks like Sluger's got it behind. Right on him. And away we go for race two with the Porsche 944 category as well. They'll stream down uh, this long front straight as well. This is the matchup I've been wanting. Daniel and Andy Hall. Uh, Daniel Reynolds, I should say, and Andy Hall. Unbelievable start by Andy Hall. You can see there in the cup car. As we look at the 944 field streaming through turn one, Jamie Westaway. The two-time champion takes the lead into turns one, two, and now into turn three, just ahead of Mark Verdino there. Cam Bella, as we were yesterday, first, second, and third. Cam Bella in the Aqua number 55 with Chris Lewis-Williams right on his bumper. Now, Chris Lewis-Williams in the 37 tyre power Benalla ooh, car there is the ooh, reigning champion. Ooh, elbows action. out between Daniel and Andy. Oh, fantastic, Andy. Wow, this is the battle that's to, that, that we've got to watch. And Andrew Smith, Steve Sluger, it's tight. And Andy Tudor coming up behind. This is great. I'm uh, loving this. Unbelievable, and it's only lap one, but what a start <laughs> by Andrew Hall. You can just see the experience of this campaigner as he leads the field. The tyres aren't even up to temp, Jack. <laughs> no, he's, he's really not messing around today. He had alternator issues in that car yesterday, but he's definitely making up for it today, and he's an experienced campaigner, and as you can see, he will lead the field as they head round and, and complete lap one. I'm impressed with Andy Tudor, because normally the Audis hang back for the first one, two laps while they're getting tyre temps up, but he's right in there. It's fantastic. Andy Tudor there in the Audi, and we can see the uh, Toyota 86 there Sal and Bronyo, and there's Miley Miller. Great to see them out. Fantastic to see Miley out on track, and we wish Miley all the best for the racing career. As we now head back towards the 944 category, and you can see the bright yellow car there of Jamie Westaway, two-time champion leading the field as they go through turn one again. It's a drive-through corner turn one, so it's a fairly quick corner. They're hard on the brakes as you enter it, but um, very quick corner as you uh, come through that corner. And here is the, cri the critical corner on the racetrack, turn four, and a fantastic shot there from Blendline TV. As you can see, the car's streaming out of turn four. They really want to get the drive out of that corner because they're going to head up this really long back straight. Here it called it. Oh my goodness, we've had a massive incident there. I agree. Joey Kellogg in the 1800 Lasagna car has clipped or run into, or what's happened there, I'm not sure, I haven't seen a replay yet, but that's Mark Torbett's in the yellow Pipecraft car, El Presidente, as we call him. And dare I say it, Emma, there's lasagna all over the racetrack <laughs> at the moment. You could say that, yeah. So that's been an incident. That's a very tight corner there, turn four. So the guys have probably got in there a little hot with cold brakes, still cold uh, tyres. So as you mentioned there, Emma, getting everything still up to speed at the moment. We've just got a fairly long race, but... Uh, We've got a few battles going on here. We've got Andy Smith Hall. and Sluger. Andy Hall's just ripped a 113 on lap two. Like that. That's pace. That is yeah, I think he put some fresh tyres on and those new springs are working well for him. Absolutely <laughs> moving. They're, they're, they're topping out at, you'd have to say, about 240, 250 250, k's. 250 down that back straight and the main straight. So they're coming into about between 160, 170 going into is it turn six. five, turn six there. Through there. That's uh, hairy, that's uncomfortable. Absolutely. <laughs> Andy Tudor there was in the Audi there. We just caught a, a brief glimpse of Andy Tudor. It's great to see Andy out 
on truck. And he came out of the Porsche 944 category and has moved into the stunning Audi R8 there. And you can see him already catching up the field. He had uh, He's some... already within a second of his best time on Friday, which is fantastic. He's got yeah. a 117 and he's just coming on. Believe it or not, those tyres are just starting to warm up those Pirellis. Yeah, they're a big set of Pirellis. He's got, and there's two different tyres on these cars, as uh, we spoke about yesterday. You've got the Michelins versus the Pirellis, I guess. And we can see, unfortunately, Mark Torbett's heading into the pits there. He might have sustained some damage in the Pipecraft car. That yellow car is normally run by Tim Wolfe, who has moved up into the Porsche Michelin GT3 Challenge. Mark Vadino getting very wild and woolly out on the corner there, heading out onto the grass. He knows he's got the current reigning champion, Chris Lewis-Williams, in the number 37 tyre power car all over the back of him. And he knows he needs to get the power down coming out of uh, turn 12. They go through turn 13 now, which is effectively a flat out Ooh. corner, so it's a kink, but... Um, There's Sam Imbrogno down the bottom the left of screen at the moment. He's doing well. When I spoke to him yesterday, he would be happy for a 126, and he's chasing it. He's done a 127 that last lap. It's fantastic. Miley Miller falling back a little bit, but she's still in there. Real close battle there, exactly. Great to see Miley still heading around. May have some issues, but... Uh, up at the battle pack in the 944. There's Adam Brewer ducking under Cameron Baller there. The Black Widow Spider, number three. He is really wanting to get his championship race underway today because he had a bit of a bit of an off yesterday. He got pole position yesterday morning, so he really wants to charge. Wow, look at that close racing back through the field. You've got Jimmy Mitchell, Richard Howe, and you've got the newcomers, and we welcome them to the uh, 94 category. And there's El Presidente, Mark Torbett, pulling over as uh, a very experienced campaigner that he is, pulling over and letting the guys through. He knows there's a lap down now as well, so he's not going to get in the way of these four front runners as well. So awesome to see Johnny Venoris, Andrew Goldman, who's new to the category, and uh, great to see him charging through the field. Well, already that's Lyndon Watson, unfortunately, in the Don Watson transport pulling over. He's got issues by the looks of it as well. So never a dull moment. No, not at all. Summer. And just watching Daniel Re Reynolds charge through those 944s like nothing. It is not nothing, I can tell you. In that car, that is dicey. It is definitely not nothing. There's certainly <laughs> a, a wide range of classes and, and engines and performance uh, spread throughout this field. And uh, speaking of fields, we, we do thank our, uh, our, our key sponsor. We'll just have a quick look at this replay. Wow, that either that engine or he's got a right rear there may have gone down by the looks of it. But he's got certainly plenty of smoke coming out of the back of that Lyndon Watson car. Back up the front there, you've got Jamie Westway, who continues to lead. From Mark Vadino, who was a race winner last year in the number 44 sidling car there. And again, he's really setting a benchmark this year. He knows he's got a quick car. And he's up against two or three very experienced campaigners there. Chris Lewis-Williams, Adam Brewer, and the four-time champion, Cam Bella. And we've got Andy. Andy is just getting faster and faster. Andy Hall in that uh, 991 Cup car. He's just done one. Let's have a look. Uh, we might have a replay here of that tyre, that right rear on Lyndon Watson's oh. car. Wow, there you go. Oh. That's one way to uh, flatten a tyre. You can slam into the wall at turn four. So he's brushed the wall. It's easy to do at turn four because you really want to get the drive out of that corner. He's pushing very hard, but he's clipped that wall. You do have to hug it tight. You certainly have to hug it tight. Maybe not that tight because no. that tight has, um, has <laughs> that's certain... squeezing. That's got rid of that tyre, absolutely. And now look at this. Andy Hall right in the mix. We've got a menacing 991 Cup car in the mix of the 944s. Absolutely. Andy's pulling the 113s now. They're getting faster and faster. And you'll see the guys. difference there, yeah. But you've got two really distinct cars. You've got a front engine car, the Porsche 944 and of course the Toyota 86 just going through screen there again. Compared to the rear engine car of the 911 Cup cars, they've got bigger tyres, they've got a huge big wing on the back so a lot of aero difference between the two cars totally through, through the corners they're actually similar in speed but it's just down these long straights here at Sandown where they'll really pick up the, the high end and top end speed of those uh, 911 cup cars that's where you'll see the difference well the cup cars have the, the, the choice because they they start off great they're off the line great they come up to temp really quickly they've got so much support in Victoria and Australia parts are easy to come by mechanics are around great support for the category so that's why they're so popular and we do we do thank our support for the category and of course, of course porsche cars australia are adorned on all the uh, 944 cars there as well and a global super brand you'd have to say porsche so and very... our wonderful sponsors for the production car production sports car racing i should say callus kenny intellects lawyers 
blasted on all of the cars. Excellent to have them on board. And, and while we're on it, a very big shout out this morning to LK Diesel Service as well, who are uh, partnering up with the 944 category this year. And we thank them very much for their, their service. We look forward to seeing LK Diesel, Don Watson Transport, EJM Advice, got a blue flag there that just means that there's a faster car coming through and you can Let see that the, Audi 3. the 79 of Andy <laughs> Tudor who as we mentioned the West Australian driver he's driven this car a lot over in Barbagallo Raceway this is his first time we're in anger in the Audi R8 there and you can just see him streaming down and taking full advantage of those long straights at Sandown. And Jack, whilst it's not a, a, a brilliant aero track, the aero on this car sets it apart from all the other cars out there. He's got to trust that car going into those corners super fast. His brake markers are so much shorter. Um, great ride. Inside it feels like terror. But on the outside, it just looks phenomenal. <laughs> Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head there, actually, uh, as well. It's a very good point. I was talking to uh, Andy Tudor, a very good uh, friend, and I know Andy, well, that car, to me, looks like a spaceship inside. And he had that many flashing red lights. He had more flashing red lights than a Christmas tree on that car yesterday afternoon. So it's almost computer run, dare I say. I mean, it is like, well, it's like a spaceship inside. And it looks like a car, and it's got a steering wheel and four wheels. but driving it's anything but you've got to take everything you know about driving a normal car throw it out the window and relearn you've got to be prepared to be a student in these cars and when you do it rewards you every time absolutely well said exactly mark Verdino there just coming through on screen chris lewis williams just ahead of adam brewer there in the black and red number three car so just getting again passed by one of the cup cars there as they head down these long straight you'll get a, a fairly good uh, slipstream advantage here at Sandown, it's one of the key areas that you've got oh, to uh, take got, advantage of. Sorry, Jack, we've got Andy Tudor hunting down Andrew Smith here. He could have him under brakes on those corners, and, it, you know, if he finds the trust in that car, he will. He'll eat that 997 alive. Definitely. He's coming up to speed, Andy Tudor, and getting used to that Audi R8, as we said, and he's up against some uh, stunning cars in the 911. Some cars. Like the drivers. <laughs> yeah, and good drivers, exactly, too. They're very experienced campaigners as well. Great to see the Toyota 86 going around. Similar pace, slightly, maybe uh, just off the pace of the 944s. We've certainly got some damage there on the yellow pipe craft car. We send a big shout out to Tim Wolf. Well, here we go, here we go with Andrew Smith and Andy Tudor cutting through the 944s. There's a bit of a race going on here. Traffic everywhere, exactly, but you will get traffic in different classes. Wow, Verdino had to go wide as they head over that uh, fast turn six ripple strip as well. There's 37, the tight power car of Chris Lewis Williams, really trying to improve from yesterday. Andy Tudor just scything through the field. Yeah, and it's a bit of a moment in those cars going over those um, ripple strips. You can you can unsettle the car, so you've really got to minimise how much you get on them. Absolutely. that aero is just working for you. If you lift it too much, you unsettle it. Absolutely. It does um, unsettle the rear of the car. The, the Curbs are quite high here at Sandown as well, so you've got to sort of use them as best as you possibly can. But this is where Andy could totally take, take Andrew. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe he just doesn't have the confidence yet in the car. He should be using that brown gate as a, as a marker. He might get him, as you mentioned there, and uh, down one of those long back straights. He's in a great position here now as he moves up, and he's really going to take full advantage out of this turn four. That's the dramatic shot that we and all love here at Sandown. he's close enough, he's getting pulled along, which is great. Exactly. He will... Uh, You'll take full advantage of that um, slipstream as they head up this long, long straight. And that Audi is absolutely moving. But it's a fantastic comparison between the beautiful Porsche car there versus the Audi car as well as they yeah, head you through wouldn't want Yeah, you wouldn't want a black Audi in your rear view. It's pretty menacing. And absolutely. It is a menacing looking car. But uh, <laughs> I certainly would, would, would not underrate um, that 911. By the looks of it, we're on the final lap there now. So... As we mentioned, um, a really stunning performance and a great comeback, if I may say, by Andrew Hall this morning. He had issues yesterday, but he's really setting the tone now, sitting on the 113 flat. Oh, I need so. to give a shout out to Andy's sponsor, Panta Fuels. He loves those guys. They're running the 102 this weekend, so might be the edge Andy needed to get over Daniel. We love Panta Fuels absolutely as well, and that, that could have given him just a, a little extra boost there, but he's certainly been the class of the field, and he's been Quite a, run. a very experienced campaigner. A very, um, very controlled and highly experienced race car driver there, Andy Hall. We all know his experience. So as he heads down the bottom, what we call Dandenong Road, through the final kink under the bridge, it's a really commanding performance this morning. He is back in business and he will take victory. 
as he heads out of the final corner in race two of oh, fantastic. the sports car championships. It's Andy Hall. Well done, Andy. Who will lead home yesterday's winner, Daniel Reynolds. And we've got Stephen Steve Sluger in third, Steve Andrew Sluger. Smith in fourth, Andy Tudor in fifth, Peter Lawrence in sixth, Robin Bailey in the 370Z in seventh. And then we're looking for Sal Imbrogno. He's come up 13th and Miley Miller at the back of the pack. But, hey, it's a finish and it's her first time out at, at uh, Sandown. It's fantastic. Absolutely sensational. Great to have Miley with us this morning. Still raging battles on the final lap here of the Porsche 944 category as well. You're looking at Adam Brewer there just ahead of the number 55 in the Aqua Car, Cameron Bella, the four-time champion. That's a close race. But out in front, once again, commanding victory by the two-time champion Jamie Westaway in the yellow and black car. He will again head home Mark Verdino, who is certainly uh, having a great start to his season. They'll come home ahead of Chris Lewis-Williams, who completes the podium just ahead of the Black Widow spider, Adam Brewer. And Cam Bella will bring home the top five. Oh, what a great race. Fantastic. There goes Sam Imbrogno across the finish line. Fantastic Excellent to for see. the 16-year-old. Still got a number of finishes to come through the field regarding the 944 category. The M4 there has just crossed Peter the line Lawrence. as well. Torbett's is rolling around. Unfortunately, had some issues there with an incident with Joey. We'll get a replay on that one. Tony Andreski, the boss, as we call him, crosses the line there now, ahead of the orange car of Michael Westaway. Great to see Michael How back in the good category. How that M4 look, Jack? Yes, yeah, stunning. <laughs> and we'll run through the final results. So Andrew Hall, as we mentioned there, home by 2.9 seconds over Daniel Reynolds. Stephen Sluger. Andrew Smith in fourth, Andy Tudor in fifth, Peter Lawrence in that lovely M4, GT4 in sixth, Robin Bailey in seventh, Jamie Westaway in eighth, Mark Vadino in ninth, Chris Lewis-Williams in tenth. And that'll be the top three there in the 944 category. As we mentioned, two distinct classes in this race this morning. Adam Brewer, Cam Bella, home just ahead of Salvatore and Bruno. As we said, two different classes. He's in another class there. The Toyota so, 86. Tony Andrewski, Michael Westaway, Miley Miller. Fantastic to see Miley finishing that, rap, that, uh, that lap and those races. King Richard, Richard Howe came home ahead of Jared Campioni and Andrew Goldman. Just a quick uh, thank you again if we can. Great to see the field completed there as well with Jimmy Mitchell, Mark Torbitz, Lyndon Watson had some issues with the tyre, Johnny Venoris and Sam Roth, who we welcome to the category, unfortunately had some issues there with overheating. Porsche Cars Australia, LK Diesel Service, Don Watson Transport, EJM Advice, Campioni Electrics, Stratton Finance Hobart, we welcome them to the field as well and we thank them. 1800 Lasagna, get down to Thornbury if you haven't been down there before, AVI Technology, of course, Triple Eight Home Loans, who we thank very much for being another partner this year. And Pit Lane Clothing, if you need to get out and get some fantastic looking clothing, get on the Pit Lane Clothing site. <laughs> thank you very much, Emma. What a fantastic start thank to day you, two. Thank you, Jack. It was too. Can't wait for 105.
there for the, for the day? Yeah, I've got voices in my ears though, so that's okay. <laughs> As long as the weather's okay, it's fine. Yeah, nice and still is good too. Yeah. You don't want any wind up there. It's hard enough to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just here for a couple of races and then we're going to hit that thing as well. Yeah. You need it to yourself. Welcome back, Trackside at Sandown. Let's have a look as we hone in from the big wide planet of ours into the beautiful city of Melbourne. And smack bang down in the southeast wedge between Springvale and Dandenong is this magnificent Sandown facility. Originally a, a horse racing track and still is for most parts of it, but we've got this fantastic piece of tarmac, this ribbon that runs right around the perimeter of the property here. Turn one, it's a big charge down the straight here as Darren Hossack alluded to in the sports sedans yesterday. It's a couple of big long drag strips and you've just got to set the car up to wiggle its way through the other bits and pieces of the circuit here. Up to turn four, you've got that fantastic camera mounted down low, just in between the uh, the concrete blocks that make up the wall there. Watch for that shot throughout today. It's a, it's a ripper, really good, uh, really good spot that Glenline have researched to put the camera down there. Down into turn nine, the famous Dandenong on road after plunging across turn six, which is uh, about the corner you really need to set the car up from here because the rest of the place is very much like a street circuit. Onto the straight you come and it's all on with that drag race again. A guy that is here trackside with us this weekend working on some Formula Fords. John Martin holds a lap record from a couple of years ago. A 104.553. It's going to take some beating that lap record in the next uh, in the next decade or so. I would suggest that John's going to hang on to that for quite some time until maybe S5000 gets some life breathed back into it and uh, get those things back out here. Of course, last year at this round, while the sports sedans are rolling out, Thomas Randall really came to the race meeting to try and break the lap record. He did. He took it off Jordan Caruso. It was a 107.50. Thomas reset it at a 107.4, so it was 0 0.06 of a second faster than what uh, Jordan did it in. And I would suggest uh, in the not too distant future, John Gourlay will probably roll the Audi out as well and try and uh, get some more there. Sports sedans are out on track. You've got Darren Smith and right alongside me for this one is Callum Brennigan. He's going to join me for this uh, race. Let's have a look at uh, this grid sheet as they come down. Dean Cam is very much accustomed to the front row of the grid and P1 after a, uh, a very, very well driven race yesterday. Let's say he didn't have it without coming under fire to the car that sits next to him on the grid in Jim Policina. The uh, McDonald's, the Golden Arches on the bonnet of uh, Jim's supercar and uh, he drove a very good race. Towards the end of the race as the Corvette was starting to feel the distance, uh, Jim Policina started to strike. So he's felt it out and I'm pretty sure he will be on maximum attack right from the beginning. Hard to beat Dean Cam off the line in the Corvette. Out of P3, car number 23, reigning champion Francois Habib doing a tremendous job, gratefully accepting the trophy at the presentation of dinner at the Groove Train at Eastland. Thoroughly recommend you get along there before going to the movies or whatever it is, just head into Eastland for a food at the Groove Train. So Francois, reigning champion. Car number 29 out of P4 will be Brett Dickey, who sets off on his annual international racing odyssey. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, big shout out for Project Import guys watching on from California in North America. Look after our Brett, he's a rapid racer and uh, you guys give him a best piece of equipment to attack Pikes Peak and of course the Circuit of America's in the next couple of weeks as well. So watch for Brett, car number 29, turbocharged four cylinder, in every way a true sports sedan. John Ippolito will be next out there in the number 97. Did a good job yesterday, as did Brian Finn. They raced really hard. Ben McLeod wants to push himself into the five after taking a uh, handful of trophies from last season. Travis Condon raced right throughout last year in the National Series. Bathurst, Gold Coast, tick the boxes, living the dream. And let me tell you, he's the kind of bloke uh, that does live the dream every time he rolls out that bright green Corolla. Yes, that's right, a V8. 
stashed under the dashboard of that uh, Corolla with Travis Condon. Alan Nash out there, you'll know that car. It's the PE Perkins Engineering Jack Daniels uh, liveried car. Graham Gilliland, the bright 20B powered RX-7 out of Melton Body Works, GNG Engineering. Watch for Graham. The cameras love that car, brightly coloured. Michael Luff is next in the all-white Commodore car number 35. Great to see Michael uh, out there, a car that was in the build for quite some time. Rand McGlurkin Sr. in the 350Z. Scott Stevenson driving the Bruce Henley RX-8. Adrian Reed, car number six, the brick, the little mini, turbocharged. Watch how quick it goes. Kevin Stupin from rear of the grid had an overboosting problem yesterday and will be very quick. Greg Lynch, also rear of the grid, and I'm not sure that Darth Brown has joined us. We're not too far away from a race start, as you can hear them banging those V8s on the first two rows of the grid. And we've got the Bollards Direct, car number 29 there of Brett Dickey as well, and away we go. Everyone just sort of bobbles their way off the line there, walks it off, and away we go down into turn one. Talking about bobbling and walking off, not a problem there. Power down for the Corvette as they head down to turn one. Francois Habib looks to the inside. Ippolito up on the outside there. They're going to go two Commodores side by side. Ippolito in the 97. Power down. Gee, that's working well for him this weekend. Brett Dickey just struggling to get the turbo off the line there. He's North American bound. He's going to give them a lesson on how to go racing at uh, the Circuit of Americas in the next couple of weeks. And uh, there goes Travis Condon. He's made up a couple of spots. Ben McLeod, Michael Luff, he's pushed hard. There's Lynch, Adrian Reed in the little mini there. Have them look at that. Helen, welcome to Sports Sedan for 2024. Good morning, Darren. Good morning, everybody. I'll let you catch your breath now. This is a good start for the Sports Sedan's field. Francois Habib, we saw at turn three, he had the tail of that car in all sorts, uh, wagging the tail as he came out of turn three there. So cold, tyres, cold, brakes, it takes a long time. Well, it takes a little bit of uh, time, a few laps for the temperatures to come up into the optimal window. Uh, of course, a majority of the field, if not the entire field, are running on the slip tyres as well, and it's not too far in, uh, in duration for this race. Have a go, that Corolla being thrown over the high curbs here at Sandown Motor Raceway. Very good morning uh, to everybody who are tuning in from home, but for everyone who are in the vicinity close to Sandown Raceway, we encourage you to come down and get your tickets from the gate if you want to come and see motorsport up close and personal. Brett Dickey on screen here, as you alluded to. Darren, he'll be headed to North America as he, ha as he has done so for the last few seasons. And he's all over the back of Habib as well. So that Dodo coming through turn four. This is a beautiful shot as well. We should point out the wonderful initiatives being brought to this weekend by the crew at Blend Line TV working hard to bring you these wonderful pictures of uh, the, what is the best state racing series in Australia. Brett Dickey now all over the back of Francois Habib, showing a good turn of speed. We're talking a four-cylinder turbocharged car here. These two cars up in front north of 650 horsepower, and I'm probably selling them a fair way short there as well. But uh, the Dodo car there is a full-spec supercar of the era. The car in front, the 97, is a sports sedan. It might look like a uh, supercar type of era, but no, it is a, uh, a true sports sedan out there. And have a look at that little Honda hiding it behind the uh, Habib car. He'll probably start to look out and get some fresh air. And the turbo winds up, draws alongside Brett Dickey and the Bollard's direct entry charges up the outside there. Francois Habib is not going to capitulate. He's going to have to work harder than that in the Honda Prelude to get around there. But the Bollard's direct car is absolutely working underneath Brett now. Had some, uh, had some boosting issues over the last couple of seasons, but the car looks to be working well. We'll see as he gets the power down there. Francois has gone tight on turn four, so let's hope that Brett can flow the Honda a bit better. Here comes Travis Condon. Before you know it, he'll be on the back of him. This is our, now our race leader, Dean Cam, Jim Policina. Both exceptionally experienced race drivers across many, many years. In fact, Dean Cam now three decades at the wheel of a race car. Went to America last year with his Formula 5000 Chevron. Represented Australia very, very well. And now he's back on home territory with the Corvette. Synonymous with podiums and, uh, well, more synonymous with its amazing starts that it makes. Cross the bumps underneath the bridge there at Dandenong Road. Go to two Commodores and the Honda. But the 97 being driven very, very well indeed here. John has uh, come into this season. Very, very high expectations. Now, 
Brett turns the wick up again on the turbo car, looks to the inside, goes over to driver's left, tries to draw alongside. He'll put himself in the position under brakes, but no. Callum, have a look at the green car starting to rage up on the, this battle as these three rage on with it. And then there's looming Ippolito there, dropping behind Francois Habib. Oh, and that's Luff on screen there. Smoke coming out the front of his VE Commodore now. That's down at turn 12 on the right-hand side, or the driver's right-hand side there, and the car is smoking and it is stranded. So, as a guess, he probably won't be taking further part in this race, race control. And doing a fantastic job this weekend. All the uh, officials here this weekend ensuring this race meeting goes and runs as safely as it does up the inside there is Brett Dickey though. So he takes that position away from Ippolito. So Dickey's lost touch ever so slightly from Habib who completely locks up the front left-hand side there coming into turn nine. Keeps it together. He doesn't make a tour off track that time around there, but that was a massive block break there. And that tire will be resembling a 50 cent piece after that one. So there's now we're hearing there's oil on the track yep, so you there. Yeah, there it is, and they've how, all found it as they come through. You can see how slick it is. So they're all able to make it through there safely. But the Luff VA Commodore there has dispatched a lot of oil on the circuit. And we are hearing that the safety car has been called by race control. So Ippolito there with a bit of a run on the back of Dickey up the main straight there. But he wasn't able to do anything with it. So we see a safety car for... Uh, the first time today, Darren. Now, that is unfortunate. We love seeing sports sedans run uh, in entirely green conditions. Uh, but the Racer Industries VF Commodore there, the safety car, coming on to track right now. So that's a shame that we've nullified this race for, uh, let's hope it's just a clip and run to get the Michael Luff car out there. They may also have to do a little bit about the oil down at turns 11, 12. Uh, didn't make it to 13, but on around 10, 10, 11 and 12, as Stevenson comes onto the straight in the Henley, RX8, there's the car number 35, Michael Luff, who's stranded there. Adrian Reed in that amazing little mini. It's as wide as it is long as it is high. We'll probably go close to calling it a Rubik's Cube almost uh, the way it... Yeah, Cube is shaped. the right... I oh, see so you yeah. brushed up on your... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, on your shapes before you no, did. I've come the 3D shapes. I'm uh, well and truly across that. Um, interestingly enough, on that last lap, though, the 97 of uh, John Ippolito going back two spots. So he was uh, hanging on to it. And I dare say there's something wrong there because the car was go motoring along beautifully for the yeah. first three laps. And that last lap around lost I'm that spot. Pretty sure. So coming out of turn one uh, a couple of laps ago, the thing, it looked like it had a little murmur uh, in terms of uh, like his Commodore just having a bit of a mechanical glitch, uh, which allowed uh, Habib passed very easily. And then Brett Dickey just a few moments later after that as well. So you can see just how ginger they are taking it through that part of the circuit, Darren, where the oil is down. Now, keeping an eye out as well on Greg Lynch as well. So he's charged up to position nine after starting rear of grid. And Graham Gilliland uh, circulating out there in position 10 in that beautiful sounding triple rotor 20B Mazda RX-7. That's the orange car you can see right in the background there. Uh, there was an upgrade from the Gilliland crew last year where they went from a twin rotor to a triple rotor. And obviously the sound difference with this car alone, uh, apart from the horsepower improvement, uh, has been uh, very much appreciated uh, by Graham, who's working tirelessly behind the scenes as well to ensure that sports sedans nationally um, continues because it is an enduring category. Darren, it's got a huge long legacy it certainly is. in and, Australia. And Graham's one of those guys um, that if I ever go to the racetrack, even when Graham's had a bad day, you know, blown an engine, whatever it might oh, be, he's, he's still happy to be at the racetrack. So if you ever go to the racetrack, hey, he's a race he's sunshine. A sunshine. And, and as his wife, Anne, who we uh, we love to pieces, but uh, certainly the whole crew down there with the Bollards Direct, Melton Bodyworks RX-7 uh, are, are some of the happiest people you'll ever find, let alone at a racetrack in life, and they uh, they embrace the whole scene, so they do tremendous. Just watching now, the cars go through what seems to be the, the race driver's brain is to, once the safety car comes out, go from yellow line to yellow line, weaving your way along, just to keep, uh, I think, really scientifically, it's more about keeping the brain uh, awake than keeping tyre temperature in, and uh, it's, it's just one of those habits that race drivers had. There's Travis Condon, not at speed, an amazing little Corolla. Ryan Finn, there's Greg Lynch, who's charged from the rear of the field. Now, this is not good. Brett, uh, sorry, Ben McLeod looks to have gone backwards there. The 29, the Bollard's direct entry of uh, Brett Dickey. 
and here we go. There's oil uh, dust gone down there as well from the recovery crews. So they're just waving the field uh, to go a bit slower. Looks like the uh, industrial laser ram coming around there to uh, fix it up as well. And the bonnet is up. Fire is attending to, to that there. So the safety car just going through. They'll be The guys will try and be out of that oil down as much as possible. You don't want to get that on your uh, on your tyres. And uh, we are going to a chequered flag as uh, that is it. That will be race number two for the weekend for the sports sedans. Chequered flag under safety car conditions and uh, Dean Cam just giving it a bit of a tyre clean up, a bit of wheel spin heading towards the line there as we draw a close to race two for the Groove Train Eastland here at the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. Let's just interrogate the timesheets there a little bit. Dean Cam fastest lap on lap number two. Six laps completed, so we'll be able to grab points from that. Uh, 113.18 to Dean Cam, fastest car on track, and a 113.29 to Jim Policina and everyone else sort of slower around the 114s. Brett Dickey at 114.8. Francois Habib um, ultimately home in third on the podium there. So his total defence continues to go OK. And uh, just on screen now ran uh, McGlurkin Senior in that 350Z as well. Had smoke coming off that car yesterday, but uh, making it through under safety car conditions. Here it is. Final results for race two for the weekend. Of course, remember, there's only a little bit of time left for you to get down to uh, the... Uh, paddock office down there to get your tickets in the Metabo raffle. One for five dollars, three for ten, or the David Amor six for twenty special. Decam to Jim Policina takes out one and two. Francois Bib home in third place. Brett Dickey, Johnny Paletto, Travis Condon home in six. Brian Finn, Greg Lynch coming from Rear Field, ultimately finishing in eighth there. Double duties this weekend. Ben McLeod. Then we go to the Bruce Hentley car by Stevenson here today. And uh, it's a good on board there. Looks like the Honda of uh, Brett Dickey just in the background. Alan Nash, Kevin Snooper didn't uh, start and Dan Brand didn't start as well. So let's hope we can get a really good race for the sports sedans coming up for the final race for the weekend at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. And sadly, this is uh, on the warm down lap. This would have been a race lap now for Brett. But gee, you can tell the preparation that that family team go to get this car. Have a look at that. You could, it's like a Formula One, isn't it? Oh, it's a work of art. And it's a good example as well of the, the technical layout of a sports center and just how strange they can be, Darren. You can see all the, uh, the boxes and the internal structures going on there. Uh, alongside Brett, uh, he's looking very snug and very comfortable. And you can see the MoTeC display as well. A plethora of electronics as well uh, on hand for him through a sequential gearbox there. That thing must be an absolute delight to drive the Honda Prelude. Not thing, I shouldn't say that, Darren. But uh, this is a beautiful shot as well. So the live onboard cameras uh, pictures being brought to us by Blendline TV. You do not really get that anywhere else with Grassroots Motorsport. No, you in certainly terms don't. Of broadcast and um, also keep an eye out for the curb cam at the exit of turn four as well throughout today. We've got a huge program of racing coming our way as well, Darren. We've got four of these coming up very shortly. But just watching over Brett's shoulder there. Uh, he had a great day at the track yesterday. His uh, daughter, who's only a couple of months old, joined him here. So uh, next generation of uh, family races coming to the track, only a few months old. So he was uh, he was very excited yesterday, certainly about going racing, but to have his uh, newborn little girl with him here at the track was, uh, was wonderful. But yes, Callum, we have got a massive program still to come today. Race after race after race, that's what you want to go to the racetrack for. And we have just had 944s, sports cars and sports sedans. Coming up next, there it is, there is the Formula Vs on track next. Hyundai XLs, Vic V8s, Historic Touring and HQs, MG and Invited British Cars, Formula Ford and Saloon Cars round out our morning program. And then we do it all again this afternoon. Looking forward to it. Of course, sports sedans, great support by the Groove Train Eastland, QP Lubes and National Blind Suppliers. Also, a reminder to people at home, if you want to tune into our social channels, you can do so via Instagram, Vic State Race Series, all one word, all lowercase, of course. 
Um, and you can also find us on Facebook with Victorian State Race Series. Uh, give us a like, give us a follow, like the pages just to catch up on more content between events. And it's obviously the best place to uh, get photo highlights as well as uh, sharing content amongst this wonderful community that is the Victorian State. Let's not beat about the bush, but he uh, is lo not lost as many as I uh, predicted he would have. So. Uh, what a shame because he was right in that group as well. He was in prime position. Exactly what he told me this morning he was aiming to do was just try and hold on to the toe of the leading group of cars and sort of be there or thereabouts at the end of the race. But unfortunately, his race has come to a, uh, a screaming halt at the moment. And now he's back into a recovery mode. And look at this. This is exactly what happened yesterday. Leading group of four cars, the same four cars again, look like they're set to duel it out for the win with little over six minutes remaining. They've dropped Andre Kieran in fifth place and Ash Clifford's trying to hold on to him. And then you've got Nick Kerr and Shane Purvis in seventh and eighth that are about another second and a half further back of Kieran and Clifford. So, well, that's what happens. You lose the momentum. It does split the pack up. People need to check up and it creates these air margins that we're seeing right now. And unless something happens in this leading group of four cars, it's going to be down to them again for settling the podium positions in about five and three quarter minutes from now. Yes, yeah, certainly is. Uh, Curran and uh, Clifford, I think, need to work together really to catch up to the pack. Having said that, I think Curran's dropping Clifford and is actually catching. Let's have a look. Last time through, he said his PB lap, 128.6, second faster than Jake Rowe at the, uh, the back of the four car train. So he is actually catching. First lap of the race was set last time through by uh, Lee Partridge, who has just been demoted down to second position. Right behind Jones, who now is heading the field in the uh, blue number 11 machine. Another car that's uh, had a bit of a livery change in the off-season. Yes, plenty of cars have had some livery changes in the off-season. It's taken a little bit of time to get used to it. One of those cars is the one that's at the front of the field at the moment with uh, Lee Partridge ditching the, uh, the all black and red livery hues from last year, going to the predominantly white Working Drones Australia livery this year. Very, very nice job that they've done down there. Good to see as we were looking a bit further down the field as well that uh, I think all four of the five Acura cars were all line astern there, led by Brock Hamilton, who had that bodywork that came loose yesterday. Just a little grub screw there. So the way that the Formula V bodywork is mounted, you have these little mounting screws that go down into the hole. They will sort of twist and lock on and then hold that bodywork in place. And if you don't get the screw in exactly the right spot, it does mean that the bodywork does flap around a little bit. And that's all that happened yesterday. So it was a relatively easy fix after the race. But uh, when he came into the pits, they basically pulled the bodywork down, put some race tape on it and said, get going. He didn't even know that the bodywork was flying around. So it was after the race that he actually realised what had come uh, up part of his uh, number five machine. There was a yellow flag there on the front straight as well. I'm not sure who was off uh, at turn number one, but they withdrew the flag pretty quickly. Yes, uh, they did. Uh, Nicholson, you said starting from the back of the field, watch out for him. Up to position number 11 in the 95 machine. PB lap last time through. He's in a great uh, battle pack, 9, 10 and 11. You can see at the back of the shot in the uh, purple machine up the inside going for another position. But at the front of the field, Nick Jones retakes the lead. Nick Jones, a uh, really, uh, really looking strong in season 2024. Took a victory in round five at Phillip Island last year. Uh, really finished the season strongly and looking to continue that momentum. Of course, he was locked in a season-long battle for second in the championship with uh, Lee Partridge, but in the end came out uh, just shy, and it was the uh, white and black machine, although it wasn't white and black last year. Last year. Lee Partridge that uh, finished second in the championship. It's getting some work through. It's Charlie Richardson in the number 16, Jaser, who has come off the circuit at turn number two. She's actually not registering on the timing, so she's come to a stop there. That was what the yellow flag was for on the previous lap down here and on the approach to turn number one so drivers will be fully aware that uh, her car is off the circuit and hopefully now out of harm's way there it is actually just in the top of shot there so well and truly in the grass and well away from the racing surface i'll tell you what every single one of these four letters from this group here there's no one that stands out to me that i think well they might be holding a little bit of pace back they might be a uh, 
holding their joker and playing it on the last lap. I really do not know out of these four who is the fastest and who's going to win this race. It's very open. Any one of these four has the potential to win it. And Curin now is just one second behind, probably even less than that now as they come over the crest of the hill in fifth. He's dragging Clifford along with him as well. They were the two quicker cars on the previous lap as well. They were only a tenth quicker than Nick Jones, but he did get a little bit of assistance in the draft. But all the other drivers in that leading group of four, they were in the high 28s and sort of low 29s behind them Kieran and Clifford were in the mid 28 so they're catching no uh, no doubt about it they are getting closer and Kieran's right with them now so this is good from the youngster oh Jay oh, Rowe Ro. and that little rut just on the exit of the corner as well you just see the right hand side tyres just bounce as it came out of the grass and back onto the racing surface so Clifford and Curran, they're now going to make this a six-car fight. So there's probably at least two more laps here, give or take. Might be lucky to get one more because there's only a minute 20 left on the clock and they are now down into turn number one. Getting word, it looks like it will be two laps to go. So this is on. And I'm now officially calling it a six-car fight. Curran and Clifford have caught up. In fact, Andre Curran set the fastest lap of the race last time through. A 127.8, well over half a second faster than any of the guys ahead of him. This is on now. Half a dozen. Uh, take your pick. It's like choosing the lottery numbers. Who's it going to be? Who is your winner? It's going to be hard to pick as they weave, they snake up the back straight. The intensity has lifted. Uh, you, <laughs> you look uh, pretty tense next to me, Steve DeFries. We see Nick Jones. Is he going to go around the outside? No. Slots back into second position. And Partridge having a look as well. Is anyone going to go for a lunge down at Dandy Road? Not on this occasion. Time is ticking. Opportunities to make it to the front are running out. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking about what happened last uh, race yesterday afternoon where there was the yellow flag at the top of the hill that took away the, p the potential race-winning pass from Jake Rowe. That's where the move's got to be made. You've got to think about your move, get a good exit out of turn four on this lap. Last lap borders out, by the way. Get a good exit out of turn four, get a good slipstream up the hill, get the pass done before turn six, and then you're in prime position to hold your advantage all the way to the start finish line because it's a short run coming out of the last couple of corners. So let's see who can get that move done and make it stick. Jones will lead them into turn one for the final time. He may not be the leader when they get to the control line next time around, but he's gonna do everything possible to hold them off up the hill out of turn four this is the critical corner get good drive out of here if you're in the toe you're in a good position and if you're the lead up potentially you're a sitting duck it's got a little bit of a gap though but quiddington has got his hands full with partridge right now rose just sitting back there in fourth waiting to pick up the spoils if something goes wrong partridge now swings to the outside he's got to leave some room on the outside oh, oh. two wheels in the grass again quiddington goes around the number 11 of Jones, Partridge tries to pull the same trick, oh. there's contact, big contact, Nick Jones gets spat off on the exit of turn number nine, that was wheel to wheel contact and he's made the fence, he won't be moving any further from there, that releases Quiddington, he's going to get the race winning pass, he's going to get the win coming out of the final corner, high drama on the last lap of Formula V with some wheel to wheel contact between Partridge and Nick Jones, so Quiddington will make a, a nice race win there. Jones will come home for second, but we'll wait to see what happens out of that and row home in third. So a little bit of a different looking podium compared to yesterday, but some high drama down here. There'll be yellow flags out, I believe, if Jones hasn't been able to get going. Looks like he might have been able to get going, actually. So that's a little bit lucky there. But yeah, he went two wheels in the air. He's actually out of the car. We're holding, he's actually, he's moved the car out of position. He's out of the car. So... Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he's going to make it back to the, the line, which means zero points for Nick Jones as we're looking further down the field here with Rob Vile having managed to get the better of a couple of Jason veterans. Uh, there you got Mick Fisher has just managed to outdrag one of the youngsters this year to the line in Rocco Spinley. So there was a there's a forlorn looking Nick Jones here. Let's have a look at this. So. Partridge swung to the outside of Quiddington at the same time Quiddington was trying to swing around the outside of Jones and look at that here it's going to be front right is it no front left to rear right contact between Partridge and Jones 
And suspension damage for the uh, number 11 machine. No doubt. Putting him out of action. Can't make it back to the pits. Thumbs up to say I'm all right. No, no injuries. But, uh, yeah, that is not the way uh, we thought that was going to end. He was looking so good throughout that race. He really was led many, many laps. But in the end, it came to nothing. His race ending in the barrier down at Dandenong Road. It's, uh, it's a tricky piece of tarmac, that, isn't it, to get two cars wide and we had three cars wide going into that corner remarkably we saw partridge had to take to the grass even before they got to the corner he still swung it around the outside of jones as they head uh, went down the hill and then as they zigzagged through the uh, little kinks uh, yeah here so it is partridge for another angle and jones yes. oh yeah big nasty hit there and yeah there'll be a bit of rear left suspension damage not only that there'll be some rear right damage there as well so Full rear end will need to be looked at by the Silver Fox Racing crew down there. So they got a race win yesterday with Nick Jones. And I guess you can call they got a second race win as well because Ash Quiddington's being looked after by the Silver Fox team this weekend. So oh, they'll call it two wins. They wouldn't be too thrilled about the little bit of repair work they're likely going to have to do between now and race two this afternoon at 2 p.m. But there you go, Ash Quiddington with a win. Been a little while since he's managed to take a win. But good to see him back on the top step of the podium there. That's the Oasis building, number 12. With Lee Partridge, another podium for him. Goes with his podium finish yesterday. And same for Jake Rowe. Andre Curran, he was there or thereabouts, but just couldn't quite make something happen in the last few uh, minutes of the race. But fourth place finish for him is very, very handy. Along with Ash Clifford, that's a good result for Ash. Nick Kerr in the other Sabre 02 out of the Silver Fox Racing Stable there in sixth place. Uh, then we had Purvis in seventh. A brilliant recovery from Nicholson to come home in eighth position, comfortably inside the top ten, ahead of Hamilton and Windsor rounded out the top ten. From there we had Power, uh, Casamardi again, another recovery up to position number 12 after a mid-race spin. Then Bell, Munro, Vile, Fisher, uh, spin, uh, Spinley, Egan, Lennox and then uh, the two DNFs, Nick Jones and unfortunately uh, Charlie Richardson who came to a halt out there on the racetrack early on in the race. Yeah, you're not wrong. So she came to a halt with uh, only about uh, six laps completed there. So out of the 11 laps, that was the final race distance at about the halfway point. So we'll have a short break here before we get into the Hyundai XLs. There are a couple of cars that will need to be collected. And on the other side of this, we're going to have the largest field for the weekend for their feature race. So 27 Hyundai Excels. We'll be back very, very shortly for the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Race Series here from Sandown Motor Raceway. Welcome back to Sandown. 
As we can see, a, a couple of vehicles on the uh, racetrack. Those, of course, follow the cars around, the uh, medical vehicles that follow the cars around on lap number one. Of course, that came in uh, many years ago. First in Formula One, I believe. Professor Sib Watkins used to follow the uh, the cars around. Uh, and, of course, that's that's become a worldwide thing that medical cars on lap number one of a motor race follow all the cars around, make sure they complete the first lap safely. And, uh, yeah, there's there'll always be a doctor on hand if there is an incident on lap number one. Hyundai excels, big field of cars, and a few new sponsors uh, have jumped on board for this year, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. For a category... Uh, like the Hyundai Excels, it's only been around sort of in the last sort of you know decade. It's really started to become popular here in Vic State Racing and around the country as well. Uh, good to see there's been some great sponsors jump on board. Not only Lanatech uh, jumping on board from the Victorian perspective this year as the naming rights sponsor, uh, but the big one that I when I was looking through the list this morning uh, was Simrigs.com who have jumped on board first place in the Victorian State Race Series this year receives a simrigs.com racing simulator valued at over $10,000 with a custom championship graphics kit with thanks to racingimage.com.au. So that is one hell of a prize for the winner of the Victorian State Race Series. Not, a, not just the trophy that's going to be handed out later on in the year, but uh, a custom simulator worth $10,000. It's uh, definitely something that a lot of drivers are going to be aspiring for. It's such a uh, great tool these days, isn't it? Uh, worldwide for motor racing, young drivers. Uh, you know, we've seen as well, haven't we? People that have come from sim racing and become pretty good drivers in uh, real life, shall we say. Absolutely. And a few drivers I noticed in the field, I was talking to one or two of them downstairs over the weekend so far. They've even said that jumping into the sim, just getting used to things, especially the likes of Lucy Sidwell, who's in a Formula V last year. She's in an XL this year. She just said even just jumping into the sim and just, you know, driving in the sim just made her feel so much more comfortable and when she was going to make the jump from an open wheeler to a tin top Hyundai XL. So that's really, really great to see. That's right. It's a useful tool for a lot of drivers, not just even in, you know, top level competition, but it's about making that next jump up the, or the running order. So as we see, the XLs are now coming out onto the track with the recovery of the Nick Jones Sabre 02 Formula V being dragged back into the pit lane there with the, uh, the crane on the back of the tow truck there. And we see our cars come out. So your pole position sit up is going to be Jalen Robotham. So he managed to he managed to eke out a very small margin after being harassed for most of yesterday's afternoon's 20-minute race. There was about four or five cars tacked onto the back of him, and he managed to edge away to about a two-second victory. So did very, very nicely there. Ahead of the pole sitter from qualifying Bradley James and then Harry Tompkins rounded out the podium so the only man that's here that was in the top three in the championship from 2023 with no Cadell Ambrose and uh, the third the other uh, third place man I think there was James Lodge so they're both not here this weekend yes uh, absolutely so yeah it's very much uh, open for who is going to take the title this year so Robotham will start from pole as you say alongside Bradley James Tompkins will come from third Tyce Hodge out of position number four. Bradley Verica from fifth. And uh, Hugo Simpson came from the back of the field after a qualifying incident on the outlap. Finished in a very, very impressive sixth position. Ahead of Ashton Kadditch, William Sala, Harry Street, and then uh, Brendan Jenner rounding out the top ten. So we've got a couple of uh, notable things that we need to look at here. One of the cars that uh, didn't finish the race yesterday, Glenn McKenzie, the Vacation of Caravans, number 85, is a non-starter for this race. He was scheduled to start out at 23rd position. There are quite a number of drivers that have found themselves at the rear of the grid by virtue of not finishing yesterday. So Jacob Wingett, Jack Johnson, Carly Fleming, Abby Wingett, Peter Fleming and Jet Murray are the cars that are starting at the rear of the grid. So a good half a dozen of them. There was so much action going on yesterday, Dan McCarthy. We didn't even have a, res a final result standing until this morning from the Hyundai Excels because there was a few incidents. We saw one or two at turn one. There was a couple happening up at turn number four. So thoroughly investigated by our race officials here at Sandown. And thankfully, on the bottom of the sheet, there wasn't any penalties that I could actually see. So the finishing results were as they crossed the line, but no doubt 
out there's been a few drivers that have been up and uh, spoken to a few people over the last several hours to plead their case and uh, have their issues investigated. Well, we had a last lap incident, didn't we, with, I believe it was Jem, uh, Glenn McKenzie yes. and Jet Murray down at turn number three on the final lap of the race. And I thought Jet Murray sort of finished mid-pack, so I don't know if he's been given a rear of grid penalty. Possibly, yeah. It did say, he... said DNF on the entry, on, on the results sheet this morning, so there wasn't actually an entry saying he'd been given a rear of grid start, but you might be right with that one. He was the, They were the two that came together yesterday afternoon. So he'll be starting from position number 29 in what is a very large XL field, and he certainly has top 10 pace. He was there all day yesterday and he was all there uh, there all throughout last year as well so look for the youngster jet murray to come out of position number 29 in car number 158 look at the cars at the front on the right that's jalen robotham two-time bathurst 1000 starter and on the left brad james a real uh, front runner in excels the board has gone out the five second board Lights are coming on. We are moments away from race number two, the feature race in Hyundai XLs. We're underway. Great launch from Brad James. Certainly a better start than Jay Robotham. Can he pull ahead down towards turn number one? Try and get that overlap. He's moving across the road, but Jay Robotham's just about got a bit of overlap and he's able to hold the inside line he's and actually ahead but have a look at this we're now four wide simpson buys into this as well four wide into turn one they somehow get down to two by two robotham gets hung out to dry there a little bit on the outside but simpson with a brilliant start up three positions now in the 117 machine from the third row of the grid we did say he was going to be in position today if he was able to get a good result yesterday and we're proven right there great start from the man in the 117 machine. Great camera angle from Blendline TV that they've put in overnight really shows how close these Hyundai XLs in particular get to this uh, wall. I'm sure we'll see many highlights over not just this race, but the one this afternoon as well as they rub the concrete wall. It's caught out the very best in the business over the years, has that fence. So we see Cadditch up the inside. And, uh, oh, big moment from Brad James, he's lost it. Can he get it back? Tank Slapper all the way down the hill, all locked up. He's kept it on the road. He hasn't kept the lead, but he's kept it in the right direction. Phenomenal how, car control. How has he saved that? Where, he lost that over the top of the hill, left and right. I, I, I'd love to see, has he got white gloves? Because I'd just love to see how much wheel work was going on there. And um, we've got a stationary car. It's the number 200 machine of Jacob Wingett and another stationary car. That's uh, Ambrose in the 199 from Tasmania beached at turn number nine and Danong Road going nowhere and another car number 142 Carly Fleming so there's been a little bit of contact and some I guess some argy bargy a bit further down the field in the pack I won't be surprised to see the safety car thrown in the next few minutes uh, their winget has got going once again but it looks to me like there's been at least two incidents one at turn six one down at Dandenong Road and uh, crucially, look at that Simpson taking the lead just seconds before yep. the safety car was deployed. Crikey, it was all going on there. We were watching the big moment all the way down the hill for James, but there was plenty going on elsewhere. Let's have a look at the replay with thanks to Bloodline TV because this was a moment. Have a look at this. Top of the hill, watch the lead car. Got the kerb on the inside, left, right, left, right. That's three, four, bounced, five. Big front, double front lockup, and managed to pull it up for the corner. Incredible. You know what? I'd love to see Jay, Jay Robotham's GoPro footage from behind. Oh, that would be sensational. You and me both. I think we're both going to be straight down to, uh, to Jay's garage after this, but that's going to be on the highlight reel, I think, from... The, uh, the socials on Vic State Race and Blendline TV, I think, uh, over the, overnight. I would not be surprised to see that uh, the amount of footage and the amount of views that that gets in the next 24 hours. That was a sensational save. It certainly was. And I was saying uh, just before when we were watching the uh, Blendline package, all the highlights from last year, that this will be in, that will be in next year's. In 2024, we'll be looking back at that moment again. Do you remember? Because that was a remarkable save. He had at least six or seven goes at trying to get it back in the right direction. Direction and he succeeded on all occasions and managed to keep it in a straight line. But he has dropped to fourth, but I think he'd take that. Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, and you're right. Crucially, Simpson managed to get the race lead before the yellow flags came out for the safety car as well. So that's a very, very important bit of driving for him. So he's gone from sixth place on the starting grid to the lead of the motor race. Certainly has, as we see, all the drivers weaving left and right, trying to keep warmth in the tyres. Uh, particularly hard to keep warmth in the uh, the rear tyres and get warmth in the rear tyres uh, in TCR. In all front-wheel drive categories, it's uh, a challenge. We see it in TCR and uh, in Excels, and I think that was the reason for James's uh, big slide at high speed. The rear tyres just weren't quite up to temperature, and he uh, lost the back end over the... Uh, over the brow of the hill and down to turn number six. So yeah, rear tyre temps in front wheel drive machinery is certainly hard to get. I've noticed a couple of drivers coming towards the pit lane entry and Bradley Jenner looks like he brought his car in and he wasn't involved in any incidents from what I could see. Uh, Jacob Wingate, Carly Fleming and Abby Wingate look like they've all made appearances in the lane as well. I'm wondering there might be a couple of drivers that actually didn't start the race as well because they're not showing up on timing. So Glenn McKenzie we know about. Uh, Johnson in the number 129 doesn't look like he took the start. And the only others there was of course Glenn McKenzie and Ambrose hasn't completed a lap. He's currently stuck in the kitty litter at turn number 9 still being dragged out. And it's actually gone in quite a fair way, hasn't it? You can actually see the trails of where the car came from. It actually was off the circuit on the driver's right-hand side. You can see there's a big trail of where that car has come from, off the grass and through the gravel trap. They're doing a good recovery job down there just with the snatch strap. There was actually a couple of incidents in Friday practice where the tow ropes that are on the, the mandatory tow ropes that are meant to be on the front of these cars have actually snapped when they've been getting pulled out. So drivers were urged to double check those. As so we have another look at the replay here. So that's what happened with the, the first part. Oh, big double front lock up for Ambrose in the middle of the field. So that was all on, 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 his, on her own. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, that was a surprise, actually, uh, considering how many cars and all the chaos that was going on down there. Yeah, all by themselves, off the road, and, uh, yes, got beached straight away. So it's pretty tame yesterday. It was a good, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, quality race yesterday throughout. Really clean, really fair racing throughout the field. And then on the last lap, it really intensified. There was a bit of bumping uh, door to door. It was still good, clean racing, though. Whereas today, uh, they've uh, had a bit of a sleep overnight and they've uh, come out. I think they've eaten a few too many lollies this morning or something. Too much red cordial. Yes, it must be. It must be, absolutely. Uh, as we see then. We'll run you through the order. It's Simpson from Robotham. Tompkins in the number 33 machine will come out of position... Sorry, 33 will restart in third. I'll get it out in a second. James from fourth. Berica fifth. Sala, Hodge, Cadditch, Strick, and Bloomerus. And uh, there's not too uh, many others that haven't had an incident on the opening lap. Morales, Wilson, Carpenter, uh, the other Sala, and then pretty much all of the others uh, had some sort of incident in one way or another on that opening lap. Yeah, I, I would agree. There's probably at least three or four of the drivers that probably haven't had their name called that have been involved in a little bit of an incident over the first couple of races. Actually, Ambrose has got going again, so they've pulled out uh, Tabitha Ambrose from the Turn 9 gravel trap. She's actually just gone past the front straight here and going to tag on to the back of the field. So she's going to be a lap down, but importantly, will still have racing laps. So if the safety car lights are out, at turn nine, that's what I was just about to say, that in the briefing yesterday was the last point or possible that they would turn the safety car lights out if they were going to go back to racing was going to be turn nine. That is precisely what has happened. So only a short period of time under safety car, just two laps. So Hugo Simpson now has control of this 23-car XL field. And to say 23, it was started with 29 across the weekend. There's a handful of drivers that have not... Uh, made their way back onto the circuit from yesterday and those that were caught up in some of the incidents. So where's the go point for Hugo Simpson? He's got control right to the control line, which is coming up in 5, 4, 
three, two, one, now. He actually went a little bit earlier than that. Actually, good restart. Well controlled by Hugo Simpson. He takes two cars with him, Robotham and Tompkins, all the way to driver's extreme right, heading down towards turn one. The preferred racing line, and that leaves James to hold off Verica and Will Sala and Tice Hodge on the opposite side of the circuit, but they swing back over to the right because they need to open up the next corner, which goes left. Absolutely, they do everyone very uh, nice restart, no overlapping at all across the line. Uh, you see that quite often uh, if there's any overlap, it's an instant penalty. Supply to the end of the race, but everyone's really well behaved, everyone's quite the rule book in the off season. Certainly are. I can see Murray's made up a good few positions. He's in position number 17. He might have even made up a few more positions in the first few corners. So a great opening lap from the man who came from the back of the grid. P29 made up 12 positions on lap number one alone. Yeah, it certainly has. So Verica sits in there in, f in fifth place. That's about where he finished yesterday. There's this next group of cars that's coming down the hill here. There's the, uh, the Sim Riggs number 11 entry. We mentioned about uh, that car before. Jack Carpenter, the winner of the Vic State Series for the Hyundai Excels this year, gets a SimRigs.com simulator with nearly $10,000. So very, very important prize on offer. And Carpenter was involved, I think, in one of those incidents yesterday. He's managed to uh, start in 15th. He's moved himself up to 13th. That's only two spots. So a little bit of progress for the SimRigs.com entry. Here they go across the line. Only four minutes left on the clock. Of course, timed races. So a lengthy safety car period eats into the race time. It means it's really a sprint to the finish from here. And the top four have sprinted away from the rest of the field as James holds it around the outside. He wants third position back. He, uh, he knows he's quick. He led this race until that big moment on lap number one, and he's got one back. So one position made. He needs two more. He's got four minutes to do it in the number 61 machine. He's, uh, he's trying to gap Tompkins in the top two. Of just edged ahead ever so slightly, but that's certainly uh, catchable, that's for sure. Yeah, the gap's not insurmountable with the amount of time left on the clock. But with Hugo Simpson out in front, going to make it very, very difficult for the likes of James and Tompkins to try and catch because Robotham's going to push him hard all the way. And Simpson's no slouch. He's been in the XLs for a couple of years now. He knows how the cars behave. He knows how they drive. He's been featuring at the front of quite a large number of the XL races over the last several seasons. So he'll know what he needs to do to try and secure a win here. And he's trying desperately to pull a little bit of a gap here, but Robotham is not letting him get away. No, you're going to struggle to pull a gap on uh, Jay Robotham, particularly in a Hyundai XL with top three of the very best XL drivers in the country currently in the top three positions. And I'll include Harry Tompkins in that as well. He is a very good steerer of an XL as well. But actually, the battery stop machine is uh, weaving, trying to stop that toe behind in a fourth position. The top three very much in line. As they tip it into turn number one, or a bit of a lock up for Sala. I think that was Kanich at the inside of him. Oh, oh and he's gone around there, so there's contact, I think, between the two. Yeah, between Kanich and Sala. I was about to say, there's been more contact the minute I heard the lock up going on, and then the aftermath of the, uh, the Dunlop de Resetai's protesting as somebody was on the slide going through turn number one. Kanich looks like he might have been held up a little bit as a result of that little skirmish with Sala. He's now very much fighting, I think, with uh, Strick and Bloomerus to keep them at bay. Up the hill they go. This is a replay of what happened. We didn't quite see it as they went under the bridge. Kadich up the inside. And, yeah, simply a case of two people fighting for the same piece of tarmac. That's going to be the end result. Yeah, there would have been a little bit of racing room had to be left there. I think it didn't look like there was a lot of contact. Would have been very, very minor if there was one, but just enough because there's no weight in the rear end of the XL, just enough to push the rear end around because all the weight's in the front, motor's in the front, front wheel drive. So there's very, very little weight going over the rear end of these cars. Looks like we'll probably have about two laps to go this time around. There has been a change at the front. Robotham assumes the race lead. So he's managed to rip that lead away from 
Hugo Simpson somewhere over the back side of the circuit and sets the fastest lap of the race in the process by some considerable margin at the moment too. He's a good, you know, tenth and or so of a second quicker than the next best lap of Bradley James, who set it on the previous tour. Two laps to go, we are hearing. So this the penultimate lap of the race. And James is there. This is very much a three-way fight. And don't think, oh, Robot can set the fastest lap last time. Three is going to pull away from the field. Excel racing doesn't work like that. So particularly at Sandown with the big toe, big drag strips on either side of the circuit. Oh, that looks... Second time. That's an uh, awkward-looking uh, camera angle. That's the uh, one and one machine. That's the other Sala yeah, in the field. At the same spot where the sister car went around a lap ago. Yeah, not been a good corner for the Salas. As we see a couple of cars trying to sweep around the outside. That's Kennedy in the 159 machine. Yeah, the 142 tucked in there as well, which is Carly Fleming. And you've got Peter Fleming directly behind her. So if that's a, I mean, if it's things father and daughter that go racing in those two cars, they've uh, done a little bit of moonlighting in pre-production as well. It's a couple of races last year that uh, found their home back in the XLs. And they're... I was about to say, that's wide, close yeah. to four wide going up the hill. Pretty willing uh, fight for the uh, positions outside the uh, top 15. Who's going to uh, prevail? It's going to be the uh, 159 machine. So, yeah, this is the fight for 22nd position. Yeah, this is the fight right at the back of the field. It's good to see fights going on all the way through the field plenty of battles plenty of drivers having a good crack at each other even if you're all the way down the order it's the last lap borders out now and now's the time that hugo simpson tries to pounce on robotham at turn one couldn't get it done couldn't hang around the outside at turn two which means he needs to fall back into line for turn three and brad james is right there as well the all-important drive on turn number four. If you're going to make a move down at Danny Nong Road, you've got to be right under the rear boot lid and right on the rear bumper bar of your opponent to have any chance of making it stick. It's a three-way battle for fourth as well, but we're going to focus on the leaders because they are side by side. Hugo Simpson going around the outside. Robotham's going to squeeze him right up to the grass. And Hugo Simpson can nearly turn across his nose, but not quite enough of an overlap to do so. Robotham holds on. Simpson has to cut through the chicane. He's running out of opportunities now to retake the lead. There is just three corners to go. Only two real corners, the right and then the left. If you hold it around the outside, you may be able to... No, he's going for the inside. Oh, Major Sender looking down the inside there at turn number 11. Robotham covered it off and will out-drag the 117 of Simpson and the 61 of James to get his second win for the weekend. That won a lot narrower margin compared to what it was yesterday afternoon. And Simpson was a factor. We knew he was going to be there or thereabouts. He pushed Robotham hard. Robotham pushed him just as hard. Robotham prevails at the end of the day by three-tenths of a second. And then only two tenths between Simpson and James. So half a second covering the top three at the end of the race. Tompkins prevailed in the fight for fourth position. Oh, there's a bit of smoke there. Is that just kicking up dust because he's so yeah. far off the racing yeah, line? It is. Yeah, a bit close to the, uh, the, the old Armco fence there. And kicking up whatever's left on the outside of the circuit. It does get a little bit dusty here from time to time with all the rubbish and the, the tyre marbles that end up on that side of the circuit. You can see all the uh, tyre marbles on the uh, left-hand side as we're looking of that yellow line as cars continue to come through. Sala recovered in the uh, 181 machine to take a few positions. Uh, all of those four, I think, is behind at one stage. So nice uh, recovery there to finish 21st in the end. But yeah, plenty of action throughout that race. But once again, at the front of the field, it was really clean and uh, really, really uh, good racing up the point in end. So that was the XL feature race number two. Yeah, final results are Robotham from Simpson and then James. As I said, half second separating them. Tompkins came home in fourth, head of Verica and Hodge. Strick was in seventh in the. Uh, 2023 championship winning car ahead of Tadic, Morales and Bloomerus and then beyond that Carpenter finished in 11th and then Will Sala uh, recovered after that spin at turn one to finish in 10th uh, in sorry 11th position just ahead of Jet Murray who 
himself marched through the field to finish uh, just outside the top 10 in the end. So good recovery drive from Jet. Yeah, absolutely. Good recovery drive from Jet Murray there as the Lanatech Hyundai Excels leave the field of play at the pit lane entry there. And Hyundai Excels would like to thank Simrigs.com, Lodge Brothers Stonemasons, Lucas Oils Australia, Brakes and More, Versatile Design and Racing Image, Specialised Engineering and Lancefield Bakery for their contributions to the club and the series in season 2024. We'll see them a bit later on this afternoon. Sort of sands the 2.25, the 2.30 p.m. mark for race number three. But it's going to be a short break here in Central Commentary before we roll out the Vic V8 series here at the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Race Series. Welcome back to Sandown. Bit of an overcast day here today, but it's uh, certainly warming up outside, uh, heading for a sort of mid-twenties day here in at Sandown Raceway, not too far south of Melbourne. So not too far away from seeing Vic V8s roll out onto the circuit. It was a bit of a surprise yesterday. We thought the, uh, the win, or I did anyway, thought the win was going to come from uh, either Finn or Lynch, and it wasn't. It was Wall, who uh, really drove well, didn't put a foot wrong, and thoroughly deserved race victory. He certainly did deserve that win. He towed uh, Brian Finn, or trailed Brian Finn, I should say, rather for you know, a good two-thirds of that race, made his move at the time he th felt was necessary to do it, and timed it absolutely beautifully, and then drove away to the win. So great job from the man from New South Wales in the Holden Monaro. He's got pole for the start of race number two with Brian Finn right alongside him. John Adams all the way from Queensland as well in that uh, XYGT Phase 3 machine. That was great to see Ford uh, historical, Ford representing up there. And David Hender in an XYGT as well will start alongside in fourth place. So good to see some old school muscle out there. Arthur Van Orso and David Ratcliffe will be next in positions five and six. The pair of Commodores there of different generations. Matt Horn, so we saw that Matt Horn had a little bit of a, a skirmish yesterday as well. And he's going to start out of seventh place with Gary Finemore's XB Coop in position eight. And over the page we go with Gary Vera and Alan or Aaron Wheatley. And Greg Lynch, who was on the front row of the grid yesterday, he, uh, he sort of bobbled a little bit at the start. He managed to get going again. He was catching his way up through the pack, and then he had that spin down at turn two and three, and then uh, had to do all the hard work all over again. So yes. he's going to start out of uh, sort of the mid-pack there in position number 11 with Nathan Bell next to him, Brett Lehman and Mark Kakuri, then Victor Argento in the AU Falcon and Anthony Monday, car number 16 in position 16. 
and then a couple of rear grids because of some non-finishes. So Alan Davies we saw pulled over to the side of the back straight yesterday in the XE Falcon. Mark Pesavento came to a halt pretty early in the proceedings. And Adam Cadeo, I don't think he was actually a starter yesterday. So it be interesting to see whether he's actually able to start this one this morning. As I said, the track just south of Melbourne. There we are, Sandown Raceway. Over 60 years we've been coming to this racetrack. It's changed uh, a little bit over the years, a couple of uh, corners added. And of course, for a few years, we were running a, uh, an international circuit in the 1980s, which sort of went into the horse racing track on that back stretch, but shortened back to 3.1 kilometers a few years ago. And it's produced some fantastic and exciting racing over the years. Uh, there was a big XL crash, as you saw at the bottom of the screen there last year. HQ's always put on a show. They are out in the uh, not too distant future. They're just a few minutes away. Then you roar up this backstretch, and you certainly do roar in these big V8s, get eaten, getting up a lot of speed into turn number six, and then trying to get it stopped down into turn number nine, all the way down the hill, and a big sand trap to uh, pick you up. If, uh, if you do get it wrong, you get very beached down there. The sand is deep. Then around the last couple of corners and across the line. So the track surrounds a horse racing venue, still used. Many horse racing events still held here. And the lap record held by John Martin. And there is the uh, horse racing grandstand. And uh, if you get to the track here today, you can, uh, you can watch the motor racing action from there. No extra charge. Absolutely. Not only that, if you're here at the track this, uh, this today, you can go and enter the, the draw for the Metabo Toolkit down there as well. So it's $5 a ticket or uh, three tickets for $10. They're at the, the base of the, the control tower here. So please get out here and support not only Victorian State Race Series and the categories, but uh, pop a little bit of money into for the raffle. And uh, you might find yourself walking away with something courtesy of Metabo Tools later this afternoon. If you uh, haven't done it, uh, do it imminently, uh, effectively. It's, uh, oh, it's going to draw. The draw will come to a close uh, almost imminently. So yeah, make sure you buy your ticket if you haven't already. Uh, just saw Travis Lindorf. He had many, many issues in the saloon car yesterday. He's just uh, following the field around, making sure everything is okay. He has had every drama under the sun in that machine. He's not taking part in this race, but uh, the uh, stewards have kindly given him a lap behind the uh, Vic V8s just to shake the car down, make sure everything is uh, ship shape and ready to go. But yes. Plenty of Vic V8s, Holden and Fords. If you've grown up in Australia over your and you're over the age of 30, you will absolutely love this category. Yes, you certainly will. Now, importantly, something that uh, we briefly touched on, but we haven't sort of given you the full rundown of this uh, this morning, is that these are the feature races for the Victorian State Race Series this morning. So what happens from a point scoring perspective is that you have three races for the weekend. Two of those races, the winner will score 30 points, and then the feature race is worth 40 points. There's a maximum 100 points on offer. So that's what we're doing this morning, deciding the feature race points, and then there'll be a third race this afternoon, which will be for the lesser number of points. And you've just pointed out, Dan McCarthy, that we have a vacant grid spot in position number one. Drama already for the start of the race. Yes, a race one winner is not on the grid. So, Finn, Brian Finn has a vacant slot alongside him. He'll be uh, rubbing his hands together, victory, uh, very much in his favour here. But there's plenty of competition behind. Greg Lynch, I'm sure, will charge through the field and threaten not uh, not only for a podium, but potentially a race victory a as green well. Flag. Green flag at the back. We are just seconds away. From the start of this one, listen to the V8 Thunder at Sandown. Red light on and off. Not quite the greatest start by Finn. A brilliant start by Hender in the Blue Falcon. You can see the licorice straps being left, though, as he's still trying to get the power down. It was a great initial launch, but burst into wheel spin, and he's lost second position to Adams down in towards turn number one. Horn looking up the inside. A good start from him. He's made up lots of positions and up to position number four. Head of Ratcliffe and Finemore, who go into turn number two side by side. But it's going to be Ratcliffe in the Commodore that prevails there. 
Yeah, Matthew Horn started in seventh place, has found himself up to fourth place already. One of those positions will be because there's no car that started on pole position, but a good start nonetheless in the number 50 Rap Studio Commodore, tucked in there behind uh, Hender in the number 53 machine. As they roar up the back straight, you did say here, Dan McCarthy, it's a massive roar of V8 power heading up the hill. All different makes and models and shapes and sizes of V8 muscle. As Finemore manages to hold position on Ratcliffe going into turn number six. A couple of little lockups down the hill into Dandenong Road. That's not uncommon here. Oh, it was a big oh, lockup from Gary Vela there. Went very, very wide and uh, just managed to get back on. I thought he might have been heading for the giddy lit up, but he's managed to keep it on the racing circuit. A lot of curb usage there from Adams and it really threw the old Falcon sideways. Going to cost him lots of momentum down the straight. And uh, yesterday we were sort of saying, oh, it's all Holdens really in the top 10, but as all the, uh, or several of the Holdens have fallen by the wayside, there's uh, plenty of Falcon, plenty of Blue Oval love at the pointy end of the field. And I don't see Greg Lynch. You just read my mind. I was about to say, where on earth is Greg Lynch? Um, I'm almost positive he was out there. He was. But he, he's, he's not tripped the timing beacon at the moment. So maybe he came into pit lane or or something happened there, but he is not on the circuit. So this is looking very, very handy for Brian Finn out in front at the moment. And he's got a nice 1.2 second margin at the beginning of lap number two. They say to, uh, to finish first, first you, you must, must finish. finish. Or in this case, you've got to start. Because the two rivals have not started the race. So this is uh, going very nicely for Finn. But let's not put the commentator's curse on him. Let's not put the mockers on our current race leader. In second place still is Adams, but we're looking a little bit further back to Bell in the Snap-on Commodore. Yeah, another car that's very similar to the Matthew Horn car. That's a good variety of Holden and Ford models in this Vic V8 series. Got the 44 machine there belonging to Arthur Van also had a little bit of a peek at the number 36 snap-on tools car. Got a nice little run out of the final complex of corners here. to be alongside across the start finish line. They score uh, Van also just a fraction behind Nathan Bell and I think he might be in the background there making the position stick down into turn number one and he has. Nice pass. Good job. That's very nicely done. 44 machine. There's a couple of older spec Commodores ahead of a couple of newer spec Commodores, but there's <laughs> so many different models of Commodores there. It's almost like Commodore Cup. Well, back in the day, I would have thought it was very close to Commodore Cup. I think one or two of the cars in the field are actually ex Commodore Cup cars. I believe Mark Kakuri might have one of those. We've seen a few in improved production. Neil Crow's had one. I think David Cox has had one as well. So they have found a home from the old Commodore Cup days. And, you know, in this series or uh, other similar series, it's uh, not uncommon to see them still kicking around these days. Of course, of course up at, uh, at Darwin, when they have the, the supercars around, they almost come out of the woodwork, don't they? Oh, they certainly do. And there is Kakuri in the number 39 machine, the white and blue car just behind Lehman. Uh, but yeah, not having the weekend heat like. Normally a uh, front runner always in and around the top five, but seems to me to be uh, lacking a bit of speed in a straight line this weekend. I saw at the end of lap number one, he was overtaken down pit straight by several cars you'd expect him to be blasting past. So uh, I'm going to listen to it as it comes past the commentary box. Oh, sounds okay now, and he's looking up the inside, so Maybe just a poor exit on that opening lap out of the final turn. Gary Finemore had a little bit of an, a moment sort of coming out of the last complex of corners. You can see the suspension in the number 48 Mentone Premix. Quite sort of a soft setup. When you see it sort of bounce on the curb, you can see the car's got a little bit of flex in the front there against the more modern cars sort of behind the, uh, the P plate on the back there, heading up the hill. Yeah, a little bit of smoke trailing there. But you can see how big that Falcon looks. It just looks big and heavy, particularly around those 90 degree corners, turns three, a uh, two, three, and four. But it's got some good legs in a straight line as we look at the peep later. That's number 76 Wheatley. Oh, massive lock up ahead. Who was that? Not sure. Have they made the corner is the next question. Oh, I think the answer is yes. There's nothing in the front of the shot there saying that there's a car beached in the gravel trap, but might have been Ratcliffe potentially 
might have had a lock up going down to turn number nine. But yeah, the, the number 48 machine of Gary Feinway has the legs in a straight line. I think that's the important part. It just doesn't have the nimbleness through the corners because of the kind of, you know, chassis that that car was from when it was constructed back in the day. I mean, most of these cars are all the unibody construction now, but just the sort of technology that you can put under that car, you're sort of limited as to where you can actually, you know, mount suspension components and what you can actually change out to actually make uh, power and make traction in some of the older generation cars. Yes, exactly right. And this is a really good battle between these cars. Just on the fringe of the uh, top 10 is where we are looking at the moment. And as we say, it is all Commodores back there. This is the number 14 machine of uh, Kideo in the uh, older spec car. That's the car that didn't start yesterday, I believe. So made remarkably good progress from the back of the field right on the back of Bell now. This is actually for the last spot inside the top 10, but uh, Kakuri looks like he's trying to slice his way through there as well. And has Kadeo got a little bit of a problem because he's dropped back quite considerably. He's actually lost another spot there to Lehman in the 97. Argento's, going up the hill. Argento's homing in behind as well in the Falcon. There is the uh, black and yellow machine. So, yeah, not quite sure on that one. I'm looking at last laps, and it was a PB from Kideo. It was matching all of those around him, if not faster than all of those around him. It was almost like he hit a brick wall going up the back straight. The car was right up behind uh, Nathan Bell, and then all of a sudden it dropped back quite remarkably maybe missed a gear change or something there let's just have a look at the the lap time yeah it's in the one minute 24 so possibly like a, a gear change or something not quite right heading up the back straight here is oh big curb jump there for horn and lost the rear momentarily but caught it back uh, got it back under control he'll be absolutely wrapped with that in the rap studio car <laughs> you didn't appreciate that one. Oh, pardon the pun. I think we probably should have said at the end <laughs> of that one. No, yeah, big, big moment with the uh, the wheels sort of bouncing up over the curb. Those curbs at turn two and three, they can be quite savage if you hit them at the wrong angle. Very similar to one of the curbs we're about to see here. Drivers, left hand side, right there. That little curb there on the inside at turn number eight can be quite a nasty one as well, especially in some of the open wheel cars. And we've, we've made mention several times already of the inside curb at turn number one too. That's quite a nasty one if you get it at the wrong angle too. Brilliant exit by Ratcliffe just drags past the number 50, uh, sorry, yeah, number 50 machine of Horn and marches on. So that is uh, fourth position. Bit of a gap though to the uh, car ahead of Hender, a good eight seconds. Hender himself is 10 seconds behind this car that we can see on the screen at the moment. Lots of uh, old stickers, a bit of a retro livery. It even says Hardy Ferodo 500 on the side of the car. So a real nod to the, uh, the past as we look on board this car in second position. Said his PB lap last time through, 117.9. As we go up the back stretch, down into third gear tip it in brilliant on board footage here you can see exactly what his uh, eyes are doing where he is looking tips it in to dandy road how much wheel spin silky smooth on the exit as he goes back up the gearbox look how smooth he is on the inputs on the wheel as well dan this is what the impressive bit is for me for such a big heavy car just look at how little wheel work he actually has to do just turns the car in beautifully just a little trim of the steering wheel coming back the other way absolutely beautiful to watch that's a very very nicely balanced race car because when you're fighting the car that's when you start to lose time hand over fist you don't want to really have a car that handles like that back through the gearbox gets a hand back on the on the steering wheel as well and just beautifully caresses the car through the corner so it's set up and handling really really nicely is the number 55 Falcon all the way from Queensland as well that's the bit that's impressing me all the way from Queensland and traveling absolutely superbly around this three kilometer circuit using all the road there on the exit of turn number four and once again we blast down the back straight what speed are we going to get up to we can't tell can we from that particular angle it'd be nice if we had a little bit of a digital dash we probably could have actually seen what was happening there but just some beautiful pictures on board thanks to Blendline TV and just super smooth. Little lock up there, pinching the inside left front, but uh, still makes the corner quite comfortable. Great to see Blendline almost round off round, doing different things on board.
camera. That looked fantastic. Really good to see. We've seen a few on boards already this weekend. We've got the new camera angle at turn four. We've got the little uh, the little spy cam that goes up and down pit straight as well. So Blendline are, are really uh, really improving their coverage round upon round. And there's yellow flags at the back. The so somebody oh, oh it's Hender. Yeah, Hender it's in Hender the from third position. That'll be why if the yellow flags out at six, it usually means something's going on at turn nine and has come a cropper there as the, uh, the Pearsdale plant hire car. Looks like he might have done that on his own. There's a few little bits of tyre uh, mark on the surface that looks like he might have just lost it heading down the hill. I think he was running quite comfortably on his own. He so was would have lost seconds, it coming down the hill. Ten seconds away from uh, anybody around him, so very much on his own. As we see them turn in, these guys have uh, closed up a little bit because uh, Horn is now coming under pressure from Wheatley, and Wheatley's marched through. I saw him overtake Finemore a few, a couple of laps ago. He's also got also, and now on the back of Horn, this is a brilliant performance from the P-Plater. Yeah, he's managed to catch up to the back of Horn here, and gonna go the long way around turn five. That's a really, really nice pass the long way around, and that's at full throttle as well. That's a corner that you don't really need to pay much attention to. You just need to get your line right, and round he goes, and through he goes into what is position number four. He's actually got the third fastest lap of the race. The only two cars he's slower than is Finn and Adam. Yep, on his own. So that's what happened to Hend up. Just lost it. Probably looks like he might have actually clipped that inside curb I was mentioning a few moments ago at turn number eight and just lost the rear end. Kept it out of the fence, thankfully. Yes, that is good news. But yeah, 3.7 seconds of margin out front, front Finn to Adams. But Horn is gaining about two seconds a lap on Ratcliffe ahead, and now he can see the Commodore ahead of him. We look a little bit further back, because this is a great battle between Finemore, Vela, and Kikori. So the three of them crossing the line in uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth position. And in Vela defending, is he, or attacking? Uh, I think he's trying to do a little bit of both there, because he's got Mark Kikori behind, and he had Gary Finemore in front of him. Yeah, certainly uh, taking a compromised racing line though there into turn number one. Kikori runs a bit wide at turn two and just to keep it on the road. These are all very, very different uh, vehicles from very, very different eras. You've got the 70s Falcon at the, uh, the head of the trio. You've got a 90s Commodore in the middle and then an 80s Commodore behind that. So from all different eras, I think back to the touring car days, I see the uh, Falcon at the front, I think of Alan Moffat. I see the car in the middle and I think of a uh, Lowndes HRT car. And then I see the one behind and I think of a, uh, a uh, mid 80s, uh, a mid 80s Bathurst winning Commodore. Yeah, you're not wrong. It's very, very resemblant of some of those cars. It's just like, just, um, it's almost ironic how you, your mind just goes back to those things. You just get one look Ooh. at something and you see something different. Oh, there's a bit of a, an incident going on down there at Dainong Road. Looks like there's a little bit of panel damage on the front left-hand corner of the uh, Cadeo number 14 Commodore. Looks like it might have been a little coming together between possibly Argento, Cadeo, and the car behind, which was Lehman in the set in the 97. That was an interesting sort of angle. We didn't quite get what was going on there. There's a bit of smoke coming out of the back of the, the Lehman car. Here we go. This will be this will tell the story. Down the hill and spin from Cadeo and nowhere for Lehman to go. A bit of contact and Argento was the innocent sort of party and that one managed to get away with it but there was a big trail of smoke coming out of the back of Lehman's car all the way down the front chute. I don't think it was the back. I think it was uh, bodywork corner. rubbing on the front yeah. left of that car. So we uh, continue. Hopefully that won't cause a puncture. There is only a lap to go. So fingers crossed that car makes it to the end with uh, all four tyres intact. But uh, these four, uh, sorry, these three have remained in order. Find more Vela and Kakauri, but Kakauri's closed up on the tail of the newer Commodore ahead. Meanwhile, we go back to Adams with uh, the car that we were on board with just a few laps ago. And as you say, so silky smooth out of every single corner. And that's what you want. If you start getting sideways, you're not putting all your power to the ground. No. If you keep it smooth, keep it clean, it might look slower, but slower, looking slower and smoother is very much often faster. The only time it isn't, I think, is in rallying or speedway where sliding out sideways is faster. 
Finn's managed his margin out in front pretty well, I'd say. He's got a four-second gap at the moment, but it probably doesn't tell the whole entire story. I think he's been very much in cruise control for the last couple of laps. He has got the fastest lap of the race at a 17.3, and I believe he might be coming to, uh, to greet the chequered flag in the next couple of moments. Indeed, here he is. We'll bring his number 88 Commodore to the line. There is the chequered flag after uh, 12 laps of racing and only four seconds behind is Adams in the number 55. Actually, it was 3.3 in the end, so Finn sort of really buttoned it off a little bit toward the end there. But no doubt, from the front row, he was very much in cruise control. kakari has got through on Vela at the start of this lap, so he has taken position number eight, and he's already honing in on the back of Finemore, but I think it might be a little bit of too little too late. Oh, Layman's come into the lane on the last lap. He certainly has. He was in the next group of cars, so he probably didn't feel like the car could go around another lap. Maybe he realised that the, he had a cut tyre or something there and wasn't going to make it around for another three kilometres. So Kukuri, unfortunately, comes up a little bit short against the number 48 of Finemore. And then Gary Vela dropped back a position at the end there. Actually, we'll still finish eighth because Matt Horner's maybe stopped out there on the circuit somewhere as well. I can see the number 50 dropping down the timing screens as everybody else comes across the line. There's Cadeo, there's uh, Nathan Bell, and then behind them, you've got uh, Pezzavento, who didn't uh, finish yesterday's race. He's come across the line. So Lehman into the lane. Monday, I think, is a lap down, and something happened to Matthew Horn on that last lap. He's not finished this race. No, we certainly know who did finish that race after looking like he was going to take the win for much of yesterday's race. Came home in position number two, but Brian Finn has bounced back to take a, a very nice, mature race victory out there in that one. Race number two, the feature race, the big point scoring race for Vic V8s by 3.3 seconds in the end from the Falcon of John Adams. A big gap over half a minute to the next set of cars. Aaron Wheatley running out the top three, finishing just uh, five seconds ahead of David Radcliffe. Look at that, the margin between Radcliffe and Osor at the end, Osor, sorry, Nothing. just one-tenth of a second at the line. Then Gary Finemore, Kokori, Vela Argento recovered finish in ninth and David Hender after sitting third for much of the race a spin down at Dandenong Road saw him finish down in tenth the head of Cadeo Bell uh, Pesavento and then down a lap Monday and then the non-finisher on that final lap Matt Horn and then the rest of the non-finishers and notably non-starters as well including yesterday's race one winner Luke Wall and Greg Lynch, hopefully we'll see them back later on because uh, that's a real shame that we didn't see either of those cars on the track. Yeah, absolutely. I know that there was some power steering issues yesterday morning for Greg Lynch, so I'm hoping they're not sort of the gremlins that keep reoccurring for his number 22, but uh, hopefully we'll see them back out a bit later this afternoon. But we'll take another short break here. Another one of the combined grids this weekend, historic touring cars and HQ Holdens. They're about to grace us for a little bit of history here at the Victorian State Race Series. Round number one, with thanks to Triple Eight Home Loans. Welcome back, Trackside, ladies and gentlemen. A great couple of races there brought to you by Dan McCarthy and Steve DeVries here at the Triple Eight Home Loans. Round one of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships at the home of horsepower for over 60 years. A couple of these cars, probably that one coming out now, uh, the ex Bob Jane Cortina and uh, one of the, uh, the minis there as well. Been around ever since uh, the track opened. I'm Darren Smith, right alongside me is 
Dave Amor. He will bring all the colour and Shazam around the tyre power HQs. Welcome, Dave. Good morning, Darren. Ladies and gentlemen, race fans, welcome to Sandown. It's not hot, it's not raining, it's a perfect weekend. It will certainly crack open sometime around about quarter past one this afternoon. The HQ Holdens, Andrew Magilton on pole and winning. Ryan Woods went back one position. Steve Banks come forward one position. Ryan Woods reckons he's got a bit of vibration through the car. The guys have changed a few things to see how it goes. And Glenn McDonald, the Ready Rose car, done a head gasket and he's time yesterday was very very short he's up going ready to go for race two for this morning darren and it's good to see a good group of group nc and b's and hq's joining together now i've spoken to a couple of nc guys and b guys and i said david make sure you thank the hq guys they're racing and it's still giving us fast guys some room to get past when the time comes so fantastic to hear that it is it is it's a lot of experience heads out there and actually there's some newcomers to the sport as well so it is good to hear that quick update for uh ray hepburn he had a fueling issue um if you want to get the ins and outs of that ray's parked out uh, just behind the grandstand there have a chat with him but it's certainly a fuel issue that occurred in the uh, 59 mustang starting off pole will be brent trengove in the camaro right next to trevor talbot in the yellow camaro and we uh, did call them yesterday uh, the ham and cheese toasted sandwich because uh, they were wedged in there between them adrian moore was next peter Mullerman in the black mustang there he is a number 43 the number that alan moffat used for all those years and uh, the number 43 on the side of this uh, this black car. Had a quick chat. In fact, first time I've ever shook his hand and met him properly this morning, Pete. Gee, he's an enthusiastic operator. Great to have him on the grid. And this car always presents beautifully. He's worked on many cars over the years, so he knows how he wants to present his own. Dom Leo, next in the 84, is on the next row of the grid. Andrew Baird, back to Jeff Monday. Brett Hodgkin. Ah, front row of the grid is void of Trevor Talbot. We've got the 22 of Trengo there. Go back to Don Knight, Bill Trengo, Peter Oliver, Luke Patterson in the little mini there as well. Jerry Lenter, who had a troubled run towards the end of the race. Ray Hepburn, uh, Connor McLeod, actually. I haven't seen Connor out there in the pink Tirana. Uh, and Leo Tobin in the number 46. We haven't seen them come past us here, so can't quite confirm, but it looks like the HQ field is all set to go. Our grid marshal being uh, quite pedantic about them taking their spots in the box there. The guys have been doing it long enough. They know exactly where they uh, need to park the car. So uh, that official just uh, slowly making his way off track. Yellow flag being held out there for safety. Up and over the fence, we can see uh, the flaggy at 13 there being the relay point. Let's see the revs rise. So we've got the five second board up. The front row of the grid, Brett Trengo, Brent Trengo, all by himself and angled at turn one. He's done a bit of the Michael Schumacher there. <laughs> Going to come right over and away they go. It's the second row of the grid. Absolutely gazumped Trengo. Let's see how he gets into second gear, but it is certainly Muellerman and Adrian Moyle. Muellerman just goes back a little bit there, but Moyle comes over. He's following the red car and he's got the hazard lights on down into turn one as well. A little bit of a squirm under brakes, but Brent Trengo manages to gather it all up, grab second gear, stop the wheel spin, and the race continues down into one. The HQs have now also launched on their part of the race as well, but there's the 22. Two. Looks brilliant. The blue eyes on the front there. Coming around is the 25 of Adrian Moore. Then it's Pete Muellerman. He gets through there as well. Dom Leo. And here's your HQs. All right, we've got Magilton Banks. We've got Ryan Woods. Kenny Wright got a ripper of a start. Almost up in the third position outside the grandstand. But he's come back in just that fraction. Ryan Woods in third. Banks, he done a fantastic drive yesterday he's got it up on two wheels ladies and gentlemen there is a couple of fantastic photos on facebook you want to have a look as they all go through the hq holders one to 13th ready rose car there glenn mcdonald coming back through through the field we've got a small small field this weekend don't panic there are eight cars that i could think of that aren't here so we'll have our 17 18 cars throughout the rest of the season darren coming around to complete lap number one they come through the turns 11 12 and 13 complex point the nose down to the train line that's just off the back of turn one there and they are absolutely on for it 
Have a look at that. Banks. Banks is in front. Banks for the first time. Banks has got past McGillan. McGillan has never seen a HQ in front of him all weekend, ladies and gentlemen. He's put it on pole. He's won race one. And now all of a sudden the plumber, the plumber in the 176 car, Banks there, is in first position. God, he's got one, one and a half HQs in front. We've got Ryan Woods. We've got... Also right as they all the way come through for their first flying lap. Well done, Steve Banks. Well, I tell you what, if you've got a plumbing problem, you want it solved fast, so you better get the fastest guy on the job as they continue on into lap number two. The fields are settling down now. Watch that Magilton car, the Midi's electrical outfit, ranging up behind. Car number one got a vibration issue being reported back on that car, and the crew have been working pretty hard just to try and nail it down here but the 176 of banks he will be feeling the heat from the 14 and the one and the 43 behind him as well tony maloney also doing a fantastic job up there in fifth position ready rose car now we've got the nc there the 25 car it didn't have a really good start but i tell you what it got the mumbo happening into turn one got uh got fred trinko the guy set on pole on this last lap around and there's got a nice gap on it it's also got that bit of a punch in the eye there dave obviously Obviously, uh, ran into you in a dark alleyway and you fixed him up there. Broken headlight, bit of a dint there, and uh, that was subject to some uh, pretty willing racing yesterday. We don't normally see these cars coming together too often, but it got pretty willing yesterday. Here comes our, uh, our old mate, number 59, Ray Hepburn. He's travelled all the way from WA, so let's hope that he can make his way through the field in the, in the field, which is pretty much being the fast cars have got the general product on the front, haven't they? Let's see how a couple of these fought. Certainly Pete Mullerman's in the mix there. Oh, the 36 has gone round. That's uh, coming out. That's Rebecca Verhoeven. Yeah, Rebecca's done all right. She's put it back into first, and away she goes again. Absolutely fantastic. Um, it's her second year of racing a HQ Holden. Probably only a fourth or fifth race meeting, so she's doing absolutely fantastic as the guys come down in the dandy, yep, dandy corner. Coming out of the corner there, the 22 getting the power down. Better around this part of track. You've got to say, this one here on the uh, with the hazard lights flashing randomly, I think it's on the brake pedal. It's just uh, yeah, it's on transmitting. The brake pedal. <laughs> it's of, hard to of... believe an old car's got an earthing problem, <laughs> that's Darren, right. but um, that's certainly what the problem is. If you've been a race car too, you'd be on top of that. But boy, oh boy, not lacking for ponies in a straight line. Got that straight line handling sorted. Here comes Mullerman in the background, the entirely blacked out Pony comes down and he has got a massive challenge ranging up alongside there. That's Dom Leo in the gold and white car. I think this is Darren Collins' old uh, old championship winning Camaro. And he tips in there. Maybe just a bit of an optical illusion on that head-on camera. But the 43 covering it off nicely. Gee, he just gets it in there really well, doesn't he? Looks like something out of Happy Days, something that Fonzie might have raced against at some yeah, point. Yeah, mate, if you have a look at that 43 car, it's only a 4.7 litre car, so it's really, you know, grown above its weight, you could say. But, mate, it is beautiful. It is absolutely stunning to look at. Here they are, 5 litre and 4.7, up the back chute, over the top, Darren. Oh, side by who's side got the biggest here. set of brakes? Millerman just dips it in. He knows he's got the track position there. The 43. Gloss black. No arguments here. Bit of a don't argue there to Leo in the 84 there as well. He'll follow me through this part and we'll see you on the main straight again and we'll have another horsepower race here. They're coming up onto the back of uh, Rebecca Verhoeven and Dom just has to tuck in behind. She has a lock up. Throws a bit of interest in it for the guys in the historic touring and sends the uh, the white Camaro wide through 12 and 13 and he gives a licorice strap off the back of the ripple strip and where he had the advantage was in the straight line is all negated as they come onto the straight. Have a look at Banksy. Banksy still up, up the front. Ryan Woods is there also. Have a look at this. Ryan Woods, Banks, McJilton, first, second, third, or second and third. Whichever way you want to say, Kenny Wright's right in behind there. Tony Maloney in the 99 car. Mount Nura Ray Freitas. Freitas is doing a fantastic job. Also, Ray Jardine in the number eight car. It looks like that car is holding together absolutely fantastic. But have a look at McDonald, the Ready Rose car, right over the boot lid of Tony Maloney there, down in the dandy corner. Oh, he's locked the brake also, so have to be a little bit careful as the guys come through. Have a look at this. We've got a bit of a replay. 
We had a river replay. We can see where Ryan Woods got in front of the, the fast-flying plumber Steve Banks there. Andrew McJilton in the 14 car there. The Middies car, fantastic. Looks like he's doing a bit of Woods environmental, just mowing the lawn off the back of the ripple strip there through three. Popular place for people to uh, put the, the Victor lawnmower on the side as well. We get a good look down the straight there. And we were alluded to earlier in the uh, earlier race call with Dan and Steve, some of the great camera views. They've got this spider cam uh, on the straight here. Have a look at this. Head on with the Kiwis. Into turn one. It's car number one leading the way. Ryan Woods. Vibration. It's probably just shaking the brain a little bit loose, but he's onto it. Yeah, well, hopefully they've tried something, or at least... Oh, mate, he's doing the disco dance, and in turn two, turn three, he's gone from fourth, sorry, from first to fourth, just like that. Banksy, the plumber. Oh, jeez, mate, they're shaving that camera angle out of turn four pretty, pretty tight. Banks is in front. Chilton. Then we've got Kenny Wright, CR, which is a good sponsor to have for the HQ Holdens. And then we've got Ryan Woods. From first to fourth, in behind him. Oh, look at that for a replay. Oh, mate, he's, whoa, he's certainly put the um, grease nipples into the arms in all of a sudden to um, get from left to right, right to left to catch it as he goes through turn four. Banks down in the dandy corner. Absolutely fantastic. Majilton right on the boot lid of him. Majilton won't be wanting that. So if he's putting the grease dippers into the elbows, how many cc's of grease is he Oh, mate, it's at least load. two or three pumps. No. Oh, I'll tell you what, these HQs, when they get a little bit sideways... Oh, mate. here we go. We've got the, uh, in, in, the uh, historic touring car starting to mix it up. This is it. We think we're going fast. All of a sudden, this guy will just pull out 300 horsepower more than a HQ. As we go over the start-finish line, you can see that. And also the 25 car. Darren, did you work out what he hit? to bring the nose down on was that a, three or four. It was another car, Dave. Oh, we'll, well leave done, that. We'll, we'll leave that for uh, another yeah. day. We won't go out point any blame just at the moment, other than he's got a, he's got a sore eye. Oh, OK, yep. He certainly has got a sore right eye. Better than having an itchy one. But here we go down into turns two, three and four. That's right over the far side. Right over to the right-hand right. side, ladies and gentlemen. Kenny Wright weighing in on it here, haven't we, with this? Yeah. Ryan Woods has got an issue. And it's not a vibration issue. He's starting to go backwards. I would say he's done a little bit of damage when he clipped turn three, launched it off turn four. So he may have a bit of a problem. But have a look at Banks. Banks doing extremely well in the 176 car. The fast plumber. Oh, here's the camera angle. Oh, the oh we go back down through this magnificent uh, car number four. Brett Hodgkin in the GDHO got smoke pouring out from the exhaust pipe. It's got a side exit pipe there. That's not what you want with your uh, your old HO donk. Oh, wipers on, sliding around, giving Luke Patterson a bit of a look at 650 horsepower. And uh, he's covered it back on there. So Adrian Moore's had a torrid last lap or so. He's lost the lead of the race. He's had an off. He's had a good look at uh, the, the back and the side of Luke Patterson in that magnificent looking uh, Cooper S. Boy, in the day, if he, got, if he gets wet at all during this race, which he's probably not going to, watch how the Mini will go in the wet. They're amazing. They do the same lap times. Yeah, that's for sure. Right over, we've got the Ty Power HQ Holdens coming down the front straight. Thank you, Ty Power, once again for being the major sponsor of HQ RA Victoria. Have a look at that, mate. We've got that NB, that beautiful looking 43 car, right in front of there. Now we've got look at first, second, third. Oh, Majilton's gone a little bit wide, but it's okay. He might come. No, he won't. Banks will make. Oh, closes the door. Banks slams it shut. Right over into turn four. 176. Majilton there, right behind him in the middies car, car 14. As Darren crosses his arms and just keeps looking at me as we go up the back shoot, Darren. It's now your time, mate. And Oh, I actually like that bit of commentary, Dave, because you changed your mind more times than the drivers changed their mind when they were going on the track. It was, it was like reading a magnificent novel. It's just fantastic description of what's going. We've got smoke coming out of car four, still the uh, Hodgkin car, which has come into the pit lane this time around. But have a look at this. Banks in the 76. But Chilton in the 14s, grabbing dirt from the left, throwing it to the right, picking it up on the left and throwing it back right again there. Yeah, McDonald's can't come into pit lanes and McDonald must still have a head gasket or have an engine, engine issue with only probably two more laps to go. We've got two and a half minutes of race time plus the final lap. Have a look at McJilton. He's right on the boot, leader Banks. 
Look far to your left there. Left coming onto the front shape. Have a look. We've got Banks, Majilton. Then there's got a little bit of a gap. You can see Ryan Woods is there. Oh, look at and this. The uh, historic touring cars getting lively, starting to put some laps on there. Here comes uh, the fast Camaro as well, tearing it up through the field. That's the uh, the 60, 68 there of Monday, hanging it all together. HQ's in the mix here. Boy, we've got a lot of uh, mixed up cars now right throughout the field. The Cooper S of Luke Patterson just up the road in front of this group. But this is the front leading pack in the HQ race. There's the Mini. I tell you what, it looks like school pickup in 1974 out there at the moment. You're either getting in the Mini or you're getting in the queue. Yeah, Ryan Woods is driving the wheels off that number one car. Certainly a bit sideways coming out of turn four. That'll slow in coming up the back chute. We've got Tony Maloney in the 99 car. And right behind him, we've got the... Um, Oh, I reckon that's the eight car there, the X car. Oh, Luke oh, Patterson mini. pulling out in the Cooper S. He's uh, said, no, nah, I was hoping for rain, but he's pulled over to the side there. Lucas, the Prince of Darkness, reigns again as they go charging down yeah, into the HQ our West trying Australian. to eat. Ray, it's the 59 car, Darren. Yeah, Ray Hepburn <laughs> continuing on. Solved that fuel issue. I don't think it was too difficult one to solve, but he's onto it. He's done it and having an absolute ball a long, long way from home. He normally races uh, over there in the in the west. He's come over to Victoria, really enjoying Sandown. I guess when all you're doing is running around Barbagallo weekend after weekend, a new track is certainly uh, good to go on. He's normally racing against Paoli and Stubber, so he'll know how to do it. Two to go, just being told by the guys. TV from Glen Line, ladies and gentlemen. You can hear me live without an issue or a problem. You can hear me anytime. But um, Glen Line TV, absolutely fantastic what they're doing. Oh, for I actually, during the week at work, have it in the background on my um, my laptop at work. Yep. Your voice calling HQs, it fires me up. I get going all week. Long. Oh, the juices are flowing, Darren. You know that. Oh, oh, here we go. The 14 car, the midis car, Magilton trying to get in front. Now Woods is pushing Banks a little bit wide. This is a horsepower race, yes? HQ Holden, three speed, 202, single carby. Pedder suspension, Kender tyres. Here we go, up the back chute. Who's got a little bit of mumbo? Who's got to go side by side? Door handle, the door, oh, literally, door handle, the door handle. Banks, Banks in front. Banks in front of the 14 car, the midis car. Magilton, Banks has come back at Magilton. Ryan Woods right over Magilton. Banksy will like that, because hopefully he can throw away that rear vision mirror. Yep, we've still got him. Last lap board out now. So we are on the final journey for the feature race for the HQs and the historic touring cars. Still got plenty of racing to go. Another race this afternoon for these guys. The charge up the back straight. It is going to be the 22 of Brent Trengo. Then it's Adrian Moyle. He's got the, uh, the lights flashing again activated by the brake lights and uh, the 22 just a little bit of smoke coming out of the pipe there Moyle off the back of the track limits there didn't even get round the uh, round the ripple strip there but the power down out of these two cars and there it is massive sideways and that will throw away the charge to the finish here Brett Trengove will have noticed the mirrors go from side to side there as uh, Moyle enjoying the horsepower but certainly not getting it pointed at the chequered flag with that uh, sort of sideways action. And the chequered flag drops for Brent Trengo to Adrian Moyle. And off in the distance, we'll see Dom Leo and the 43 of Pete Millam if we go to the HQs coming back. Yeah, have a look, look at this with Jilton. He's got back in front of Banks again. Right behind him is Ryan Woods and Kenny Wright has got the chrome horn on the back of Ryan Woods there. As I come up the back shirt, we know, we know Banks' car's got more power. Banks on the inside, Magilton on the outside. Oh, here we go, around the outside, around the outside, up over the top, down into the corner, into Dandy Corner. And have a look at this, Magilton has got back to Banks. Banks locked the brake. Oh, Magilton's gone wide. Magilton has gone, Magilton's hit the wall. Magilton's hit the wall. He's out braked himself. Right over, we've got Banks, Ryan Woods, Kenny Wright. First, second, third, Magilton. 
was first and now he'll be last for the HQ Holland. It certainly got buried into there. He's only clipped the wall fairly firm. He's probably moved the wall back two inches. But here we go. Here we go. You won't believe it. Steve Banks, congratulations from Ty Power. The major sponsor of HQ Holdens and all the other sponsors of HQ Holdens. I'll get all that for you for the next race. We can see McJilton's car there. I don't reckon he's hit the wall. I reckon he's built up a nice bank of sand in front of him. Here we go. This was very willing HQs. Last <laughs> lap mayhem unleashed by the tyre power field. McJilton goes round. That was where Dave hit peak McJilton. No, nah, he didn't hit the wall. Oh, he just geez. hauled it up. There's a big sand pit in front of the car, oh, and they're going to have to sand dig it out. Sand pit, mate. He'll need two shovels and a bucket, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, lucky we've got a uh, lucky we've got a big machine that will just uh, go in there and reef him out and uh, send him back. Well, let's have a look how that played out as Brett Trent, Brent Trengove goes back into the field there. Adrian Moore will uh, head back after this weekend. Got a bit of panel work to fix her up on. Dom Leo. Got home uh, 21 seconds behind, and then it was Pete Bulleman in that uh, magic number 43 that we both uh, seem to enjoy watching go racing so much, Dave. There it is. Confirmation. Brent Trengove, Adrian Moore, Dominic Leo, Peter Bulleman, the 43 there. Jeff Monday doing a tremendous job getting home into fifth. Ray Hepburn from rear of the grid to six in the 59. Fixed his fuel problem, and away he goes. Bill Trengove in the number 64. Don Knight in the court scene. Steve Banks. Okay, was the first few in first in the HQ. Ryan Woods second in the HQs, and Kenny Wright. How good's that? Kenny Wright into P3. Tony Very Maloney, happy. Ray Jardin, Ben Richards, Andrew McJilton, who was on the podium, threw it all away at Dandenong Road. Then we got James Kenner, John Mahoney, Peter Olver, Rebecca Verhoeven, who got home in the end. Luke Patterson, sadly not making it home in the mini. Andrew Baird, Brett Hodgkin, Glenn McDonald. The rest of these guys didn't front for the race out there this time round. So, fantastic race. Great to have Dave Amor here with us, calling the racing with the HQs. Dave, we'll see you again this afternoon at 3.20 p.m. Certainly will, mate. We can see the sun is starting to crack open those um, clouds a little bit. So, it's got to be a hell of a lot warmer this afternoon. So, you and me might need to have a sherry or a sherbet up here calling the last one this afternoon. I don't think so. I'll remain totally professional and I'll support you all the way. Now, Dave, you're not just here calling HQs. You run a business selling spare parts and doing tyres as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, oh, some 25 years ago, mate, I suppose, I was racing on the Thunderdome in the flat track and I realised there was an opportunity for me to sell spare parts, build engines and do all those things when I was a lot younger and a lot fitter, you could say. Round is the shape, it I understand confirmed. that. So from now on, for the last 12 years, I've been building uh, radiators, bits and pieces, keeping HQs on the track throughout Australia. People ring me up, they order their stuff, I send it off. So Australia Post is doing extremely well. But, mate, I love HQs for what they are. I want to see them on the track. And I go to around about 23 meetings a year for HQs. That includes Western Australia. Darwin, Queensland at least twice, South Australia once or twice, New South Wales eight times and Victoria seven or eight times. So from HQ Dart Racing, my family's allowed me to do that. Uh, I had a bit of a, a miss, you could say, when I had my stroke eight, uh, 15 months ago. Very, very lucky to come back. I think I'm almost normal, but people keep telling me that. So I, I've had a second chance. As good as you second, were prior. Yeah, and a second wind. And... Um, I love the opportunity and I'll continue on because I love motorsport, the passion, but most importantly, mate, it's about you and everyone else as my big family and I'd really like to thank you all very much. So thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Dave Amor, as the uh, caption says across the bottom of the screen. When he's a part of the team here at the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships, his national treasure, Dave Amor, for all of those particular reasons. We've got plenty of racing coming on track next. MG and invited British sports cars on track next. Formula Ford and saloon cars. Rounds out our morning stanza of round one of the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships being promoted by the MG Car Club here today so in really enjoying all of the hard work that uh, they're doing their officials right around the track I had a good chat with uh, cage ken johnson last night who uh, 
has his 80th birthday at some stage this year and is uh, retiring away from the uh, rough and tumble of all the recovery. So send a big cheerio to Cage. And, uh, of course, the Johnson family have been heavily tied up with Victorian Motorsport for many, many years and all the volunteers around the track. Check it out at motorsport.org.au forward slash officials. Sign up, come and join us, be a volunteer, and we will uh, have a quick break and be back with MG and Invited British Cars. Welcome back to Sandown, the home of horsepower. Cars on track next will be for MG Racing Australia. The MG and invited British sports cars will be out on track, fielding fantastic fields over the last couple of seasons. There's nothing quite like a, an MG owner once the TV camera's on, how they magically get their cars back out on track. I say that totally with tongue in cheek and so looking forward to this race. With uh, And don't want to pointed out too much for the stars of the show but those two cars weaving their way down the straight there are uh, absolutely iconic sean hurley has joined me here today sean uh, lots going on right throughout the pit and paddock area but certainly these mgs they love the tv cameras they love the warmth of the camera on them don't they Yeah, they uh, look the part, don't they, Darren? They're out there and, uh, and having an absolute ball. These two big open V8s off the start of the grid this weekend. Phil Chester has put the uh, number 72 back on pole for race one on the Sunday here. Uh, Richard Milligan in the uh, ex Mort Fitzgerald V8 in number two. Danny Siyama, a bit out of his element in number three. He's done well yesterday to, to bring it home in third. And uh, Mike Trathan trying to uh, back up his, his two-year uh, championship win, uh, currently in fourth this, this weekend. 
Cars streaming around the bottom end of the course here, which is where the uh, straight used to run right along that fence there and where the cars are through turns one and two was the pit area. So from 35, 36 years ago, that was changed around to get a bit more length in the track and other additions put in. The uh, grid continues to roll on through. Gary Bulma in the MGB down to Rodney Wells in the uh, Bug Eye Barn MG Midget. Hanks Wadman in the Hamer Hose Service MGB. GT, uh, MGB, then we go to Tony Volabrecht in the MGZR, back to Gary Gibson in the uh, Triumph GT6 Mark III, John Makem, the big fella, slung himself into the uh, MG Midget again for another great day of racing, he has vowed and declared a training program is going to be part of his life going forward, Pete Rose, Adam Ayliffe back to, uh, Sh uh, sorry, Shirley St John Cox in the uh, TR7V8, Jimmy Dodd in the Eclipse Signature MGZR as well. We keep rolling. Dave Mottram, a guy that has been around forever in the uh, MG Racing Australia scene. Actually and withdrawal this weekend, oh, unfortunately, he? David. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's had to go home with some mechanical issues. Uh, Jeff Pike, who's uh, again down from New South Wales, back out again today. Though it's great to see. And uh, unfortunately, Jeff and John Cox is not on, not joining us as well. You will note uh, Simon Elliott, uh, who had a few issues yesterday with flat batteries and minor issues getting out on track for race one. Uh, he'll be starting, I believe, from the back of the grid and winding his way through in the first few laps. Looking forward to seeing that. It struck a magnificent uh, profile at the end of last year and certainly gave uh, Phil Chester a very big hurry on. And uh, there's something right down the bottom of my heart right now, Sean, that is just watching that red car sitting on uh, the front row of the grid there, car number 10. Uh, something that I watched as a younger man win a lot of races and so wish Richard Milligan all the very, very best. He's got a weight on his shoulders. This car has... Uh, uh, you know, if you if you chopped it in half, it'd have a lot of rings like an old tree, and a lot of those rings would be race victories. So, yeah, really like good to see that he's breathed life back into this car, and you know, taking it up to Phil. Phil is the current lap record holder. And, he is, uh, yeah, great, great to, to have, go after it. Great to have these two on the front grid. And uh, just to confirm from yesterday, this this uh, ex Mort Fitzgerald car uh, in in uh, on the on the number two position there did in fact have uh, the lap record at a 116.4 for about 10 years, and Phil Phil only. Uh, beat that in about 2022 with a 116. And away we go. The race starts. Number 10 gets away nicely. Good clutch take up there by Richard Milligan. Phil Chester, of course, goes with him and streaks right across to the driver's right. Takes the ultimate line into turn number one. The interesting thing is going to be the uh, GT stripe car of uh, Siama and Trathan in the number one. Ooh, and he locks up. up a left front all the way into the corner, but manages to get it out in P3. Danny obviously heard and saw that and went, oh, I'm not going to be part of what's going on there. No, he'll be chasing uh, Mike there all race, I'd say, just trying to get back in front. It'll be interesting little dice to see unfold. Gee, I tell you what, Gary Bulmer and uh, Rodney Wells, though, they're there, aren't they? They're just watching. I wouldn't even say they're just watching at the moment. They don't want to let those guys stream away, but we just look at what is a, uh, a sliding history of British sports cars and even hatchbacks as we go into the more modern cars there. We've got the Sebring front just popping out there as well in the green and I'm going to say gunmetal grey or dark grey open top there and coming down into uh, Dandenong Road for the first time we get a good look at uh, Gary Bulmer's uh, style. Another lock up there from Mike Trathen into the uh, Dandenong Road by the looks. Great to see uh, Gary Bulmer there got that car going. He's had a few teething issues this weekend, so great to see him right on the back of Danny there. The four-cylinder uh, Roadster MGB just, just giving it a little bit to the V8. Yeah, certainly hanging about there. This is the telling st st tale, though. The V8 just opens up. There's nothing quite like uh, cubes and pistons on the, the straights here at Sandown. Yeah, just I, I, easing away, but Mike Trathen, let's hope he doesn't uh, turn in that left front tyre into a 50 cent piece. I reckon he's been winding some power into that thing overnight. He's uh, he's done well there. He's, he's, he's left Danny almost for dead there down the front straight. What, what sort of power would be in that midget? It's not a lot, is it? Look, not a huge amount. Again, the weight would have to be around the six, 700 kilo mark, yeah. I'd say, at, at the most. Um, you know, with the with the twin cam head he's got on that A-series, it's probably putting out close to sort of 200, 250 horsepower, oh, I, I'd yeah. imagine. Yeah, um, yeah look, I'd, I'd say you keep that sort of figure under his hat a little bit, but uh, yeah, look, it's great to see it going so well. Always good to see it. Well, the Triumph just in the background there, getting it mixed up a little bit here with uh, Chris Gibney and Tony Volabrecht. Edwards comes streaming on through. 
Good to see the uh, triumph there. Of course, we had a trip from South Australia over last year. Doing a good job. Here comes uh, the Jeff Pike in the back of the grid. Yeah, look, Simon slowly getting his way through in that RV8. The headlights are on, and uh, he's, he's winding his way back through the field. Geez, there wasn't too many that came from the factory with bright LEDs like that, was it? Not at all, no. <laughs> Coming through, looks brilliant, doesn't it? That number 55 really is a uh, great-looking racing car. Huge rear wing, you know, when it goes right out of the pump arches, right out to the extremities of the body there. They're looking for certainly some downforce. Charging on through there, the field being very, very careful not to... Uh, get mixed up with Simon Elliott and the 55 as he charges his way back through the field. The good thing about it is it, Sean, that um, the last race for the weekend is on a 3.45 for these, go these guys, so the further he can get through the field, the more we'll have those three V8s. Hope hopefully, front. yeah, hopefully Simon does sort of find his way back up the front and, and have a bit of a dice there with Richard later on, but uh, yeah, look, he's doing well to come back through. We're actually seeing Rod Wells here working his butt off here just to keep the two modern ZRs behind him there and as they go into turn one. Yeah, Chris, this is a good battle with Chris Gidney, isn't it? He is. Chris has been chasing a few brake issues this weekend. It looks like he's sort of got it sorted. Uh, that he's keeping in front of Tony there, so look, hopefully he's uh, he can maintain that that position. They raced these cars, these ZRs, in a one make series, didn't they? In the, in the UK, they st yeah, they still do. Look, there's 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 a couple of different variants, and, and these two cars are, are just about at the same spec now, uh, where they call them a, a 190 car with a, with a slightly bigger engine and those sort of things. But yeah, they, they do run them in a one-make series in the UK uh, at, at club level and at, and at full race level. Cars in the background here, the Triumph bobs its eyes up above that little rise at the top. We've got the 33 battling it out here as well. So uh, mid-pack now here with, uh, with John Makem. Oh, look, the, the lack of food since uh, since yesterday might just be playing a part with John. He's, uh, he's, he's had the pressure on to, to drop a few kilos from the commentary It's a lightweight booth. version, isn't That's it? That's right, yeah. No, but look, he's still getting out there. He's, he's, he's actually giving Gary, Gary a bit of a run here in the triumph. Gary's done really well to keep it up into, uh, into ninth there. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how that unfolds. 33 on the 67 here, the straight line. Looks very tight around through 13, tries to run out over the uh, yellow line there using full track extremities there, the 33. And then just drifting ultimately back over to the right hand side of the track to set the car up to stream it through turn one, which albeit is a 90 degree corner, it's a very, very wide piece of road, wide exit, so you can flow the car through there quite fast. Bennett signs MG and invited British cars. Oh no, Ooh. there's the uh, Elliott car. Simon Elliott has gone round at turn four. The officials are just telling him to stop by his time as the whole field that he's just managed to overtake screams on through. I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to put the ZR, uh, sorry, the his car into any danger as well. No, a bit of a shame there for Simon. He's, he's obviously overcooked it through turn four and just, just looped at mid-corner. So he'll get going again and catch up a bit of pace. So just parked it up there. The officials giving him very, very clear signals as to when you can go there. They're used to doing that on that corner. Bill Chester comes through just acknowledging the uh, the flags there as well. He's got the lead in this race and done a 116-3-3 out there. How's that? How are we closing in on what he's actually Oh, he's, he's three tenths of a uh, 0.3 of a second off yeah. his best time round here. So uh, he's, he's good conditions for a lap record. If you can get it, get into the 15s, he'd be over the moon. So he's currently sitting on a 16 flat as the lap record and he's he's held that since early 2022. So it'd be interesting to see if he can knock that, knock a 0.3, 0.4 of a second off his current time. I don't think he's putting tyres on this one. No, look, he's definitely not chasing a lap record, but uh, it, it's still in the back of the mind uh, in that sense. He's, uh, he, I think the car is definitely capable of it, but uh, it, it, it is really down to the, the, the push comes to shove at that point. Great shot here on the bridge now as the cars come streaming under us. There goes the Triumph. And there's Johnny Makem with the uh, red and white checkers across his rear quarters. Again, a shame that uh, that there's only one Triumph GT6 out here this weekend. You were bang on uh, when you mentioned yesterday that Trevor Lindsay would be sitting watching the, the stream in anticipation. So uh, if, you, if you're watching again today, Trevor, maybe we'll see you next round. Definitely was uh, a fantastic part. In fact, uh, one of the sensational aspects of the entire Victorian State Federation Championships last year was to watch Trevor go about his thing. 
I think as Gary mentioned earlier, uh, I was chatting to him about the GD6s and, and uh, he said, oh, tre Trevor, that, that, that GD6 of Trevor Lindsay is, is basically like a pair of jeans. He puts it on and he just knows it so well. Yes. And you can see, as you say, last year, the way he drove it, it, it was just impressive to watch. So Elliot's now uh, got off turn four and made his way into pit lane. So that's a shame. We were hoping to get those V8s sort of towards the front of the field. But you do, sadly, you do have weekends like this in any form of racing. Yeah, look, he's definitely chasing a few minor issues with that car. And I, I'd say it's just gotten to the point where it, it's just unsafe to drive it at pace. So, look, unfortunately, we'll possibly see, not see him for the rest of the weekend. But uh, I'm sure he'll get it sorted. It, it's not as difficult as a Rolls-Royce. So, look, hopefully he can get that one fixed and back out on track. Here we go, talking about getting it fixed up and applying the pressure here. Car number one all over the back. Mike Trafford of Danny Siyama, and he's just using the right boot to his absolute gain at the moment. Sitting in behind, they're almost a line astern with each other, trying to shake that draft off. That is Gary Bulmer just off the back of that shot there as well. So Gary, I guess, is staged just in case something unfolds in front of him that uh, might have one of these cars decline in position at some stage, but doing a, uh, a ripping job in the four. I reckon he probably actually wants to be a lot closer to the battle. Yeah, look, again, unfortunately, Gary's got a few minor issues with that they've been been fiddling with all weekend. So it's possibly a little bit off the pace today, but uh, again, not, not, not holding back. I know, doing through turns 12 and 13 here. This is a good battle. It sounds uh, like Rod Wells has just had a bit of an issue somewhere on track, unfortunately. So these two coming across the line now five minutes left to go so uh, that is uh, Jason Edwards who has uh, gone off track with the mechanical issue has continued on and that is in the uh, the MGF this is Danny Siamo still on the screen here in the number 15 well here's a group with a fast car coming through that is Richard Milligan and getting out of the way is the, uh, the 67 there of Gibson. He might be a bit caught up with traffic there, Richard. He's only only run around at 120s. He, he should be doing about 117s, 118s in that car. We were chatting to him earlier, he's done a few few in the 17s. So you know, the car and himself are definitely capable. So possibly having a little few little issues. Phil Chester there in the Monte Power MGB GTV8 leading the race down into turn number one, being followed now by Richard Milligan, some seven and a half seconds down the road. They've just put laps on these guys. That's up to about position number 10 in the race with four minutes and 10 seconds left to go. There is uh, a little bit of speed disparity between these cars. Certainly there's uh, development of the race cars. Oh, the, the drivers, Darren. And the drivers. And the drivers too. <laughs> well, these cars mostly run in a period correct mechanical uh, format. And uh, some of the other guys at the front are uh, stretching the limits of that. Indeed. Yeah, look. Again, take, take this opportunity to, uh, to, to, to say a huge thanks to our, our annual sponsors of uh, Splat Engineering and Buran Motors. We, we wouldn't be able to come racing without these guys, so it's, uh, it's great to have these guys on board. Better signs, of course, throwing their weight behind round number one here for the MG and Invita British Cars at the 888 Home Loans. Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. We've got a uh, massive calendar of events coming up. You'll see most of these cars right across the season. We've got Winton on the 16th, 17th of, of March, then Phillip Island, May 17, 18, 19. Back here at Sandown for the 23rd, 24th and 25th of August. Phillip Island, September 20, 21, 22. And then Calder Park rounding out the season on the 26th and 27th of October. We're just seeing Chris Gidney here really trying to put the pressure on Max Whatever in, uh, in the uh, little four-cylinder MGB. Uh, Chris couldn't quite make uh, make the move yesterday on Hank and, and, and hope we'll see if you're going to have a chance in the next few minutes. Chester got those Le Mans flashes uh, stuck on, I would say, at the moment. Getting through there, charging on through the field here. And we got uh, Chris Gidney roaring alongside the B there and dipping it in. 36 goes back one spot for Hank. Not an easy uh, overtaking manoeuvre to, to do there, so he's done well to, to make that stick nicely. Very safe driving, good to see. The MG uh, racing scene is certainly uh, alive and well, isn't it, with uh, events on at Rock Roy and uh, here, of course, with the, the, uh, this round. And, of course, MGs are often on the, 
the Island Classic and here at Sandown for the Classics as well, aren't Yeah, they? you're bang on. Look, I think the uh, Rob Roy Revival, which is a massive event for Rob Roy uh, during th through the MG Car Club's on in the next few weeks. Uh, great little event to get to if you if you get a chance. Uh, and again, look, you're right, we have a great little category here and, and we've got some reasonable entries this weekend, but uh, there are a few regulars missing, so a few people probably watching from home. Uh, a few people weren't able to get here this weekend. A bit of a shout out to Barry and, and Ursula, who uh, I'd say are sitting at home watching the uh, the race unfold. They, they were supposed to be out here this weekend, but due to power issues and unfortunately not being able to get cars off hoist, they've had to withdraw. So look, it'll be good to see them back out later in the year. It's a shame that, isn't it, with uh, what's been going on around Melbourne this uh, last sort of seven or eight days with, uh, with that sort of thing. But uh, definitely I'm missing a couple of stags that I'd normally be glued to the uh, competition with as well. So it's a big, uh, big shout out to uh, the team number 40. See a nice little dice here towards the back of the field with Peter Rose and uh, Adam Ailiff in the little uh, A-series midget having a bit of fun down the back. Yeah, geez, Peter Rose has been peddling this thing for a while too, hasn't he? Yeah, he has indeed. Yeah, look, it's uh, again like an old pair of jeans, this car for Peter. He, he jumps in it and in about three laps, he's, he's, he's where he should be. So, again, he's just just uh, got in front of Adam there into the turn one. Keep Peter Rose, honest. so we're looking at 14th and 15th on the road here with the uh, the 6 and the 14, which, which is kind of irrelevant to the positioning in the field because these two will get out of the car and they'll have had a ripping old time. Oh, look, Darren, this is, this is what makes me want to get back out there. I've been watching this sort of battle through the, throughout the weekend and unfold. And, and you know what? Like, you get out there and have a bit of fun through midfield towards the back. And, and it doesn't matter where you're racing, I don't think. You, as long as you're out there with someone having a, having a bit of fun, it's, uh, there's nothing else like it. Have a look at this. We're going to see Phil Chester just evolve onto the straight here. There he is. He's coming through on the guys that are currently sitting three and four in this race. So he is, uh, except for the guy that's behind him, lapped the entire field. Phil has gone through in the multi-power car. Well, there's a change of position there as well as Ailiff goes through on Peter Rose. Drove through on him there, and they will be now have their mirrors full with the charging Phil Chester. Blue flags being waved, so the drivers have to acknowledge that there is a faster car coming through. And the 72 into the, uh, into the S's. It's 11, 12 and 13 and I think it will be getting the last lap board. Yes, yeah. the last lap board going out now for the uh, Chester car and the rest of the field will see that as well. Phil has got an entire empty front straight with him. Danny Siama as well coming through and uh, <laughs> behind him is Mike Trathan in the number one. Yeah, look, it's all about consistency for the championship. So Mike's, uh, Mike's done well to sort of hold fourth for the weekend so far. So, look, it'll be interesting to see how the year unfolds with these guys. Mike obviously defending his, uh, his championship win from last year and the year before. So can he make it three in a row, which will be interesting to see throughout the year. Something I always like to point out on car number one as well is that it is, uh, it's got the road registration number plates on it there as well. Not that I think he drives it to and from the track, but the option is there. No, but there's always the odd test. Always we see Shirley's had a bit of an issue there. Poss possibly a bit of a mechanical problem there that she's uh, evolved. Hopefully it's not on fire. That's definitely on fire. That's some black smoke getting out. Oh, uh, well that was well within the 15 seconds, so Wasn't she's it? done well. Yes. <laughs> The 15, mandated 15 seconds you've got to get out of a car these days. So the 92. Oh, oh Danny Siama's gone round as well. Looks like he's actually just had a bit of a knock on the front. That uh, that doesn't look good for Danny. No, Mike Trathan continues on. So uh, Trathan will bring himself into a P3. Here's our race leader for Monty Power, Yarra Valley Towing. Fantastic looking MG B GT V8 of Phil Chester takes the race win for race number two for the weekend. The feature race here for uh, this morning's racing. We still have another race to go this afternoon, but he's sent a fairly clear message, hasn't he? Well over 16 seconds uh, in the lead of this race, right? waiting for Richard Milligan to get to the line and uh, still coming around, finish, I think that, he's... Uh, finish the race. So boy, it's going to be, uh, Phil's just won it by even further a margin than there uh, goes Richard last over lap the around. It's 31 seconds to Phil Chester. And, and as we see that yellow flag, flags, obviously. as we see those flags waving uh, profusely, I'd, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the officials out there. Again, we wouldn't be able to go racing with, with any of these volunteers. And yeah, massive thank you to all the people behind the scenes that have made these, these events happen.
Tom Macon just getting uh, the green flag there to continue on to the end of this race. Is he going to be able to challenge the car in front? That, uh, the nullifying of the field sort of up the back straight and down into Dandenong Road. Slows you down, breaks your concentration as well. The Bennett Signs car number 33 is not going to throw it away just yet. Oh, great, to see, all up. great to see Jeff Pike out there finishing this race again. He's had a few minor issues this weekend, but great to see him finish getting the chequered flag. So the field just coming around now. There's service vehicles out there. Got a couple of pickups to do. Hopefully Danny had just uh, looped it and is able to make his way back to the pits under his own steam. Here is the confirmation of results. By 31 seconds, Phil Chester beats Richard Milligan. Awesome to see car number 10 of Richard Milligan's back on track. It really is a magic piece of uh, motorsport history in the Australian realm of things. Mike Trathan, car number one, home in P3, sets his championship title defence up nicely, doesn't he? Not bad for a trophy race. Gary Bulmer, Rodney Wells, Chris Gidney home in sixth there. Hanks Wardevin there in the 36th home in seventh. Tony Volabrek in eighth. Danny Siama ultimately home after holding onto a position on the podium. Ninth, tenth there as well to Pike, Jeff Pike. Eleventh, sorry. Then uh, John Makem, Adam Ailiff, Pete Rose, James Dodd, Shirley St. John Cox parked it up with smoke billowing out from uh, under the bonnet of the Triumph. And Jason Edwards, Simon Elliott withdrew throughout that race. Sean Hurley, thank you so much for joining us during the uh, MGs. We've got one more race with you guys this afternoon at 3.45. Looking forward to seeing uh, the bearded burbler make his way back in here for uh, the racing for the end of the day. Indeed, Darren. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm off down to get some more raffle tickets for this Metabo prize. Oh, they're right? still selling it. It's still got to be... Hey, someone's got to win it. I thought so it was I'm, drawn. No, no, I think it's getting drawn a bit later, oh, isn't okay. it? Yeah, so 10 o'clock anyway. If you get a chance, go and get some more raffle tickets. You might win yourself a little uh, my Metabo rattle gun. Certainly. Thank you very much, Sean. We'll be back with Formula Fords on track in just a couple of moments. Back soon.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're in a bit of a holding pattern here at Sandown International Motor Raceway for the Triple Eight Home Loans Round One of the Victorian 2024 Victorian State Race Series. We've got a full program of races still to go. In fact, we haven't finished the morning uh, schedule just yet. Formula Ford's on track next, which is nice to have the clean up before the Formula Ford race rather than after, which is uh, the tradition. Um, saloon cars next on track, and then we go back into this afternoon's program with the Porsche 944 sports cars, the Big Bangers, the sports sedans, the Buzz and Hornets, the Formula Vs, XLs, the Big V8s have turned it on for us this weekend. Historic touring cars and HQs, MG and Abide, British cars, which we've just played goodbye to. Formula Ford and Saloon Cars rounds out today's program here for round one. I would like to take this opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to all the race fans right around this big brown land of ours. And now that we're live streaming internationally, welcome all of our fans to round number two at Winton Motor Raceway, about two and a half hours from where we are here in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. I'll leisurely drive up a very well-maintained highway to uh, Benalla and that will be on March 16 and 17. Phillip Island for the Pyark round in May, 17, 18 and 19. Back here, Sandown for the Australian Sports and Association of Victoria round number four on August 23, 24, 25. Phillip Island for the uh, VMC, the Victorian Mini Club round. One of my more favourite ones, exit Melbourne stage left, head down to Phillip Island, avoid all the aerial ping pong finals and uh, enjoy a great weekend of racing at the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit, our best permanent racing facility in this country. Calder Park will host our final round on the 26th and 27th of October. So a great season of motorsport coming your way. Thanks to Triple Eight Home Loans for all of their support right throughout the season. We are under delay at the moment. There has an, there was an incident, big oil down at uh, Turn 6. You've just seen the pictures previously, but if you are trackside for those joining us on Blendline TV, you can see the uh, oil down that's gone all the way from uh, the bridge halfway up the straight all the way to where the uh, Triumph parked it up 
at the bottom of the straight there. Great to see all of those crews out there working very, very hard. I'm Darren Smith, right alongside me is Paul Zitti, uh, amongst many other things. He's the, uh, uh, one of the key players in the, in the board of management of this series. Uh, welcome, Paul, as also you are a Formula Ford race driver of note as well on the national scene. Um, welcome here. How good is it to see these volunteer teams just working for a common cause out there at the moment? Thank you very much, Daz. Always a pleasure to be in the commentary booth alongside your good self. And you're dead right. We, we keep saying it, but it, we keep saying it because it is so true. The volunteers make this sport happen. If we had to... Uh, motorsport's expensive, we all get that. If we actually had to pay these people from the clean-up crews you see out there now, the fire and rescue, the flag marshals, the race organizing committees that put this together thousands upon thousands of hours are poured into a single event and these guys rain hail shine they've, they've got relatively pleasant conditions today which is very nice for them but that's a rarity right it's it you see them it, siberia at i was, go, I was just gonna it's, say all you need to do is say uh, the corner name siberia, siberia name because it is not like of the siberia salt mine. <laughs> no it is like siberia you get that wind coming in there and we have genuinely had people who are so stoic and committed to what they do they stand there until someone goes man we have got to get you out of here and they have been borderline hypothermia so yeah, yeah. they are the toughest you talk about tough sports people we got our various football codes and sure they're hard players but these race officials they're as hardcore as it gets they really are. There's some uh, people enjoying the bit of downtime there as well. Got the uh, tent down at Turn 4. It won't be like that. Turn 4 is probably one of the busiest corners of any racetrack in this country, and they work very, very hard. Small team of four there. There'll be two flaggies, a communicator and a sector marshal that will be uh, feeding all the information back to race control so that they can work out what resources are needed. We, uh, we always hope it's not medical support, but there is still there is plenty of medical support here at the track that we can call on if required. Hopefully it's normally just for a flat tow because someone's parked it up there because they haven't refueled the car correctly for the distance or yep, something or, or like that. Or broken something relatively yeah. minor uh, or even it, it, in the, in the uh, incident that we are seeing cleaned up at the moment. It, it's been terminal for that car and it's created quite a clean up to be done but fortunately no harm, no foul, nobody injured or hurt which is what we want to see, right? We, we, no one ever wants to see anyone injured as we we say to the medical crews when they turn up they're a necessary service that we must have on track and we sincerely hope we provide them with a thoroughly boring weekend <laughs> yeah it is right unfortunately it doesn't uh, w always work out like that just watching uh, Cameron Jamison he's walking around there with his high vis on it's the uh, industrial laser ram there he's just sort of coordinating with the crews up there he'd probably be one of the last to leave the scene there and radio it in and say right we're clear of the site here at Turn number six, the uh, the down cars or the oil downer cars and the sweepers. So uh, we try and get as much of that up. And interestingly enough, Paul, your your angle once you saw all that going down was, yep, that's right. That's just what a Formula Ford racer wants to see. There's a whole lot of dust in his face on the warm-up lap. Yeah, right. So in a Formula Ford, the approach up the back straight is actually the fastest point on the circuit. I can't speak to other categories whether or not they're the same as that but we'll we'll get a, a faster speed at the back straight than we do at the end of the, the main straight and it's a blind corner as you approach it uh, the good guys it's a, a a bit of a lift a bit of a lift barely a breathe on the brake pedal and then just tuck everything in and tip it in and, and go for it. And I'm, I'm not in the league of the, uh, of the front running young guns, but it, it's something awesome to be seen. There are 200 clicks over there, like 220 odd on the approach to 230 if you're in a good tow. So that being all covered in, that the cleanup crews do an amazing job. When they let us go racing, there'll be the dust there, but it doesn't inspire confidence. I believe we're well, about you, a minute you, away from going racing. As always, you sell yourself short and you're one of the most humble guys involved in Australian motorsport. But uh, I had the pleasure of spending a couple of hours with you talking about your career on the, uh, on the Race Fuels Grassroots Racing podcast. And uh, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, this is a guy sitting right next to me with great and vast experience in motorsport. Sells himself short as a competitor, but let me tell you, there's some... People racing at Mount Panorama this weekend that owe uh, their professional career to what this guy did in the background and uh, I think continuing to do so. On the back of that, yes. um, Paul, 
I just want to celebrate last year's results for the Formula Fords after a couple of seasons of trying so hard. Joey Fawcett got through and uh, won it with the Spectrum. Yeah, look, amazing outcome for, for Joe. Joe and his, uh, his dad, uh, Mark, the, the family, the way they go about it is, is what motorsport should be. It's a family team. They get a lot of factory support from Michael Ballin, the designer and constructor of the, the Spectrum Formula Fords, and he provides that technical support so they can do the mechanical work on it and go racing in that lad, dad, father, son, not to be gender specific about it. Anyone can do it, but that's the traditional um, the traditional format and they've, they've won the title and thoroughly deserved. How good's this shot we've got on board with Bailey Collins, a guy that, uh, well, I guess you'd say poised for championship uh, greatness uh, in the not too distant future, not sort of reading too much into it, but has been around for a couple of seasons now, starting to bob up. You know, we've got, we haven't got Joe, we haven't got Jake Santa Lucia, um, Eddie Bezik as well is uh, on the front row of the grid there. So a couple of the names there, Zap Lodka was uh, has, um, also um, doing other things as well. So just watching how these uh, Formula Fords go about it, um, it is uh, by every stretch of the imagine, imagination, open wheeler racing. So you've really got to give each other room. It's only a millimetre, but you've just got to give that millimetre, don't you? You don't yeah. want to tear a corner off because these things are designed to work in a certain plane of load. Uh, getting a hit from the side is not one of them. No, exactly. Same as it does make you go right up to Formula One with all their carbon fibre, carbon fibre eggshell technology incredibly strong in the... Oh, we have a car off on the out lap. Um, but, yeah, incredibly strong in the uh, uh, direction it's designed to be, but you jump right in the middle of the thing and it'll shatter. So uh, Formula Ford's no different. We don't have the... Uh, and, and, frankly, if you could see most of the front uh, high-end sedan or, or tin top cars with their uh, body panels off they've got similar sort of wishbone construction exactly. underneath yeah. so yeah so this is jack Wynack in the spectrum 011b and he's parked right below our cameraman we're getting a good look in uh, there and he looks at the cameraman as if to say i'm not really sure what to do now i need to get no. out of the way here and there's another one going slow that there looks like that image in Radburn. i think that looks like or is that it's it's or 56 yes i could be wrong there it's a green a uh, green car looks out of the CHE ta stable, so that's why I thought it Ethan might have been. Ethan Fitzgerald. Uh, Ethan uh, Fitzgerald. It's a white car, but it's green, so it's almost out of delivery done on it. The uh, rescue guys are there to help car 30. Let's have a look at the grid and see how they'll line up two, I guess, uh, classes in this in this field. And uh, we have on pole position. Cody Maines, Ruddy, after uh, winning the race yesterday, best lap time of a 117.00 to Cody Mains Ruddy yesterday. Eddie Bezik lines up again as well this season. Liam Lockiano goes through in car number 43 out of Queensland. Bailey Collins, the Victorian, who we're on board with on top of his orange helmet. Jack Bussey to uh, Lockie Strickland in the 147. There he is taking his spot in the box. Wow, Paul, that is taking us right into the start of the race. I can just bet my heart's just started beating about 100 yeah. uh, RPM more than what it was. Yeah, we've seen the uh, it's come up on the uh, on your screen there for the viewers at home and around the world that the race has been, uh, the start's been aborted. So there'll be a delayed start while they pick up the broken down car from Pertec corner down there and uh, while they recover, uh, sorry, car, car 30, 56, yeah. Ethan Fitzgerald's car, get that and happening as well. and they'll then be able to get this race. They'll send them around for another warm up lap. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they'll turn them off. These single-seat racing cars are effectively air-cooled. So there's no there's uh, water pump and radiators, obviously, but there's no fan. The radiators, as you see, these wonderful shots from uh, the onboard with Bailey. You can see the side pods, which are the two little blue bulges you can see either side of the main cockpit there. Each of those houses a radiator, and that's uh, how the engine is kept cool. With the air flowing over them, does a marvellous job. This is a fairly similar view to what you would have with the Spectrum 012 if you were going to be racing this weekend, Paul. I just well, wanted... no, generally I'd be down in the cockpit. I tend not to sit on the back of one of my competitors' cars, okay. but it's a close view. <laughs> okay, so we're a couple of centimetres above Indeed. where your eye line would normally be. Yep. Now, this is the human element of going racing. You're in the car, you're in your 0 one 2 or whatever it is that you're choosing to run that weekend, you're on the grid, and it's delayed. 
you've had this big build up, you've sat in the marshalling area, you've controlled your breathing, you've done all the things to concentrate. Now you have this thrown yep. at you. What, yep. What's going through? What's the human condition sitting on the grid down there right now? Well, and, and that's where motor sport is, a, a, it's a sport. And it, over the past couple of decades, motor racing has caught up with uh, a lot of the other competitive sports around the world, whether it's athletics, whether it's cricket, tennis. In the last 30 years plus, all of those sports, you would not have had an elite competitor that did not have a sports psychologist in their corner, helping them manage those emotions. And an adrenaline sport like, like racing, it's even, I would suggest, more important. So right now, the good competitors out there have seen that. They know they've got to shut the engine down. And if they tell you to shut the engine down, you got a little while to wait on your hands. So right now, they're getting themselves emotionally calmed. They're getting down from the, on the outlap coming around. They were getting themselves psyched and really ready for the race. And, and so for now, it's about a reset. So they're back to probably where they were in the, in the pre-grid area. Keep themselves in that calm but ready to go. And once they get sent around for their roll-up lap, it'll be back into that mode. So the, the front-running guys, even these young guys at this level, that's how serious they take their motorsport. That's how home they'll be. And then they'll use that roll-up lap. It'll be a reset switch back on again and be ready to go. Now, these drivers are wired to race control as well. They'll have race control telling them, giving them the, the details they need to know. Righto, we think we're going to have a 10-minute delay here. Switch the engines off. In the other ear, they've got a, a team member saying to them, right, now, go through all those things you just mentioned. Let's just bring it back. But once we get moving, remember, you've got to get the tyre temperature back up. You've got to get things yep. going. So you've got input from, from various other avenues as well, haven't you? Yeah, for sure. They've got, as you say, they've got the, uh, the, the race control, which is one way they can't talk back to race control, which uh, I think that would be at race, col yes, race control. So you can't request. go, Michael, Michael. Yes, exactly. Uh, dear Mr. Clark of the course, or Ms. Clark of the course, uh, you know, I don't agree with what's going on out there. None of that. Um, it's one way from race control to the driver. It's two way to the uh, to the teams. So they can be talking to the team. The team will be helping them to um, stay focused on what they need. Get the and you know, every now and then you'll have your Kimi Raikkonen out there going, yeah, yeah, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. Right? It's um, <laughs> oh, it's probably the guy that we're looking at on camera there, Richard Davison, a vast career. Well, he probably doesn't need too many people exactly. telling him how what to manage you, it. What do you reckon? Luke Ellery's telling him on the radio yeah, that he doesn't already know, right? If you're Luke Ellery, you'd just, you know, you'd, you'd give the uh, give the, the the headset to uh, one of the one of the kids down there that's spectating and letting him have a chat on the way around. Go and make yourself a coffee. There's. Yeah, there, yeah. There's nothing, so, that, nothing that he doesn't know about motorsport. Certainly is. Again, one of uh, your alumni in the uh, Grassroots Racing podcast is uh, Richard Davison there as well. So here we go again. Here's this shot. And what is interesting is that when we first stopped here, Bailey's head was sort of looking around. He was looking for the crew on the wall. He was looking at the flag. He's obviously relaxed back down into it now, taking in the scenery, uh, looking down the uh, straight there. And it's only about 18 kilometres away. You're on the bay. He's probably thinking about having a nice dip and a swim. And... That sort of thing as well? Probably not. He's probably not. He's probably not looking for any further than the dashboard in front of him and the lights at the start of the, the race. The drivers have a, a time during the, you know, before their race where they can walk up to the wall, check out where their grid spot is. And I guess that's one great bit of advice that has been dealt out to any young competitor is to try and identify where your grid box is for your next race because you often will be coming down. There won't be officials to assist you and you've got to find that box and you've got to be in legally positioned inside that box, not over the line. And talking about Richard Davison, he's got his car absolutely positioned in that box beautifully. Yep, and uh, yeah, Jared Hurst is taking an interesting wide line approach to gridding himself up in his grid box, but, but he's behind the line, so we're going to call that all OK. Mark Zellner in the 36, he's got massive experience as well. He's in the grid box beautifully there as well. The Ken engine cars seem to like the red colours, don't they? There's uh, <laughs> four of them out there and there's one that's came in the lane. I think, uh, I think we saw um, Phil Marinon return to pit lane. Yeah, and that, that's what we were saying. So when we uh, spoke about the fact that within the Formula Ford race, you've got your traditional or, or heritage Formula Fords here known as uh, Formula Ford 1600, which are powered by the Kent engine that has powered this class since its inception back in 19... 
67, I think, at Brands Hatch. 69 at this very circuit was the first time this category appeared in Australia. So these are your Formula Ford 1600s. And at the front, you've got the more modern Formula Ford, or they're sometimes referred to as Duratec because it's a Duratec motor that came from the Ford Fiesta out of 2006. Modern, all aluminium, twin overhead cam, fuel injected car. So uh, a, a faster, faster car, not just you know, you've got the young gun drivers, uh, it will take driver out of the equation, the, the front running, uh, the Duratec cars are simply faster, but these Formula Ford 1600s and some of them still, I mean, they're still an incredibly engaging car to drive. So for anyone out there sitting there watching these, go and find yourself a Formula Ford 1600 and go and have some fun racing with a group of enthusiasts that you see back there on the grid. We've the got... number five RF86 there, Paul. Uh, it's no secret that's probably one of my favourite racing cars. As I, when I was of the age to do this sort of thing, I just desperately wanted one of them. Craig Lowndes had one in the same sort of era. Stephen Richards also had one. They all did and uh, still never have uh, race one. So uh, if John Blanchard's watching, you still owe me a drive of an RF86. John, he's probably not watching. But, and potentially uh, a chassis modification, <laughs> if I may say. Um, <laughs> no more than what John would have done, apparently, but that's all right. <laughs> Green so the, flag waves as we head off on the uh, warm-up lap again. On, so, so they this... will have a bit of time uh, docked off the running of this race. At the moment, it's saying seven minutes, 17. I'm not sure that that's entirely generous at the moment, but... Let's have a look at the uh, at the grid and how they will line up for this, the feature race of the weekend. That's why I'm sort of expecting a little bit of a reset on that time remaining, which is on our uh, on our timesheet. On pole position on the number 69, Cody Maines, a ruddy in the PCR Australia Spectrum. Eddie Bezzi right alongside, also in the Synergy Motorsport, also in a Spectrum. The Miguel of William Locarno there for Fork Logic out of position number three. Bailey Collins in the number 96 rolls out there as well. Got us on board with the public uh, camp. Jack Bussey to Lockie Strickland, then it's Daniel Frugas. The Miguel is JL8. Fraser E in the Spectrum 01. All one of the newer of the uh, Spectrum chassis. Image of Bradburn, then we go to Jamie Rowe. Back to Logan Everly. 07 Motorsport Van Demon Slel Stelt, Carly Fleming in the 42 for Kinetic Motorsport for the Miguel. We go back to position number 13, Jack Wynack, who will have taken up his position in the number 30 after that uh, late start. Ethan Fitzgerald in the work zone racing. Miguel, Zach Lobko will be looking for uh, something from Zach coming from right down there in the 15th position. And we go through to the, uh, the Ken Engine cars. And Richard Davison off pole position. Yeah. Yeah, your Curie Australia there as well. The Cool Drive Auto Parts for Jared Hurst, Andrew Torti in the 06 Spectrum, Mark Zellner in the Miguel SJ 108 took third in this championship last year, and a guy taking third, you couldn't have been happier at the presentation, and it was great to see the smile. Tall bloke, loved it. James Hagen, Phil Maranon, which I think has returned to the pit lane. I haven't had that confirmed yet. And the 52, Malcolm Campbell, the Swift SC and 95K, which was quite the piece of kit to have going back about 25 years ago in the Australian Formula Ford Championship. And, and talking the... about the heritage Formula Ford 1600s, as is the case with so many of them, uh, Malcolm Coleman's car beautifully restored and presented. So it's, it's absolutely, I mean, all these cars are presented so well. If you are out here watching live, do yourself a favour, get down and have a look at them in the garages. They are magnificent looking cars. And engineering wise, they are state of the art racing cars so very good to have a look at and we have car number 43 um, here he comes making yep. his way through the position and, and we will Slam see Lugano. what the officials think of that there may be a maybe a black flag for doing that yeah he would have been told to i imagine he should have had to start from pit lane rather than do that we'll see what the officials have to say okay it looks like we are going to have a race start we are set to go the field is uh, all but position just waiting for those Ken Engine cars. We're watching for the red light. Five seconds off to the right of your screen Rev. being held up. The revs rise. Rev limit is found. Long shot, red light on. Watch, but and don't stare, and away we go. A great jump off the both cars off the start, but Main's ruddy getting the second phase of that start beautifully to hold on to the lead. Long run down into turn one here. Plenty of slipstreaming on the drag race into turn one. Jack Bussey, a good start, but nowhere to go. Liam Lucano holds on nicely there to P3 in the number 43 
as well and tucks in right behind him which is Bailey Collins in that mix as well so that's the one with the camera there it is right there the ice car number 96 smack bang in the middle of the field there at 147 they all bunch up all this pretty much going through this part of the track and single file that day. yeah look it is a single file part the other thing is it is a critical corner leading you onto this long uphill straight here's the onboard so you're seeing 220 plus kilometers an hour here as i spoke about earlier and then watch the commitment over the top little lift dab of the brakes and this car watch the hands on the steering wheel the thing is dancing around at 200 plus k's an hour i just love watching the skill of these guys i tell you what i uh, that on board has got a smile on my face and i'm i'm sort of feeling very jealous here at the moment and we've got a safety, safety car. car safety car So, yeah, we've got a car stopped on the main grid there. We didn't see that car not get away. No. So, um, we've got the... Well, to uh, be fair, I think that's a uh, one of the course cars that's parked out there, uh, Darren. It's got I a don't, tow, tow I line don't up the back think that the four-wheel drive gridded up. <laughs> I see what you're getting at, but there is a car on the tow line. Oh, gotcha. Right. Like uh, my bad. I, I missed that. Sorry. Well Come spotted. on. Come well on, Paul. Be more observant than that. Come there on. You are. You've been doing this, this, this shot, this shot, mate, I tell you what, that coming across the top of the hill... Wow, so cool. Yeah, in incredible. It did sort of, uh, any time you get a chance to go, oh, look at that, quite right there is that car being towed. My apologies <laughs> to you, Darren. But uh, look, uh, I just, any opportunity, uh, you were very... Yep, we have, uh, as we thought might be the case, car 43 has been given a drive-through penalty by virtue of being out of position and taking that position up. Can't be served until we go racing again, so, but uh, he will have to serve that drive-through penalty at that point. Uh, but you were very, very generous in what you said um, about me earlier. I thank you for that. Uh, it's been my privilege to be involved in motorsport. I never thought it was something I'd be able to do, just pinch myself to do it. As a competitor, very, very aware of, uh, I think modest talent would be um, generous at that. But any time you get an opportunity to sit in the racing car, it is just um, such a thrill. And look at those onboard shots. As much as I love being here in the commentary booth with you, uh, it would be so cool to be out there. Maybe not right now driving around behind the safety car, but when they're, when they're at full noise, it is just a buzz. Paul, sadly, my stat is that I've been a commentator for twice as long as I was a competitor for, and that's over 24 years ago, but I still look at those onboard shots, and it doesn't even have to be onboard. I can be standing next to a car that's on jacks in the garage going, gee, I wish I was born on the helmet and the onesie and uh, heading out on track. But, boy, when when the, the crew set up a, an onboard shot like that and we can go across the top of Dandenong Road, that that guardrail that we can just see right in front of where the uh, safety car board and flags are being waved there. That is at that point is the only stage you can see the corner. Up until that, yeah. you're just running along walls either side of you. And then all of a sudden the corner's there and at 220 kilometres an hour, you cover that last 25 metres very rapidly and you're into, into the corner. And in Formula Ford racing, you've got Left, right, front, rear, everyone gathered up all around you. Looks like we're set for a Looks restart like here. Set. That's been a quick recovery. Well done to the recovery crew. Great job to the Victorian flag marshalling team. As always, they are out there delivering high-quality flagging. And they realise it, the competitors realise it, that they are the eyes and ears. You are absolutely focused on the road in front of you. When you see a blue flag or a yellow flag or a yellow and red flag come out, you pay attention. They are genuinely serious about giving you the message to stay safe. Peeling off now goes uh, Locarno to serve that drive-through penalty. And, uh, well, we haven't had the green flag. Yes, it is. There it is. And we are under control. Cody Mains ruddy controls it beautifully, gets himself the best part of a yeah, car length away and in four of four terms a car length is eternity watch them start jostling for positions pulling out from the draft we're going to go side by side up into turn one the 74 of bussy will have had a good toe for the first couple of hundred meters out of there not enough to go through wheel contact wheel to wheel contact there with those two protagonists coming down into turn three yeah both lucky to get away with that wheel to wheel in an open wheeler is never a good thing it'll be interesting to see if that's been the steering on Imogen's car which will Critical long uphill straight. The draft in Formula Ford 
uh, because they are a relatively low horsepower. So the draft is like hitting the nitrous button. And here you see uh, Jack Bussey showing that to full effect. Beautiful passing move, classic Formula Ford passing move. Drafting by and Cody Mains ruddy knowing that there's, you know, he made him go the long way around, but there, there's nothing he can do about that. It's a 220 uh, kilometre an hour game of chess. There's two laps to go. These guys a very, very front. fast game of chess with only three laps competitive, isn't it? Indeed. And so here we have those onboard shots again. Watch the aerodynamic draft come into play here as Bailey sits in, you'd say, box seat here. He is uh, a four-car train, and you'll just see him drag up on the back of this train as he pulls out. And there you see Jack will have to... Oh, it's going to be tight. It's going to be who's going to be the last of the late breakers. And Cody goes through. And there you see it again. You want to position yourself just right. And look how much closer Bailey has gotten on that. And meanwhile, behind him, uh, he's dragging car five into play as well. This is Formula Ford racing at Sandown at its finest. So at the moment, it's Bussy, Domains, Ruddy, Bezik and Collins with the onboard. Frugus, Lachlan, Strickland, Will Lowing. Great to see the 53 back inside the 10 after coming together at uh, the entry to turn four yesterday. So let's get Will, the New South Wales guy, right back up there. Troubled run yesterday and uh, unfortunately got mixed up with someone else's melee out there. But Will fighting back hard now in the 53 and doing a tremendous job. Remember that name? He's been doing a pretty good job over the last couple of years. But Bussy leading the field now. And I think they're going to get the last lap board this time around. Will be the last lap board coming into play, I should imagine. Can we see that down on the... No, no, no we're going to go again. We're going to get another couple of laps. So this is great news. Well, it's great news for the category, great news for us as the commentators and spectators. If you're the driver in the lead, um, you know, I think Jack Bussey would have been very happy to see a chequered flag. I think, right been, I think you're right there because now we're starting to get this, uh, that last lap of the race type of feeling here, but oh, there really is two Bezik more to go. Bezik has got himself inside. A nice move by Bezik to take away second place. So Jack's been shuffled back a couple there once again. Uh, that slipstream comes into play. Now let's see what uh, Jack can do from here. And for Cody Mains ready, that's great news because it means that his teammate Eddie Bezik now has his mirrors full. And here comes uh, Bailey up the back straight again. Eddie is making Jack go the long way around if he wants this pass. How good and is this shot? You can see the decision making. Nowhere the to go from front. the outside, and that has just brought Bailey right into play. Here's the here's the replay of that passing move. Nicely done there. Just threw it in a little bit wide, carried that momentum, and just got the pass done, which was great work. Good work there by Eddie Bezik as well. Put it off the back of the ripple strip there, gathered it all up, and he's now sitting in P2 on the road. You'd have to suggest he's uh, ready to be pounced on as well. Still no last lap board gone out that time as well, so I'm going to take my eye off the last lap board and let's just see yes. how many more laps we get at the Watch moment. Watch the racing. And then you see uh, Jack returning serve with that slipstream down the main straight to take second place back. <coughs> Two to go, we've had confirmed. Have we really? Uh, <laughs> we really have. So 31 goes through there again. Eddie Bezik doing well. And Paul, I'll put this to you, but out of some of these front runners, Eddie Bezik and Bailey Paul, obviously the most experienced at this level of sport racing. Yeah, you would say so. So uh, about maybe a year or so in it, all young guns, so very early in their racing careers. But, but certainly uh, Eddie and Bailey, I uh, think uh, third season, for them um, and look at that jack around the outside getting the job done a better run he'll have uh, he'll have thought about what he did the lap before that didn't quite get him off that last corner as well and See, they don't want the ripple strips over there you probably want to gather it all up not too sure who that was it was the white and blue car well they're an aggressive ripple strip here so you've either got to <laughs> well you've either got to commit or stay off them it, it's if you if you're trying to be a little bit um if you just try and run up on the ripple strip, it'll do nothing but upset the car. But if you get your wheel right across it, there is the last lap board. So <laughs> this is now, uh, what do you do from here? And where I think Cody, you would say, has a, a less smart move, Brady Bezik. Had the potential to make the pass there and has tucked back in and gone, you know what? 
think I'd rather pass you over the back straight rather than giving you a chance to do that to me. So I reckon he's setting it up for 31 to get out of turn four here, yep. the best, and get a nice run on the That's exactly what he was thinking. Cody Mains, Ruddy, I think, has uh, built himself a race-winning lead, you would say. Never want to put the, the curse of the black jelly bean on him, but I think that's a, that's a race-winning lead that he has got. The, the question now is, can Jack hang on to second, or has Eddie made the master stroke by tucking back in at the end of the front straight? Oh, great work. Looks like he has held on to that position. So really good drive by Jack. He's obviously focused, made no mistakes at turn four. Something inside my head then was just going, go Bailey, go Bailey, go Bailey. Just watching on from behind there to try and close that gap up here. What a tremendous race. This yes. has been once we got it underway. And there is the chequered flag, and it will be Cody Mains Ruddy that takes victory number two for this season to add to victory number one late yesterday. And we will watch and see the Formula Ford 1600s come around shortly. And let's see who can take a line on us there with Richard Davison starting from pole by virtue of his race win yesterday, progressive grid that we run here. And we see some of those beautifully presented Formula Ford 1600 cars coming around to take the chequered flag. And we have indeed Richard Davison, well done to him, takes the win in Formula Ford 1600. And it looks like we have... Who is Andrew, Torty. Andrew Torty, it looks like, has taken second place. Well done, Gavin Dumas and Mark Zellner. Uh, in third and fourth in the Formula Ford 1600s. Shortened race, interrupted, false start, everything thrown at the drivers. They have coped with that admirably and put on a, just a masterclass in Formula Ford racing. Ultimately, seven laps the journey. It could have been a lot shorter than that. So uh, thanks for the generosity to race control to allow the race to go that sort of time because we've got saloon car drivers, you'd have to suggest cooking themselves in the marshalling area down there at the moment so the car's continuing around at a decent old pace to clear the track. Paul, what a, uh, a really cool way to start Formula Ford for the season here at the Triple Eight Home Loan Victorian Championship. Co Cody Mains Ruddy takes two from two so far. Jack Bussey to Eddie Bezik, Daniel Frugus and Bailey Collins had my corner and I was right behind him in the 96 there cheering him onto the uh, to up the top of the straight there. Lockie Strickland to Will Lowing who came home in seventh place. That's a, a good run there. He started out at 16th, so big improvements there. Jamie Roder, Lachlan Ebenet, Imogen Radburn home in the number 29th in 10th. Ethan Fitzgerald in the 56th home 11th. Carly Fleming 12th. Liam Meccano, who started in the front group, ultimately home in 13th. Zach Lobko in 14th and some work to do. Richard Davison taking the chocolates in car number 40 in the Formula Ford 1600. Andrew Torty to Gavin Dumas. Mark Zellner, great to see the 36 home there. Fourth place in uh, that one. Jared Hurst to Adrian Wilkinson there as well. James Hagen, Mel Coleman, Phil Marinon ultimately got to the line. Logan Everly, Fraser He and Jack Monuck. Not, yeah, Fraser uh, High and Jack, um, yeah, no non-finishes. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Again, uh, the High is another family outfit going about it. Love the way they go about their motorsport. So that's very unfortunate for Fraser, who's been uh, making some great inroads in his testing and ahead of this season. Always a pleasure, Darren. I will be back uh, to see you to call race two at 10 past four this afternoon. That'll be race three, Paul, but thank you very much for coming along. Yeah. And might I say, during the delay there, thank you so much for offering your thoughts, as I called it, the human condition. And let me tell you, that's the human condition more often than not that plays into this sort of thing, isn't it? it totally. As I say, the, it, the, all of the leading drivers these days work on that sports psychology. Thank you very much, Paul. We've got saloon cars getting ready to go. We'll be back in just a moment. You're at the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships.
Well, I tell you what, here at the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships being run this weekend by the MG Car Club and, of course, all those great uh, crews around the track that helped with the flaggies, with uh, the Victorian flag marshalling team, the Victorian Fire and Rescue Squad, the medical teams as well, and the pit and paddock people, race control, the secretary's office and everyone that helps keep this series going, doing a, a wonderful job. Talking about wonderful, the uh, end of the program for this morning, and albeit that it is now just about one o'clock, we have got the saloon cars for their first time on track today. And right alongside me to carry all the load through this one is Dan McCarthy. Welcome back, Dan. This is, uh, we're setting ourselves up for uh, a real ripping last race for the weekend, but let's get through race two first. Absolutely. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. We've got 20 minutes of action ahead of us before we get to that one. This, of course, the feature race, the slightly higher point scoring race. 30 points for the other two races. If you win it, 40 points for this one. So a little bit more on the line. And uh, we can see the grid now. South Australian Sean Jamison comes out of pole position alongside Terry Fritner, who drove really, really well yesterday. Made lots of positions up to finish in second ahead of the reigning Vic State saloon car champion Daniel Johnson. And Adam Lowndes is another strong performer in yesterday's race. He'll come out of position number four. Good field, I tell you what, there were 17, 18 cars there out on track, and uh, well, you could throw across about the first uh, four rows that could uh, get this one. Great to see the 56 of Kane back to Smith, the Victorian, in this uh, field here this weekend. We really did enjoy, without putting you know too much jam on it, we really did enjoy a great season with the saloon cars last year. So much entertainment, so much, I want to say, forceful racing. But fair. Yes, but clean, yes. forceful racing. Yes. I, I think we're going to see more this year, but um, certainly when the National Series came here in August, it was uh, a great display of uh, saloon car racing. They did, for many years ago, have a National Series, and I guess this has been replaced by the Victorian Series now, and it is just absolutely immense and really, really cool to see this guy a little bit of a change livery, the Johnson family racing car number one Falcon after numerous years of trying and working very, very hard, not just on his own racing, but on the category as a whole to see Daniel Johnson put the number one sticker on the side of his car. Yeah, really, really good to see. Uh, so, uh, so popular and uh, has done so much work for uh, saloon cars as well, of course, as uh, Nash Harris. And even Kevin Stutman, as you said, uh, he's bought a lot of cars recently, uh, sold them just to try and boost the numbers in the category. And boy, has that happened. There's a vacant grid slot alongside Kane Baxter Smith. Just trying to work out who that is. I think that's James Jeske. Oh no, Jeske's a row back, I think, from where he needs to be, so. So just a quick acknowledgement of uh, last year's championship. Daniel Johnson first, Adam Lowndes second, Kevin Stoopman third, Kieran Pridmore fourth, Jacob Prestopino in five, Blake Harris six, Travis Lindorf seven, Brad Vaughan eight, and Scott Dornan rounding out the top 10 in the championship last year. We are set five seconds, Dan, and we're away for the saloon cars for race number two. Holden and Ford on the front row, Ford on the right, Holden on the left. Who's going to win the drag race, the long drag race to turn number one? A brilliant launch away from the line from Pridmore, right in front of our commentary box window. But it looks like the second half of the start was better for Jamison, and they are very much side by side on the run down towards turn number one. It looks like Lowndes has got past uh, Johnson. Yes, he has into third position. Bit of a lockup for Pridmore. But he's managed to turn it in and it holds on to position number two. Brilliant start by Baxter Whoa. Smith, although he's all crossed up. Brilliant launch. He's made wow, his way left past front many right cars. up in the air there too, Dan. The Swift Solar car gave us a good look underneath the inside of the, uh, the car there. Gathers it all up on return to the game as well, as we mentioned just in the remarks before the start of this race. As this shot just tells the story, doesn't it? Everyone cleanly getting through. Turn four. I'm going to say by lap three, we'll have him up and over the ripple strip, and that shot's going to get pretty spectacular. I can see Lindorf from the back of the grid has already made up tons of places. Didn't take the start yesterday. Everything that could have gone wrong with the car did go wrong. Look at the list I've got here. Uh, blocked injectors, fuel pump, fuel line, injector rail. Anything that could go wrong did go wrong with the car yesterday, but he's back out on the track today. And I feel as though uh, Travis has got 
a really good championship hunt lined up this season. Uh, in good preparation pre-season and looking to uh, get right up the front and run right back in with these uh, these front this front crew and uh, see how he goes. Look at that. The guy from South Australia, Jags, right across to the left on the exit of 13 there. Sean Jamison leads Kieran Bridmore to Kane Baxter-Smith, who had a wheel right up in the air, ultimately up four spots in the uh, opening lap. Adam Lowndes also there in the mix, looking forward to seeing how the Pro Plum entry can play out this season. Another one that I feel as though is heading right in that right direction will play into this championship as the season rolls on. There's a guy there that's going to try and stop every one of those ones I just mentioned that are looking for a big run and he's got Lowndes in a hurry right behind him in the 19 and that's Daniel Johnson. Car looks brilliant as always. We could wax the oh, right out over the back of the river. Strip goes number one. If there's any doubt he's having a crack at it, there it is right there. Yeah, he's got past Lowndes on this lap and he's trying to break away from him early on in this one right out sideways but yeah it's uh Stutman, uh, sorry Jamison uh, last uh, last race yesterday was able to pull away from the field uh Pridmore's not allowing him to do that today that is for sure Pridmore right on the gearbox of the Zuma Falcon ahead of him and we've still got oh McSwain from about sixth position has gone off the road at very high speed that's uh, that's down the hill towards Dandenong Road has he hit anything? The car doesn't look too badly damaged. If he hasn't, oh, it's a bit of rear, work, rear body work damage. So I think he's hit the tire wall backwards. But he was running nicely. He was in just behind Johnson and ahead of the uh, recovering Travis Lindorf. But I think, to be honest, he's got away quite lightly there. Yeah, the Tate Lawyers entry car there, drive school entry, just drives off there. So not sure what happened, but it's not a part of track that you want to go off at. There, it is actually not a good part of Sandown that you can go off at, but at the top of the hill, heading down on the driver's left there, that's nasty. Gets your attention, getting the attention now of Kane Baxter-Smith. He's loving the, the backside of that ripple strip. Drives back over across in front of the 19, the Pro Plum car of Adam Lowndes. And just watching on there is the uh, the 61 of Travis Lindorf, the Casey Accident Repair Centre. And there goes the number 34, taking no further part, which is uh, McSwain. We've going lost, to the back of the paddock. We've lost Griffith as well. So that's two Falcons in the first lap that have fallen by the way. So we're three wide. Further behind, Lowndes on the right, Baxter Smith in the middle, and Lindorf might get them both and does in the 51 machine. And Baxter Smith just about holds off Lowndes as well. This is a brilliant recovery drive from Lindorf. And although Baxter Smith made a brilliant start, he is slowly dropping back in this race. All oh, Lowndes a little bit sideways, crossed up over the curbing. And uh, Tonio Dino's not too far behind either. He can pick up the pieces if mistakes are made from these guys ahead. So Jamison showing a clean set of heels at the moment. Fastest car on track, a 125.34 done on the previous lap to this on lap number two. The Bridgestones responding early there for him. Pridmore into two, then Daniel Johnson in the number one. Glistening sun off the black bonnet of Daniel's car as he comes up the straight. Turns into turn one. Here is the big charge of Travis Lindor. Started out of position 15. Dan now up into position number four and you get the feeling he's going to range up onto the back of Daniel Johnson in the le next lap and a half or so and start to weigh in on a podium result. Yes, uh, with the pace he's going so far, I would not rule that out at all. So flying along at this point in time, a 126.6. It is actually a PB from DJ on the last lap, 125.7. But Lindorf is yet to do a lap without traffic at this stage of the race. Let's look a little bit, a little bit further back. Rob Knight, uh, yesterday in race number one, had real issues uh, under brakes. It, he was slamming on the brakes and it was darting to the right. He says it was a very unpleasant experience. And he's uh, fighting with the uh, debutant, that's uh, Bill Harris in the number 20, the EA Falcon just behind. Great uh, scene of the Aussie built saloons over the years with the Falcons and Commodores in this category. And uh, the racing has been absolutely spectacular over the last few seasons here. There's a VN, the number 94, up the top of the hill. That is Keegan Gaunt in there as well. Currently uh, Keegan in 13th. 
They, Keegan, to be on the grid today is remarkable. Missed yesterday's race, gearbox and clutch went in qualifying, and overnight had to buy a gearbox, buy a clutch, get it on the car. The gearbox they bought was broken, so they had to go out and buy another one. This all happened this morning, and they've managed to get it in the car and out there on the racetrack. A remarkable effort from the Gaunt team. Oh, you've got to applaud them when they do that. You're at the racetrack for a reason. The race meeting's not over till 5.30 tonight, so try and weigh in on it as much as you possibly can. You've paid your entry. Work as hard as you can to get it all the way through to the end of the weekend. Here's the number 10 now. We're just looking at position number 9 and 10 on the road with Shembury and Bright there in the 45. And uh, that car looks fantastic in the connected livery. So the number 45 there of Kerry Bright on our screen. Can't miss it, can you? Name by name and nature out there. Very, very bright. The, uh, the connected livery. I was about to say the, uh, the same thing. Uh, actually, uh Shembury overtook him just a couple of laps to go, but now it seems that Bright's got the pace back a couple of tenths faster last time through. And a bad sportsmanship for up the flag for Shembury. So I assume that's for going wide at turn six and uh, sort of cutting the chicane. And uh, I'm hearing in my ear that is the reason. So just here, he keeps running it wide and shortcutting this corner. Hasn't done so on this occasion. So learnt his lesson. And uh, it's got to stick within the uh, track limits for the rest of this race or else it'll be slapped with a 15 second time penalty. So Shembury there getting that penalty out. Thanks to Dan for describing all of that. We get back to the front of this field. This is currently car three on the road, but car number one on the side to be celebrated. Last year's champion, a humble kind of a guy, but a very, very hard working guy. And you can tell by the results if you look through, he's never outside the top five and more often than not in the top three. But I tell you what, right behind in the 51 is wanting it more this weekend, or particularly in this race. Started off rear of the grid, has driven his way through. I'm going to say, Dan, maybe he's just giving it a little bit of a rest right now. He's probably used a lot of the Bridgestone up, weaving his way through the field. So just getting a bit of a measure on what Daniel's up to. I'm taking anything away from the fact that Daniel is fast. Like, his lap time, currently the fastest car in the race, is Lindorf. But uh, it's only sort of half a second faster than Daniel in front of him. Shembury has come through the lane. We're just talking about number 10 machine. He's come through the lane. And uh, Lindorf is uh, ignoring your advice because he just said his first is for the first lap of anybody uh, in the race last <laughs> time through. A 124.4. That's one and a half seconds faster than the race leader at the moment. He is absolutely flying out there. He's forcing DJ to push. You can see the yellow and black machine sliding out of the final corner. And these four are closing up on each other. The fourth fastest car is uh, the leader. And the fastest car is the one in fourth position. As we see the uh, lead battle in the older specification cars, Gray is just about holding on in his Falcon. Oh, a bit twitchy there. Bit of a moment, but keeps it under control. But he's holding off the number 33 behind. So it's uh, Ford and Holden's at the uh, front in uh, the newer spec cars outright. And then Ford versus Holden for first in the older spec cars as well. Four Excalibur screw bolts have been involved with this category for quite a long time. We applaud their uh, involvement with the saloon cars in the Victorian Championship here. So a big shout out to Excalibur screw bolts. Let's have a look at the leaderboard. It is Jamison. Not by so much of a lead as like he had yesterday, Dan. He absolutely streeted them yesterday. Kieran Pridmore is only 1.6 seconds behind. Then it's Daniel Johnson, 1.3 further behind that. to Travis Lindorf, uh, just under a second behind. Daniel and we were just watching that position close up as we're watching the uh, the 52 of Gray and Darren Krasitz go through there as well in the uh, in the 33 and just off the back there the number 94 of Keegan Gaunt started out of position number 16 up to 12th now so should be super proud of that effort well done a personal achievement to get any spots up the grid in fact uh, I'm going to go so far as to say the 220 entrants here that have entered this weekend should be all proud of themselves for yes. getting a race car to the track. It's a lot of hard work to field a race car in a driver-owner type of situation. And there's uh, 220 of them out there. And let's add up about 1,000 others that gather behind the families and friends that keep these races going. Welcome to the track. Welcome to the live stream as well. Uh, yeah, we get to enjoy these cars bouncing around the curbs now as we start to hone in on three and a half minutes left in this race. It's been a real uh, weekend just to keep the saloon cars out there. They've uh, they've all been uh, playing mischief first round of the season. Shembury had a tail shaft go. We've had 
gearboxes, we've had clutches, all sorts of uh, different failures on Friday and even Saturday morning. So to have this many cars still out there circulating is uh, quite remarkable and really great effort. Uh, the saloon car guys all helping each other out, getting hands on deck uh, where they can. It's a real community spirit down there in the saloon car paddock. The 51 now just looks to have had a little bit of impetus taken out of his charge here. For Travis Lindorf, the gain on Daniel Johnson has sort of eased up a little bit here. Kane Baxter Smith also uh, trying to press on here. We're just looking at Kieran Pridmore, P2 on the road. This is a great drive by Kieran. Anyone that can keep up with Sean Jamison in the Boomer Signs entry is doing a good job. And he has not been able to drive away with it at this point in time. So well done to Kieran Pridmore and, and DJ. Daniel Johnson in the car one. Still in the in right in their mirrors as well. Travis Lindorf going with them. I'm really looking forward to seeing how the season transpires. Big lock up for the race leader. He would have definitely run wide there. That shows he's under pressure from Pridmore. He's got the gap down now, Pridmore, to under one second. Eight tenths faster than the race leader last time through. He is there. He is right on his tail. This is awesome from uh, Pridmore, really uh, lifted his game in the off-season and taking the fight to Sean Jamison, who has dominated at Sandown here in recent years. So this is a really, really good performance. And DJ and Lindorf, not too far behind either. So yeah, really good to see these guys take it to our leader, Jamison. Lap traffic playing a factor. Rob Knight really well, staying out of the way. Very nicely done. And uh, Bill... Doing the same, bit of a lockup, but Bill Harris gets out of the way of both of the race leaders, doesn't hold either one of them up, and same through those DJ and Lindorf as well. Certainly don't make any friends holding up the leaders as they're coming through on you and that way, and uh, he's done a terrific job there, really good use of his Wait. mirrors. Oh, have a look at that, we've got a minute and a half remaining, and car two on the road, Kieran Bridmore is cracking it sideways. If you reckon he's thrown in the towel, we are a long, long way from a race finish. Yeah, it's about a minute and a half away, but he is absolutely driving the wheels off his Commodore. And all in the background there is car number one, car number 51, car 19 there of Lount. Baxter Smith wants to recover from uh, a pretty bad um, early, well, good early part of this race, but bad middle part. Oh, Gaunt has gone around at turn number two. So it looks like a, a harmless spin. Fingers crossed it's a harmless spin anyway. But that was the reason for the yellow flag. You may have seen the uh, HRT tribute liveried machine facing the uh, wrong direction. But there it is at the very back of the shot going back in the right direction. And we're just hearing this is the penultimate lap of the race. There'll be one more after this one. Looks like Jamison has slightly responded last time through, but it's still so tight between these two. They're matching each other at the moment. I like the Rego number on this car, old one. Is that the driver or the car? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get that question uh, answered between now and the last race of the day. Jamison's I'll tell you what, it might be an old one, either the driver or the car, but it's being used to uh, absolute great effort at the moment. Let's see if he can keep it straight this time. He does. Doesn't waste any time getting sideways out there. We're not at Avalon right now. It's not about the kings of wings and spinning it sideways. It's about point and shoot here at Sandown. Two long straights, get the traction down as we have the final lap for race number two for the weekend for the Excalibur Screwbolts Victorian Saloon Car Championship. And there is our race leader for Zuma Signs, car number 59, Sean Jamison. Lindorf has caught back on the tail of DJ Force, third position just behind these two. They are pretty much nose to tail, but Pridmore is throwing everything at it. He's, he seems quicker than Jamison, particularly at this first half of the lap using all the curb really keeping up oh did dj clip the wall there that was mighty close and it's allowed lindorf to get a great run up the back straight but now lindorf slowing a little bit not quite sure what's happened there i think he might have missed a gear had a great opportunity but couldn't quite capitalize on that occasion sympathetic he, gear miss yeah <laughs> i don't think so trav's a trav's a, a, a fierce competitor absolutely fierce yeah yeah sure oh, oh no the wheel Oh, this is the uh, the Gaunt car. Oh, I've dear, got oh, dear, a quote, Barry Sheen. Now, three wheels has my wagon. <laughs>
So and there it is, ends up a couple of hundred metres away. That's the car that they fixed the gearbox, yeah. they fixed the, uh, the well, new gearbox, new clutch, but unfortunately uh, you need four wheels on the wagon as the cars come to the line. Jamison had to fight for this one, but he withstood the pressure and takes his second race victory. or oh, red flag. So we're actually going to go back a lap. That's just because of the loose wheel, but uh, the wheel on the circuit. But we'll go back a lap, and that means... It's the same result anyway. Jamison wins race number two. I'm not Pridmore. sure. Did the race winner get to the line to the chequered flag before the red flag came out? No, no. No, uh, the red flag came out first. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're just being told there's a fire down at turn two, and I would suggest that's a hot break on a car that has only got three wheels left on it parked up down there. But, gee, what? When you're having a bad weekend, you're having a bad weekend, aren't you? There goes the, the wheel. It heads off, as I quoted, the great man Barry Sheen, and there's a fire out over here. So I wonder if that's oh, a yeah. bit of a brake disc or something that's um, sprayed out over there. Stranger things have happened in motorsport. There goes the flaggies waving their double wave yellows and a red flag, and the fire and rescue crew uh, dispatched down into turn number one. Plenty of services available trackside here in the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. Our flag marshalling team do such a brilliant job trackside and we're about to see the uh, Victorian Fire and Rescue Squad show us all of their skills there as well. Uh, because of all of that, we sort of haven't run through uh, the results. So yes, in the end it was Sean Jamison who took the uh, race win from I guess, Pribble. Dan, at this point in time, we can say line honours because uh, there was a red flag, yes. so we can't confirm that. So let's let's do it a bit of... Um, let's do a bit of City to Hobart and call it line <laughs> honours. Yes, <laughs> effectively, yes, we can do that. Uh, so, yeah, at the time of the red flag, Johnson was in third, Lindor fourth, and Adam Lowndes in fifth position. But, yeah, that, that will all be uh, official in a few minutes' time. So we can see the uh, the rise and the fall over the uh, back section of the circuit, and then you can see on the uh, the right hand side of the shot where the uh, the old circuit used to go, used uh, for world sports cars back in uh, the 80s. So it used to go uh, a hard left, and then used to go back down towards the horse racing circuit, then back round hard to the right, and then link back up down at the uh, Dandenong Road section of the course. Bit of sand down history. There are pl uh, plenty of history here at Sandown. Over 60 years, uh, we've had uh, Australian Grand Prix take place here and uh, all sorts. So great to, uh, to see a quick recovery and crews coming back to the lane. All the cars are pretty much back now, apart from the, uh, the three-wheeled machine of Gaunt. Dan McCarthy, thank you very much, mate. We have got all of the uh, the right people assembled in pit, uh, sorry, in pit lane in the commentary booth now. So we're about to go to live shots in the booth with Mark Bateman and Kay Hurler. He here, here we are, all assembled uh, here in the commentary booth. Mark, do the honours, mate, and draw the uh, draw the uh, the raffle out. What number was yours? Oh, always B sixteen, <laughs> and I always won. <laughs> I'm getting all sorts of advice through the headset now as to whose number it is. Ash O, orange A18, and we've got a phone number here, so Ash O or Ash Q will uh, we'll get a phone call in the not-too-distant future. The orange A18, a very big... I'll hand it to our TATS uh, officials here. <laughs> and uh, all very, very official as we get that done. Thank you very much, Kay. Thank you very much, Mark. And, of course, thanks to Matabo for doing such a, uh, so much. a tremendous job right throughout this season. Great raffles coming at every single round. So if you didn't get one this time... Bring your, you bring your $5 for one, uh, $10 for three, and the Dave Amor, six for 20. <laughs> Thank you very much to Matabo for all their great support as we go back down to turn one. Okay, here is the, what the results are, Dan. Wound back a lap. Yeah, so uh, Sean Jamison took the win by seven tenths in the end when we wind back one lap. DJ uh, held on to position number three ahead of Travis Lindorf. Adam Lowndes collecting good points again inside the top five ahead of Kane Baxter-Smith, who uh, fell to sixth by the end of the race. Tony Aldino, James Jeske, and then... Kerry Bright in the uh, magnificently presented Commodore in uh, ninth position there. So uh, lots to talk about in that one, and I'm sure they will uh, 
deliver once again later on this afternoon. We're going to take a quick break here. It's been a fantastic morning as part of round one of the Triple Eight Home Loans. Day number two of competition for the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. Porsches and 944s on track next. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. You start. Oh, sorry. Could be a Welcome back to Sandown Raceway in Melbourne. We've got a slight delay before the next feature race of the afternoon, which is the Porsche 944 Challenge Series Championships and the sports cars, which are combined this weekend, which is a bit of a different um, kettle of fish and some different classes, but uh, effectively two races in one. I'm joined by Emma Dean. My name is Jack Atley, and we have got a bit of a delay here due to the interruption. So we'll go through a, a bit of uh, a couple of stories regarding, in particular, the sports car category. And Emma, you know a lot about the sports cars, having been involved in that fraternity for quite some time, and yeah. um, you know the the key elements of that aspect. So. Um, you were mentioning before about how Andy Hall really wants to try and build this up. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, this category has had some success in the past, and I mm. think pre-COVID, I think we did, we did manage to have 20 Circa cars on track, which yep. is, you can imagine, if they're a mix of Porsches, McLarens and Audis, that would be... Stunning. Super fun. Um, mm. Like I said earlier in race two, it's... It's easier for the Porsches, so we have them dominant. They're, there's a lot around, you know, like leftover from Cup Challenge, leftover from Michelin Sprint. Like we've got these cars. Yeah. Got a lot of support in Australia for them, and a lot of support in Melbourne, and a lot of parts. Um, and there are a lot of cars floating around. But there's nowhere near as many cars out on track mm. as there are in people's garages. Mm. Um, and if they're in their garages, they've got someone owning them that knows how to race them. Absolutely. And might have the means. And this isn't as impenetrable as it may look or seem. All of the drivers out here have full-time jobs, wives, kids, etc. full lives. Yeah. And they still manage to do this. It's only five rounds a year. Yeah. Um, and I'd, like I said, I wish I could name names, but there are so many people out there <laughs> with great cars stored away that are not on track and they're kind of wasting away. Under, you want, under you want to see dust. those kind of cars in their natural environments, don't you? Absolutely. And that... That is the racetrack, and that's what, you know, uh, uh, high-end Porsche machinery is made for racetracks, and let alone the Audi R8 is a, is a fantastic car as well. And, of course, the Porsche 944 category is going from strength to strength, I've got to say, and we're just going to run through the grid quickly now, just before 
uh, this next race. And thankfully the marshals and the officials, who we thank again very much every time we come out. We can't go racing without marshals and officials and we love them and they do a great job. So they've cleared that uh, those cars off Brilliant. the track. Running through the starting grid here, yeah. there. We're starting with Andy Hall. He came up from last on the grid in the last race yeah, and charged down through the centre yep. um, and retained first uh, ahead of Daniel Reynolds. That was a great battle. The two of them are surely going to be at it again uh, in this race. Mm. Then we've got Steve Sluger in third. Andrew Smith in the 997 Cup car uh, in fourth. Andy Tudor in my little R8. It's not mine, but I love it. <laughs> um, Andy Tudor in the Audi R8 LMS. Yep. We've got Peter Lawrence in the M4 GT4. Robin Bailey in the 370Z. That's the Nissan. Sal Imbrogno, 16 years old, in the Toyota 86. And then we've got Miley Miller in ninth in the number 76 Toyota 86. Also making Miley's first race weekend, is it? Did you yeah, say well, this weekend? Not her first, but she's come out of karting. Come out of karting. Yeah, into Toyota 86s. She's had a couple of test days, a couple of runs at Winton, but this is her proper first. Yep. Uh, In Angus, comp. serious yeah. comp, absolutely. And she's and surrounded she's got by R8s and experienced 991s guys in review. and some fast <laughs> machinery. We certainly wish Miley all the very best. And absolutely. that leads on to the Porsche 944 category. And of course, we've got the two time champion, Jamie Westaway, who's won both races so far this weekend. He's leading the field. Mark Vadino really having a great strong weekend as well. He had a race win last year, so he's coming off the second position. Adam Brewer, we call him the Black Widow Spider. He's coming out of position three. And the four-time champion, Cameron Bella, in the number 55 Aquacar. Tony Andreski has moved up the field there as well um, in the number 127 on our grids, but I believe he's racing at 27. Michael Westaway's back down in 15th. We're missing a few of the guys, but um, by the looks of it, apart from that grid. Chris Lewis-Williams is also in there as well. And you've got uh, Richard Howe, Michael West. Here we go. Richard Howe, King Richard, as we call Richard Howe, the veteran of the game. Been around a long time, certainly very experienced campaigner. Jared Campione, who is relatively new to the category and uh, really performing well. He's in the pink and white car there, so he's learning his trade and he's doing a great job. And great to see Jared out and about. Joey Keller, very exciting. If you haven't seen Joey Keller drive a Porsche 944, that's one to watch out for. He's had a, an incident there this morning with El Presidente, Mark Torbitz, who's driving the Tim Wolf Pipecraft car, the car which is usually campaigned by a West Australian driver, Tim Wolf, who's moved up to the Porsche Michelin Challenge. Jimmy Mitchell there in the number 46 Martini livery car, so he'll be one to watch out coming through the field. Lyndon Watson may or may not be with us because he had a pretty nasty incident with the wall down at Turn 4 uh, this morning, so he gave that a real solid whack. I don't believe he'll make it out there. And uh, you've got a couple of newcomers in Andrew Goldman, which is fantastic to see Andrew joining the series from Tasmania. So it's um, competitors from all around Australia. And Sam Roth makes up the field as well. Sam had, has had some technical issues with the car, with overheating this morning. But um, great to see Sam back on the grid. He was with us a few years ago and he's back in the field. So looking sensational. So it's interesting to see here, looking at that starting lineup. You can see the heat coming off the track. UV temp is super high. I think yeah. we're, what, at 24, 25 degrees at the moment. So um, in car, there is no air con. Surprise, surprise. No, and not made for comfort. <laughs> no. uh, and very little air ventilation. So you absolutely. could probably double those numbers uh, by now already. And once they start working and their brains start ticking over, you could almost triple those numbers too. It's absolutely. quite hot in car with those wool balaclavas and the FIA wool socks on. Absolutely, very hot indeed. Split grid, so there will be a 10 second difference between the starts of both grids. There's effectively two grids going on here. So the cup cars and the sports cars will head off first and then the 944 category will head off 10 seconds after that. So that's why there may be a slight gap. So all set to go now for race three. Just waiting in the starters' hands. Revs are rising. Looks like we're all lined up, all set to go. Waiting for the lights to click on there. Everyone's relatively patient and just settling the nerves. Here we go, we've got the five second board out. Revs rise, race three, round one, 2024 season. Who's gonna get away first? Your money's gotta be on in. There we Paul go. Paul Reynolds get off the line. There we go, they're away, they're in race three. So as they stream down this long, long straight here at Sandown, everyone's trying to vie for that slipstream position. And check out the, the brown gate. That's where their brake marker is for these 991s. Absolutely. To the left of screen. Well Oof. done. Andy Hall looks like he's grabbed the nice position. Clean. 
Reynolds has slotted into second there again. Pretty much business as usual from this morning. Andy Hall, very <laughs> experienced campaigner, and he takes the field lead into round into uh, turn three and four as they uh, head now up the back straight. Should see the 944 category just kicking off around about now. There we go, there we Jamie go. Westaway in the yellow and black car. Again leads the field through turn one. Mark Vedino in the sideline car slots in behind him. And the reigning champion, Oof. Chris Lewis Williams, hard under brakes there. Coming under pressure from number three, Adam Brewer. And Cam Baller in the aqua car really wants to get the position early and does snatch that out of position, uh, out of circuit number four. Yeah, elbows out. A little bit gently, but elbows out all the same. Absolutely, yeah. They're still trying to get the temps up to uh, the tyres, up to temperature, I'd imagine, on lap one. But already you can see just how fast these cup cars are around this stunning Sandown racetrack. They're already hinder, uh, heading into the final corner on the track, which is It is worth 12. noting, Jack, these guys are all owner drivers. So the racing is very clean. It's in their interest not to have the elbows out too much. Oh, and we've got Andrew Smith. Steve Sluger, neck and neck. Absolutely. 997 Andrew Smith and Steve in the 991. And you've got Andy Tudor up the back flashing the lights. Absolutely. Andy <laughs> Tudor in that stunning Audi R8, which is now heading up towards Sluger. And oh, uh, you can go. see there that that Audi R8 is really menacing. He's come over from Western Australia, Andy Tudor. And as we mentioned earlier, has come out of the Porsche 944 category. So he's moved up to a... Uh, a higher spec there, Audi just going through the shot there, so fantastic to see that he had a bit Audi of in that Audi R8 LMS, he hasn't been in it for 14 months before this weekend. Exactly, done a lot of racing over in Western Australia at Barbagalla. Mark Vadino now, hard under the brakes, just nabs the position there ahead of Chris Lewis Williams. You can just see how close this racing is in the 944 category. It's like this every time we go out and hit the racetrack, really, but um, um, it is very such close racing in the 94 category. You can't afford to make uh, the slightest mistake because in a one mate category like the 944 category you're really going to lose time and already you can see that a car 46 there has um, got a drive through penalty for a start infringement that's going back to the field that looks to me like um, we're not sure if he's either jumped the start there or rolled at the start Jimmy Mitchell in the um, in the night in the Porsche 944 category number 46 category so it's a shame for Jimmy to get that infringement earlier. How close is the racing as they head down the bottom of Dandenong Road? That is hard on the brakes and they're literally nose to tail, nose to bumper as they go through that corner. Vadino leads from Lewis Williams, the Baron of Benalla, as we call Chris Lewis Williams, ahead of Cameron Bella. It's a lot of B's and a lot of Allas in that <laughs> sentence there. I'm for you, Jack. Uh, and, and the uh, Black Widow Spider, of course, Adam Brewer, now number three, just slotting in behind him. They're really trying to take advantage of this slipstream. And there's a guy we've got to watch out for in the background as well, Joey Kallick, who's come up the field as well. Well, look, our guys are taking it seriously because lap two already and they're pulling the 113. So this is the not mucking around crew. Andrew Smith in that 997 is absolutely beautiful lines. Got great defending from this morning. He's going to try and keep Steve off as long as he can. Yeah, absolutely. And they want to get the drive out of that corner, out of the bottom of Dandenong Road, as we call it, down the bottom of that corner. You can see... The Audi R8 menacing Ooh, there in the lock background. Up there from Steve. Big lock up there from Sluger as he's uh, trying to really push home the advantage coming out of this final corner. They know they want to take advantage of the slipstream down this long straight. And you watch this, Jack. They left that Audi for dead because they got a little bit more torque than the Audi, but under brakes, Andy Tudor should be creeping up on them super fast. You would hope so, and you would think as well, there's two different tyre manufacturers with these classes of cars as well which we should probably mention as well. You've got the Pirellis on the Andy Tudor RDR8, and you've got the Michelins, of course, on the Porsches, which are synonymous with that brand. And um, that will have an effect. They'll, they'll it can be hard to get temps into the Michelins, but the Porsches are great at getting temps up. And Andy, guys like Andy Hall, they're great at getting heat into the tyres early on. Exactly. And we all know and love the Porsche brand, and uh, they're synonymous globally with um, making stunning race cars, really. And... Um, you know, these cars actually compared They're to meant the, to do this. They are just They're in just their to do it. natural environment, absolutely, aren't they? And when you look at the two cars or the two categories effectively on track, it's not just Porsches. We've got Audi R8s and some Toyota R86 well, there. Joey Kallock has unfortunately pulled over, I would say, by the looks of that. It didn't look like he's gone way off that wide. He was out in the car park there, Joey, so I'm not sure what's happened there. It looks like he may have gone off onto the grass we're hearing from Stevie and uh, so that's the word we've got there so he may have had a slide he's had, unfortunately had an incident this morning as well 
So it's been a pretty torrid weekend for Joey Cullock, and he had a uh, pretty good season last year. He got Rookie of the Year last year, so that's a bit of a shame to get that campaign off to a somewhat disappointing start for Joey Cullock in the 1800 Lasagna Cup. Miley Miller left at bottom screen, coming yep. through on that Toyota 86, doing well to hold her own. Absolutely, she's in some uh, really experienced company there, and it's got to be quite intimidating, quite daunting when you see the likes of Cameron Bella and Chris Lewis Williams, who are multiple Porsche champions, coming at you in your rear wheel screen. If you're a 15, 16 year old, <laughs> 15 year old Emma was not doing that, Jack. <laughs> 15 year old, no, exactly. You were saying how confident she was. You small. have to be. Absolutely. These guys, I went and chatted to Sal and to Miley, and I asked, Where do you want to be? And they said, In the 26s, and I said, And after that, they wanted to win. Yeah. Uh, they're out on track with 991s and an R8 and these 944s and they're still saying they want to win. It's great. Nice to see Miley with the confidence already building up. That's what you've got to go into. Unfortunately, by the looks of it, Steve Sluger may be dropping down the timing charts. I'm not sure if it's a glitch on our Natsoft system, but um, Sluger may have had a incident there. We'll keep an eye on that one. Mm. Um, at the moment, Andy Hall still leading that field and heading back towards the 944 category. Just coming up against the Toyota 86 there, the black car, which we understand and Emma was speaking about earlier, is going to head into the Toyota 86 scholarship season this Hopefully, year. Hopefully, fingers Whoa. crossed. Whoa, that was a bit of a contact. Oh. Absolutely, very close. A study. Now, someone's lost some body work there. That is, well, wow, is that one of the cup cars that has lost? I thought it was a 4-4, four -four, there's a bit of debris on the track there. There's certainly some debris. No, that looks like Vadino. It is Mark Vadino pulling off. That is a real shame for Mark Vadino. He had a race win last year and he's come up with two second places already this weekend. So that's going to be a big DNF for Mark. And in this category, it's pretty hard to come back after a DNF for the points system. So that is a real shame for Mark Vadino. And what it has done as well is it's opened the door for the likes of Cameron Bella and the, the veterans and the seasoned campaigners of Chris Lewis-Williams and Adam Brewer to bank the points and, and it can bite this place sand down there is walls around you've got to be careful well, it's very biting you've got track. To, <laughs> very biting it is biting you've got to, you've got to, you've got to give it respect uh, and for all of those not in the know the blue flags that are waving are just to let drivers know to let the faster cars through that are coming up behind exactly and with different classes of cars that's not unusual in not any forms all. of motorsport in fact we were just looking at a formula ford race before and you've got two clear classes and engines before Let's have a quick look. Wow. Let's have a look at a replay here on screen. Joey Cullock, by the looks of that, has had a serious incident against the wall. Well, I would imagine coming out of turn 12. This is, could be the incident here. That's Adam Brewer just getting close to the wall there as well. But um, it looks like Joey Cullock has clipped the wall. I would suggest either coming out of turn 12 uh, because 13 is effectively a straight kink and it's pretty flat to the boards in all these cars. So. It's not really a corner. We call it corner 13, but it's um, corner 12 is effectively your last one. But uh, yes. that is a real serious incident for Joey Kellogg, who has taken off the whole front right of that car. So that's a shame. And uh, you never like to see that. Jared Campione is unfortunately falling down the timing sheets as well. We're looking at Steve Sluger on track now with no one around him. So I'm not sure if he came to grief or... Absolutely. May have certainly had an incident. We're trying to get some word on that at the moment. Um, so he's definitely... Looking OK at the moment, maybe a little bit off pace, but looking all right. OK, let's have a look at the top of the screen here now as they get... Now, there's Mark Verdina. He's just... Wow, oh. bang! He's got two wide coming out of turn four. You can get up on that ripple strip on the right and you are straight into the concrete wall there. So that's a real heavy incident for Mark Verdino in the number 44 sideline car. And again, a real shame because... Actually done well to get it out the way. He has. Mark was um, having a great run so far. Coming off a race win last year and two second places, as we mentioned, but it's opened the door to multiple champions. In fact, if you have a look at this, Emma, you've got to the top three drivers there have, and I'm not making this up, 10 titles between them. Yes. In the 944 <laughs> category. So you've got two to ju just watching that nine, no, that's 86, getting close to the wall as well. Two titles to Jamie Westaway, four titles to Cambella, and four titles to Chris Lewis Williams, all running nose to tail, first, second and third. I've got to tell you, that wall on turn four is making me nervous today. Yeah, well, it can definitely get a bit slippery out on that ripple strip. I can absolutely ascertain to that fact. And you are very close to that wall, but they want to get the drive out of the corner all the way up this long back straight as well. Just with a few minutes to go, we want to send a quick shout out to LK Diesel as well. And um, thank you for their sponsorship. Very quickly, we've got a replay coming up on the screen. Here's Vadino, yeah, bang, Oof. ooh. 
A little bit. As we say in the game, that is suboptimal. <laughs> Ordinary. That is, that is. He won't want to see every angle of that. No, he will not, unfortunately. <laughs> He's had a real good conversation with the Pertec wall down at yeah. number four, and that's going to be pretty serious damage. This I would is suggest. racing. So that's a real shame. But just getting back to it, LK Diesel Service, we thank them very much for coming on board as a round sponsor. And uh, we love all our partners, and uh, great to see them adorned on all the cars. You can see Jamie Westaway again driving through that fast turn one with Cameron Baller in the aqua car, Chris Lewis Williams just sitting right behind, and Adam Brewer there, of course, as well, sitting just behind them as well as they head into turn four. But um, it's, it's worth mentioning that Andy Wall has opened a gap of 14.8 seconds between him and Daniel Reynolds, but Daniel Reynolds has pulled the fastest lap in Absolutely. Uh, lap four of 113. So he's on pace. Andy just got a good start. Andy, absolutely. A very experienced campaigner. One of the, the high-end, you'd suggest, Porsche race car drivers in Australia, Andy Hall. And he has cleared out very, very quickly. But, of course, Daniel Reynolds is no slouch as well. And Reynolds picked up the win yesterday in race one. So he's uh, a high performer as well. He, as you mentioned there, Emma's picked up a 113.6. So he's not hanging around either. Well, with the track temps in the UV, that's a, that's a decent time. Absolutely. And, of course, you've got... Uh, You've got Andrew Smith and Andy Tudor there really now getting into the flow with that out yard right, as yeah, well. Yeah, so he seems to be closing the gap little by little on Andrew Smith, which is great. Absolutely. Fantastic race up through the field at, uh, in the back of the field as well as we look at the Porsche 944 stream across the line. There goes Andy Tudor streaming and glistening in the sunshine as they head down this long front straight here at Sandown. Great to see Andrew Goldman there in the Porsche 944. He's coming under a little bit of pressure already from Andrew Hall, but... Um, Andrew Goldman is new to the Porsche 944 category. We welcome Andrew this year and wish him all the very, very best. He's mixing it against some of the top Porsche drivers in the country at the moment. So that's why he's getting the blue flag at the moment. But I'm sure he'll wander out of the way and have Andrew Hall pretty much, I wouldn't say sail past him. Two completely different cars, really. <laughs> I mean, you've got, you've, you've got a rear engine car on the, on the 911 Cup car. You've got a front engine car, so different weight distribution of different tyres, different aero packages, of course, I mean, well those cars. I mean, these 991s, I mean, the cup cars are made for it. This is what they do. They do it so well. Yeah. Every other mark in the world has tried to ma match them. They're just Absolutely. so well matched in this kind of race. They are effectively brilliant. unparalleled. Big, big leap over the grass there for Jamie Westway. He's come under real pressure as <laughs> they've come down the end of the long back straight there from Cambella. Cambella is absolutely pushing very, very hard. Look at the top four guys here, separated by less than half a second. So you've got Jamie Westway, who's taken out race wins in uh, round, round one and two. Cambella, who's had the podiums in the last couple of races, and Chris Lewis-Williams, the reigning champion. Ten titles between the top three guys over the past ten years. So uh, all three of these guys, and including Adam Brewer, who's now making up fourth, position there um, know how to win a race as well again look. you've got the BMW yeah, in a different class M4. of car Just this is Peter Lawrence's first race in that car um, fantastic efforts kept it on track all weekend no incidents very clean exactly and he's coming in fifth he's Can't doing ask for more and doing really well and again it's great to see the guys relatively behaving themselves I would say you've got different makes and different classes of cars different engines different everything so you've really got to be aware of all the other drivers all around you coming at you in front of you let alone driving your own race so there's a hell of a lot to think about and a lot going on but at the moment relatively clean I think a lot of people would look at owner drivers and the conservative well the semi-conservative driving that they're doing it's self-preservation I think a lot of people judge it as not racing or sub racing but it is very much racing. These guys have full-on jobs, lives, families, kids, as I mentioned before, and they're doing this, and they want it on track by the end of the weekend and for the next round. Absolutely, it's full-on racing. I can definitely ascertain to that. There's no doubt about it. You can see how hard the guys are pushing. Cam Bella heading out a little bit wide there out of uh, Dandenong Road corner because he's got Chris Lewis-Williams in the red, white, and blue tyre power car, number 37, having a lunge, loves this position to overtake and gets the spot over Cameron Bella who has been a little bit down on horsepower. I spoke to the king of uh, Bella Motorsport himself, Andy Bella, who runs that operation. He did tell me this morning the car's been a little bit down on horsepower, so he's a little bit worried about this high-end speed down those straights, and that's where Chris Lewis-Williams has taken advantage 
but he's no slouch as well. He's the current reigning champion. He's a four-time champion in that number 37 tyre power car. Look poised there for an aggressive move. Yeah, he's taking advantage. And I mean, these guys are very experienced campaigners and they know this track very well. So by the looks of that and looking at our timing screens there, and we're looking at probably last lap, I would suggest. And if you look at it there now, in fact, it's right across the line. No doubt about that one. Andrew Hall has had an emphatic victory in race three on day two of round one of the 2024 sports car championship great to see andrew back on track and winning pretty convincingly you'd have to say over daniel reynolds looks like andrew smith will take third cutting back through the field looking at the porsche 944 challenge series that is still raging at the moment as we head down the bottom of dan long road it's still jamie westaway who leads from Chris Lewis Williams, number 37 car, as we mentioned. Cam Bella there, now coming under pressure from Adam Brewer, who's really trying to have a dive with a couple of corners to go. But again, an emphatic victory, and it's three from three for the two time champion, Jamie Westaway, as he cruises towards the line, takes victory on day two of round one of the 2024 championships. Home just ahead of Chris Lewis Williams, fantastic race, and Cam Bella does pick up the final podium position ahead of Adam Brewer. What a great day of racing, Jack. Sensational. And exactly. not, bad for the, not bad for the combined categories. Absolutely. Just want to thank our sponsors for production, Sports Car Racing Victoria, Callis Kinney, Intellects Lawyers. Um, hopefully we'll have Sven Burkhart back on track when his knee's recovered. Uh, and Panther Racing Fuels getting us through the weekend. Love, fantastic, to, great to have our partners with us very much. We thank them. Uh, we can't go racing without them. So just running through the results there. Right, we got Andrew Hall coming in number one, followed by Daniel Reynolds. Great weekend for Daniel. Andrew Smith in the 997 Cup car. Andy Tudor out in the Audi R8 LMS. Peter Lawrence in the M4 GT4. Robin Bailey in his 370Z Nissan. Fantastic. Good to see Robin making it home there as well in that uh, Nissan car. Getting into the 944 category, Jamie Westaway, as we mentioned, taking out three from three this weekend, so a stunning round of racing for the Westaway family. Chris Lewis-Williams, home in seconds. Good to see his category, his campaign, I should say, off to a good start. Cam Baller, home in third. From the Black Widow Spider, Adam Brewer, who ran out the top four. El Presidente, Mark Torbett's came home there ahead of Salvatore. Yeah, we've got young 16-year-old Sal Imbrogno in, in 12th. Good luck for the uh, rest of your year, Sal. Exactly. And Miley Miller in 13th. That's brilliant for the, both of them. Fantastic. So congrats, guys. Well done. Home ahead of Richard Howe, King Richard, as we call him, Tony Andrewski, Michael Westaway, Andrew Goldman. Great to see Andrew joining the category and having a good run. Stephen Slugan, we had a couple of uh, DNFs, unfortunately. Um, during that race. Just a very quick run through for our partners in this category. Porsche Cars Australia, we thank them of course for all their stunning support. LK Diesel Service, brilliant to have those guys on board. Don Watson Transport, EJM Advice, Campione Electrics, Stratton Finance in Hobart, we welcome them this year. 1800 Lasagna, AVI Technology, Triple Eight Home Loans, of course, who are our key sponsor for Vic Rate, Victorian State Race Series. So great to have Triple Eight Home Loans going around again. And don't forget, Pit Lane Clothing. If you need some great off-track apparel, head to pitlaneclothing.com and check them out. They're one of our category partners as well. Emma, it's been an absolute pleasure working uh, with you this thanks, weekend, Jack. if I you may too. say, and it's been very insightful, and, I, <laughs> and uh, I've loved it. And so what a great start to the year. Chicks can talk cars too. They thanks certainly for having can. me, Darren and Jack. Thank Absolutely. you very much. We will now sign off. We'll head back to The Voice of Darren's. the Victorian State Race Championship. I haven't got any really good stories I could tell about Darren, unfortunately. I would love to tell a few, but I better not. I'll head back to uh, the man himself, Darren Smith, who will guide you home for the afternoon. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, Emma, for bringing on such a massive boost of enthusiasm to uh, the Porsche 944 Challenge, the LK Diesels uh, crew there, and also the sports car team with um, the Callis Kenny sponsorship for their series as well. A great bit of energy. Awesome to have Emma Dean joining us here and we will uh, educate her on six other categories between now and the next round and she'll be part of the team roped in hook, line and sinker. We'll take a quick break here trackside of the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championship.
Welcome back, trackside here. We're looking straight over the shoulder of the great shoulder of the great man Brett Dickey, competing in the Victorian Sports Sedan Championship, and of course he will be heading over to the USA in a couple of weeks' time to represent in the Project Import team, and we'll certainly be heading off to Pikes Peak. But he's currently competing in the Groove Train Eastland Victorian Sports Sedan Championship, also supported by. QP Lubes, quality performance lubrication from Vanessa and Peter down at QP Lubes provide professional lube service for passenger cars, oils, heavy duty diesel oils, transmission fluid, farm oils, industrial, many, many more. Check them out. And of course, National Blind Supply is owned by Francois Habib, our current champion, reigning champion is Francois. And just off screen, you can see the Dodo Commodore with its orange rear wheels just over there. That's Francois poised for greatness again this year. Smack bang ahead, talking about greatness. Car number 66 is Dean Cam sitting on pole position. He owns that spot. And let me tell you, Triple Eight Home Loans have even got a mortgage taken out on it for him so that he can sit there and enjoy it. But National Blind Suppliers, National Blind Suppliers, a wholesale manufacturer of window furnishings, including blinds, shutters, and awnings on South Gippsland Highway in Dandenong South. Great to have the big bangers of Australian motorsport live and well. As we're just seeing uh, Brett calling on the umbrella over there to keep the uh, the cool hands and feet of Brett all ready to go. Interestingly enough, you wonder where the engine is. It's right behind that ACL logo and, of course, fully equipped with all the good parts from ACL. I'm Darren Smith, right alongside me, Callum Brannigan, in for this one. Callum, it's great to have the big bangers back on Sandown, isn't it? Fantastic, Darren. Very happy to be here this weekend and sports sedans early on, it should be said. One of the headline events here for the Victorian State Race Series. This is round one of 2024, round one of six scheduled. And on pole position, as you said, Darren, Dean Cam, supported by his wallet in the Chevrolet Corvette, that beautiful looking Corvette. And it sounds just as mean and tough as it looks, Darren. So looking forward to that, to this race as we look through the heat haze. He's alongside Jim Policina in the Mocom Motorsports Holden VE Commodore Supercar. That car looked absolutely beautiful as it has done uh, so throughout the weekend. Francois Habib, the defending Victorian champion, he starts out of row two alongside Brett Dickey in the Honda Prelude, the turbocharged four pot special taking on the big V8 uh, establishment. John Ippolito starts out of position five alongside Travis Condon in position six, the Toyota Corolla. Bright green, you can't miss it. And it's got a massive V8 under the bonnet. That thing is spectacular and embodies everything we love about sports sedans. It's crazy. And the engineering and the work that's gone into it by Travis Condon and the team uh, is very much appreciated. Brian Finn starts out of position seven in the VS Commodore alongside Greg Lynch, who made some steady ground in the last race in that VT Commodore. Looks, uh, it is a tribute livery to uh, Craig Lowndes in the late 90s in that car. So Ben McLeod, bit of an up and down race for him uh, in the number 72 machine, the plain red VZ Commodore. That is a beautiful looking car. And he's alongside Graham Gilliland in the 20 B powered triple rotor Mazda RX-7. It's bright orange, you can't miss it, we love it. Darren's rubbing his hands with glee at the prospect of that. Got another rotary. Speaking of rotaries, and Darren, you um, you love a rotary, don't you? I do, I do. Position 11, Bruce Henley. Um, he's a stalwart of Victorian competition. And Adrian Reed in position 12, Darren. Well, second generation driver there, son of Len, who uh, for many years has made historic touring cars a very happy home in his Group N. Mini, big shout out to Len and his son Adrian. This uh, little turbocharged Mini, you can't cram anything more in the box under the bonnet of that Mini. It is absolutely spectacular. Ram McGuirk and Senior taking no further part. Michael Luff, we saw uh, smoke filling out of his car. Kevy Stoopman had an over boosting issue, which obviously they can't fix. And Alan Nash in the JD livery Commodore, not taking any further part. Bit of natural attrition in sports stands. They're very, very highly strung, bespoke people of engineering kit. There's not really much that can transpire between one car and another. Talking about that, there's one that is a very, very special piece of kit. The, uh, the Dickey family racing outfit there with Brett at the wheel and uh, well, this is the final hit out for the weekend for the sports announcement. Let's see how that little two-litre 
Honda with the turbocharger hanging off it goes and also right down the very back of shot there in the Adrian Reed in that turbocharged Mini. Absolutely spectacular on track. Just looks the goods. It's as wide as it is tall as it is long. And uh, he does a tremendous job. Dean Camp in the 66, bringing the field around, as I said, for Groove Train Eastland. If you're looking for a feed and you're anywhere in Melbourne, make sure you head into the Groove Train Eastland. Say good day to Vin Stenter. He normally races with us as well, but uh, certainly sponsoring the series. Hosted the presentation dinner for the 2023 season and a great night had by all at the Groove Train Eastland Shop 24 third floor right next door to the Hoyts Cinemas in Eastland Shopping Centre. QP Lubes for all your lubrication requirements. Big shout out to Vanessa and Pete and of course National Blind Supplies. The owner of that can't hear me right now because he's about to line up on position number three for this race. Francois Habib, the reigning champion. Poised for a ripping start here. Can anyone in this field stay with Dean Cam off the line. He takes off like a pro stock drag car every time the lights go out and uh, he's never missed it. The car is just so good at launching. Travis Condon got away brilliantly at the start of the last race as well in that green Corolla. Very serious. Those guys are not mucking around. It, you know, it's an unusual car to make into a sports stand. They have done so and they're making it work very, very well. Looking over the left-hand shoulder there of Brett Dickey, he lines up. Here is the spider cam overlooking the sports sedans field. This is, of course, going to be a 15-minute hit out, and that time has started ticking down as soon as the cars left the dummy grid and came on to the Sandown Raceway, the historic Sandown Raceway. Very privileged to be here this weekend with such a wonderful collection of race cars, the VSRS community. Strong vibes in the paddock, fantastic to be here, and it is a beautiful summer's day as the revs rise for the sports sedans to get underway right now. Dean Cam gets a fantastic launch there, so he'll have the initial jump on Policina as they go down towards turn one. And have a look at the horsepower of the Corvette coming through the heat haze. Francois Habib sitting back in position three. John Ippolito now having a look up the inside in the number 97 Senator. Running two wide coming through there, giving each other plenty of room as is the pair of Commodores. Brett Dickey there looming in the background as well in the prelude with, uh, with Condon just behind in the green Toyota Corolla. Huge variety of cars here this weekend coming through to coming together there between McLeod and Greg Lynch. They're coming up the back straight here. This is a good comparison between two completely different machines. You've got the Turbo 4 pot in the Honda Prelude of Brett Dickey sailing up the inside there. Drops it down a gear into the fast left-hander at turn six, seven and eight. Taking it nice and easy early on as the tyres continue to come up to temperature and into the left-hander at turn nine there. So Brett Dickey, you can hear the bit of the turbo lag there as well with the prelude as the turbo spools up and comes onto full song here. So Dean Camp, he's got a few car lengths over Jim Policino as they come onto the main straight, but there's still uh, just under eight minutes remaining in this race, Darren. Good start there for Dean as always, Jim Policino in hot pursuit. Francois Habib follows on. The prelude now is starting to wind up with Brett Dickey. Got through in a straight line on the 97 of John Polito. He gets through, but looking in the background there, here we go, there's Dean McDonald, uh, McLeod, sorry, Ben McLeod. Boy, that was a big off there. Just missed Graham Gilliland on the way off and gathered it all back up. Bit of a troubled run. In fact, we've never seen Ben have a troubled run. They had an alternator issue. Yesterday, they had one of the strangest issues you've ever seen with their brakes there as well. I'll leave you to go and uh, talk to him to feel that story. So, suffice to say, these guys have never had mechanical problems this weekend. They've just had a couple that have held them out. An alternator of all things gave up on the marshalling area before race one today. There is the orange machine, car number 21 from Melton Bodyworks, g, &G Engineering and Bollards Direct. Graham Gilliland, a little bit of uh, overrun fumes out of the back of that car, which can be a feature of an injected um, rotary. A bit of um, raw fuel just getting out the back there, no flames. But uh, certainly, Graham slung the 20B inboard and it's probably one of the quickest changes of engine uh, configuration that I've ever seen. They've gone from the twin rotor to the triple and within six months they were back racing again. Yes, albeit in a development process, but as Graham says, why not develop it at a race meeting and have some fun doing it? The 29, the Bollards Direct, 
car of Brett Dickey now starting to get into it. You can hear that turbocharger really starting to take effect on the induction of this car. Really sneaks up on you once that turbo is going. Takes all the sound out of the exhaust. And you get this lovely turbo sound as we climb back up the hill. There goes Brett. Right behind Travis Condon joins in the party here. Here's our race leader, Jim Policita again, waiting in the background there. We've only got five, uh, six minutes left in this race. So Jim probably wants to start to produce the lap times to threaten here. As Brett Dickey, let's have a look at his time. A 1.14.9, a 1.14.2 is what Jim Policina has done on lap number two. And that's the fastest of the three laps so far. I love that camera shot on the back straight, Darren. It gives you a great example of the different engine makes that make up the sports sedans field. And Paul Chain has made some solid ground on the back of Dean Cam. But the horsepower advantage for the Corvette, that massive menacing engine under the bonnet, just means he can pull out ever so slightly going down towards turn one and leave Policina for dead. But it's through the twisty stuff where Policina makes up the ground once again. So this is a tantalising, tasty prospect of a race, Darren. And here you've got Greg Lynch coming through as well. He's going to make a pass on Graham Gilliland as they come up to turn one. Here at turn four, however, here's that camera shot I was talking to you before about, Darren. So as the cars come streaming past, you can hear the differences, obviously slightly different V8s through there. Uh, but the four-cylinder of the Prelude with Brett Dickey streaming past as well sounds absolutely on song. So I love the variety and I love the technical mayhem, I guess you'd have to say it is, with uh, sports sedans um, to achieve the speeds that they do. Policina, as supercars are designed to do so, they are very comfortable bashing over the high curbs at the Sandown International Raceway. Dean Cam's car, on the other hand, maybe not quite so comfortable over uh, the massive bumps as Jim Policina. So it's great to see how they both make their uh, generate their speeds uh, in terms of an overall lap. Jim Policina, a very, very experienced racer, raced in Super 2, Super 3, Touring Car Masters, production cars, raced a Lotus with Ryan Simpson, uh, to second in the championship behind Tony Alberto and Grant Denyer a number of seasons ago, but has always had a V8 in the uh, shed that he takes out in one of those formats of racing. A New South Wales racer, um, normally. This is the first time we've seen him here, down here in uh, the State Series, but uh, when you put the, the Ravage Raceworks sticker on the side of your car, you're joining up with Dean Lilly out of his workshops in Lilydale and uh, a great way to go as we see Greg Lynch who also comes out of the uh, Rabbit Raceworks stable there as well fighting back again a, a troublesome weekend with the steering box uh, steering power steering pump and a steering rack changed over in that car and Brett Dickey just on camera now and the Bollards direct car number 29 we wave goodbye to Brett for round number two he's over in the at the Circuit of Americas competing for the Project Imports outfit and uh, representing them very, very well all the way to Pikes Peak again this year. His uh, challenge at Pikes going in again this year, had a great run up there last year. They've done some more things to make the car go better. And this is a big challenge now for Ben McLeod. Graham Gilliland getting breathed down his neck by the driver of number 72. Gathered it all back up there, Ben. In fact, this is the first time I've seen even any dust on his car. Callum, the car normally, I'm not saying it doesn't look immaculate, but has that got dust on it? Come on, Ben. Yeah, he's going to have to bust out the chamois at the end of this race, unfortunately. Beautiful looking Commodore, and he's got a bit of a run coming down the main straight. Gilliland covers him off to the left-hand side. It'll be good to see what the just how many ponies are underneath the bonnet of that RX-7 now. It's rocking. A 20B, Greg Lynch in the foreground there just going through as well. Now Dean Cam is the fastest man on track as they go too wide in the turn one. Ben McLeod around the outside and he takes that position away from Graham Gilliland. But you can see that RX-7 is still looming large in his mirrors and this race will be far from over between these two. So the number 72 machine, as Darren alluded to, is going to need a little bit of love just to uh, brush up or just make it as clean as it was at the start of this race. But that is a relatively low maintenance approach uh, in terms of the grand scheme of things. Now here you've got two Commodores on screen. This is Finn from Greg Lynch. So Finn is currently in the number 88 BS Commodore, just ahead of the number 22 BT Commodore. And yes, that car of Greg Lynch, uh, prepared by Ravage Race, Raceworks. That car is stickered to look like Craig Land's car from uh, the late 90s. 
enormous amount of success from the Holden Racing Team in the V8 Supercars Championship back in that day. And Greg Lynch has got a bit of a run on him as well. That car of Greg Lynch sounds amazing. It's got a very robust V8 underneath the bonnet, and it's it's one of the best sounding cars here this weekend out of all the categories, Darren, in my, it in my is, opinion. It certainly is something different, the power plant they've got in that car. It is a sports sedan. It's a floor pan type of car. It, the, as Callum said, it's a tribute livery. Greg likes the way that car looks. It's not an X supercar. It's a ground up build and uh, just happens to put the stickers on it that represent a car that he really liked in his lifetime. Stevenson in in the uh, Henley RX-8, sadly, after uh, only two laps as we get a good look at the uh, Bollards Direct car number 29. There is Adrian Reed in that little turbocharged Mini. So a couple of turbocharged cars lighting fires beside each other there on the uh, overrun into the S's. Around through 12, the little kink of 13, and that completes the, the lap here at Sandown International Motor Raceway. And it is Dean Cam over Jim Policina now, and that's out over to three seconds. So Dean has managed to ramp it up. Fastest lap of the race to Cam at a 113.88. We've got two laps to go now. Getting a really good look at the Bollards direct outfit there of Brett Dickey, the company he uh, works for on any other day of the week that he's not at the racetrack. And uh, again today welcoming his uh, new daughter to the racetrack. Absolutely wrapped yesterday. He uh, had his little girl in his arms. He had his racetrack in the shed there, a uh, race car in the shed there. And, just the best day at the racetrack and good on you Brett, you deserve it mate as he goes up the inside now of Francois Habib asks the question, Francois gives him just enough, they give each other just enough as Francois looks to the inside again on the 29 and Brett Dickey has just got this turbo thing wound up nicely now. Jeez, it's a little bit cheeky uh, from the two of, the two of them there but as they both went wide and off uh, beyond the track limits I dare say that would be uh, Brett Dickey's position for the remainder of this race. So that was for position three. Great little move there by Brett Dickey. He'd been looming large for the last few laps as Dean Cam kicks off the final lap of the race in that number 66 Corvette. Nice and under control. That's exactly how he likes to operate. Relatively low stress race for the Corvette pilots. So Dean Cam doing a brilliant job. And as Darren said, 2.8 seconds between positions one and two. Group train Eastland on the front windscreen. Here comes Policina. Sailing through there at turn four from Brett Dickey from Francois Habib. So this has been a very spirited race uh, for the sports sedans, Darren. And you can see just how warm it is out there. It's only 24 degrees, so it looks a lot warmer on screen than it is, but it's considerably hotter inside of the cabins of these sports sedans. These bespoke race cars with massive race. Let me tell you, when you've got 900 degrees of extractor sitting right next to you in Dean Cam's case, or uh, even in Brett Dickey's case, the temperature coming off that turbocharger, which spools up red hot, and uh, you know you're into it. The supercars, we know how hot they get around the pedals and things like that with the heat of the exhaust. But boy, oh boy, if you want them, and say it with a lisp, it sounds like free from free, but it's three from three for car number 66, which is a multiplication of uh, three as well. So Dean Cam gets through there very, very nicely indeed and takes another victory in the Groove Train Eastland Victorian Sports Sedan Series. Darren brushing up on his maths. Up the inside, McLeod with a late move there. Up the inside of Greg Lynch. That's a great position. Clinical exchange there. Ben McLeod absolutely lights up the rear of that Commodore as he tries to get that power plant down. Trying to get as much traction as possible through there. And that was a great move at the same corner where he had uh, an unfortunate mistake. Can he make another position, though, on fin as they come on to the main straight? We're racing towards the chequered flag, but it isn't quite enough time there. So... That is Ben McLeod up into position seven, capitalising on that position change from Greg Lynch. Lynch is home in position eight, and, Gre and Graham Gilliland across the line there in position nine. Now, John Ippolito is the only other car that we're waiting to cross the start-finish line, and you can see there, he's actually and pulled he up. He's parked up on the left-hand side on the back straight, just beyond our camera point there. Uh, so that's unfortunate for Johnny Polito. That's another very impressive uh, floor pan style sports sedan. Travis Condon giving him plenty of room, but here is confirmation on screen, Darren. Uh, the final results for race three <laughs> of the Dean. sports sedans here at Sandown. Dean Cam, Jim Policina into P2. Great to have Jim travel down from Sydney and join us with the sports sedans. We, uh, we hope car number seven 
stays in Victoria. And I'm hoping the fact that it's got Ravage Racework stickers on the front guards means that it's staying at Dean, uh, at Dean Lillis and we get to see more of Jim this season. Brett Dickey, we uh, congratulate him on a P3 in that race and uh, bid him adieu with lots of love and care and forceful driving into the uh, North America for project imports. And we can't wait to hear the results back out of uh, North America for Brett over the next few months as his uh, assault at Pikes Peak takes form. Francois Habib home in fourth place defending his championship. Travis Condon out of the National Series here into the Victorian State Series doing a terrific job home in fifth. Brian Finn to Ben McLeod. Now Ben has to get the hose out and give that car a good wash. I don't want to see any more dirt on that car for the rest of the season. Greg Lynch, a torrid day weekend at the racetrack. Graham Gilliland gets home proudly there in ninth place to Greg Lynch, Adrian Reed, and uh, that was our final finisher. Stevenson didn't finish in the number 67. Big thanks to Groove Train Eastland for throwing their support behind Grassroots Motorsport, Sports Sedans run and won for the weekend. If you would like to follow the Victorian State Race Series on our social pages, you can do so by navigating, opening up your uh, telephone application, Darren, as he pulls out the Nokia <laughs> and he go, opens up Instagram and he'll follow Vic State Race Series on Instagram. And you can also check us out uh, on Facebook as well. So uh, facebook.com forward slash Vic State Race Series. You can see on your screens there, Darren, clicking follow right now as we speak. So a big thank you to Darren and we encourage everyone to follow. Oh, look at that. Uh, catch up on all the news, updates, uh, lots of little... Um, what about Taylor Swift on this Instagram thing you I call it? The only <laughs> Swift we're interested in is competing in Formula 4 That's today, right. Darren. It's, it's, um, yes, a small concert happening in Melbourne this weekend. But yes, <laughs> three of them. Yeah. Jump onto the socials, give us a like and a follow, uh, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, especially for the community members out there within the Victorian State Race Series, if you do uh, post uh, the so to your socials and you include us in a tag, chances are we'll be sharing it as well. So, uh, big thank you to the entire community. Big thank you to the volunteer officials out there as well. Uh, working tirelessly all weekend. Uh, it's big thanks to the, the volunteer officials, the flag marshals, the fireys, um, everyone who is contributing to this race meeting in an official capacity. And if you're sitting from home uh, anywhere around the world and you think, I actually quite like how close to the racing action they are because believe me, it is that close when you're standing uh, just a few inches away from the racing action. But if you'd like to find out more information on how to become a race official and take that next step up from a spectator, uh, you can go to motorsport.org and follow the links to uh, become an official. So we'll take a quick break up here, Darren, and coming up shortly will be Formula V. Formula V heading out there onto the racetrack. Darren Smith and Callum Brennigan have uh, subbed themselves out uh, for myself, Dan McCarthy, and Steve DeFries. Formula V have uh, really put on a show for us. I seem to say this every race, but I feel particularly in the first two races of the weekend. 
And uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what they deliver in this one. There's plenty of talking points uh, out of the last race and then an unfortunate incident up the pointy end of the field on that last lap. Yeah, you're certainly right, Ash. Good afternoon, everybody. There is going to be a very, very fast car coming from the back of the grid as a result of some contact. But let's quickly look at the grid here. Ash Quiddington and Lee Partridge on the front row from Jake Rowe and Andre Curran. Uh, they were the beneficiaries of that little incident that happened. It deemed to be a racing incident in race two this morning. Ash Clifford and Nick Kerr on row number three. Shane Purvis is having a good return weekend in the number six joust car. In seventh with Adam Nicholson, who drove from the back of the grid this morning, made his way up to position number eight. Brock Hamill, Malachi Windsor in the next two spots, ninth and tenth. Darren Power and John casamati has got a little bit of work to do after a little bit of a slip on some oil in race number two out of 12th. Cameron Bell and Josh Munro, 13th and 14th, with Rob Vile, 15th, and Mick Fisher's got the builder's crane higher at number 33 in 16th. Then the remainder of the field is Rocco Spinley, Kelly Egan, Claudia Lennox, Nick Jones, that's the big one there at the back of the field in 20th place, and then Charlie Richardson. Nick and Charlie were the two non-finishers in that first race this morning. Nick, unfortunately, with a little bit of wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact, deemed to be a racing incident coming down the hill into Dandenong Road and a little bit of a damage to repair there. They've changed the gearbox out on car number 11, hoping everything will be all in order and he can hopefully drive his way back into a good point scoring position in this third and final race for this afternoon. Dan, big, big little bit of history here in Formula V. This is a 60th or diamond year for Formula V in this country, founded in 1965. It is officially a, the 60th year of competition for Formula V. Hard to believe we've been going for so many years in a category filled with history all the way back through the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s and now the modern era of Formula V and it still delivers after 60 years in operation. Quite remarkable 60 years. It's got to be possibly the longest standing category apart from the Australian Touring Car Championship slash supercars, of course. It's even longer than Formula Ford, which recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. But here we are, Formula V on the grid now. Green flag at the back, so we await the light. There it is. That means around five seconds. Oh, that was a really short hold, actually, wasn't it? That was nowhere near five seconds. Oh. We are underway. Pretty even start from the front row. Quiddington and Partridge, and it's going to be Quiddington that will lead them down there, but here comes Partridge coming out of the toe. And a good start from Andre Curran. He's already got past Jake Rowe, and he might be followed through by Nick Kerr. Is that a blinding start? Yeah, he's had a good start. He's up on the outside of Jake Rowe there around turn number one. Good start from the third row of the grid for Nick Kerr. Eyeing off position number four here, and he gets it done. Rowe gives him plenty of room. That's a veteran's decision there. Plenty of time left on the clock in this race. No need to be chopping across other cars' noses at this early rate of proceedings and a very very smart decision just to let Nick go and he's got plenty of time to make amends for that in the latter stages of the race. It's about playing your chess pieces precisely at the beginning and then leaving the big moves, the decisive moves, till the very end. Although up in front now Partridge gets a nice little slingshot up the back chute and swings the number 28 machine to the lead of this race. There's Casamati, he's made a good move on Brock Hamilton there in the Acura Motorsport number five. He's recovering after that little slip on the oil out of turn 13 earlier this morning. He didn't get the wall. It was actually saved by the grass being a little bit damp and a little bit of, of uh, mud there that just kept the car and arrested its momentum. So he avoided the wall, avoided any damage. He's just got some recovery work to do. And he's tacked onto the group in seventh and eighth place. And Ash Clifford very nearly went for a bit of a wild ride himself. He's turning left, turning left, and didn't seem to want to go. It just kept going straight. Finally, it gripped up, turn left, and it spat him back on the racetrack at a bit of an angle. Everyone taking evasive action nicely there, though. Nick Jones, what a start, up to position number 12 already. Yeah, nice job. He's just tucked in there behind Brock Hamilton as well. Adam Nicholson is now latched onto the back of Ash Clifford. So there is Nick Jones there. You can see the number 11 on the front there, decisively down the inside of Hamilton. Now up inside the, uh, up to 11th place. Now he's knocking on the door of the top 10. But Nicholson will be a little bit more of a challenge, I would say. That, uh, that number 95 stinger is quite a rapid bit of kit. He's got a nice little toe from Ash Clifford ahead of him but it'll be the double toe for Nick Jones behind. He'll get the benefit of two cars punching a hole in the air. 
course, Nick Jones, the uh, race one winner yesterday. So he's certainly got the pace to be at the front and he will be there in a heartbeat. The question is, will the top four or five of have broken away by the time he gets that oh big lock up for Quiddington he's yeah. going to struggle to get it stopped he has but he has lost the lead and he might lose second position as well oh. but he had to come off the break there just to try and get it turned in he just about managed to do so that was good car control somebody's oh. off yeah, at car. high speed down at Dandenong Road yeah in the background someone's gone I think it's Kelly Egan in the number 42 Jaser so looks like she might have had to take some evasive action because there was a big plume of dust go flying as she entered the sand trap there and Nash Quiddington was lucky not to lose second place there. He came back onto the track and Curran sort of came around turn number nine and didn't have anywhere to go. He had to check up. But a big braking mistake from the driver of the number 12 Oasis building Sabre 02 into turn number nine. Gifts Partridge back the lead. Now Clifford's got to fight his hands. Oh, three into one. Doesn't quite go. And Casamati now has to get his elbows out with Nick Jones. Now this is going to be important here as we have a look at the replay. And what happened here? Oh, she went straight off and she hit the wall too. So sort of pancake the wall at a parallel angle. But I don't think we'll be getting out of there in any great hurry. And this is now important because safety car has been called. So if there were any moves being made in the opening couple of corners, that's now settled. Now, this is a hallmark you see in Formula V here. A number of drivers sticking their hands up in the cockpit to acknowledge not only have they seen the yellow flag, but to let the other competitors know if they can't see it, that, hey, there's a yellow flag out. Let's just settle things down here, get back into line and get under control. Tell you what, uh, the top five are broken away, so this is great news for Nick Jones. He's up to ninth position, mm. and it's a reset of the field. If he can get quickly past the three ahead, he's with that lead group. It's uh, just a reset, and he's in contention for the race victory. So couldn't have come really for a better time for Nick Jones. He he almost made his way up as far as he could, but there's a big gap to the leaders. This resets everything. A bit of smoke there, was there? No, nope. I think that was uh, my imagination. I actually think this is better for Nick Jones because he was up with Casamati, so I think you had him down here in ninth. I actually reckon he's either going to be seventh or eighth, so he's actually going to be a little bit better off than this when the timing screen updates itself. And he's actually up to Six. sixth, wow. so he managed to get that move on Casamati done before the yellow flag came out. So this is a lot better than what he thought was going to happen in the early going here so good rapid progress through the field timely safety car right back with the lead bunch going to be game on again so very very nice uh, bit of uh, driving from nick jones there and well a bit of luck to go with it certainly is as we see all of the field nice and quickly uh, behind the safety car the uh, holden leading the pack around in this Formula V race. First Formula V safety car of the uh, weekend. They've been so clean so far this weekend, but unfortunately uh, we've seen that a few times, not just this weekend, but over the years. It's such an easy place to make a mistake, lock up and clout that wall. It's caught out the very best in uh, supercars as well as in the big state race series. So a bit of a reset. It's Partridge that leads them. He's yet to have a win this weekend. Uh, Quiddington was our winner earlier on today. It's been a very good day for Quiddington. He got pole yesterday. He's got a race win today. And he won the raffle, didn't yeah, he? He won the raffle. And I think he annoyed a few people by doing that because he wasn't expected to, uh, to do that. But he's just come in and sort of kicked all their backsides, as a few of the Formula V competitors have said this weekend. They weren't expecting him to do so well after not racing at this place for up to 10 years. So it's almost like he never left it. No, and uh, he's going to go even better potentially next round with his Metabo toolkit now. As well, we certainly so will. that was the prize for winning the raffle. A uh, really nicely presented Metavo tool kit. Safety cars coming in too, so this is a very short period. I was about to say that it probably won't take the crew too long to recover Kelly Egan from the gravel trap, and I was exactly right. They had someone on the scene pretty quickly, so this will be a very short safety car period. There you go, Partridge assumes control of the field, and the 20 cars that remain will now line up behind him coming to the line here. Now, when do you push the go pedal? That's the thing. Safety car's not quite in pit lane yet, but Partridge going fairly early, is he? No, I thought he was going fairly early there. He's going to leave it right till the very last minute, but look at this for a restart. All nicely in a line. That's a fantastic restart oh. for Formula V. There was one or two drivers that may have just been edging and chopping at the bit to jump the gun. There might be a little bit of scrutiny at the start-finish line, but for the front sort of half a dozen drivers, it looked pretty clean, and now they all fan out heading down to turn one. Great bunched restart. 
restart. There goes Quiddington back to the lead of the race. So he's not wasting any time. Jones is right there too, and he's picked off his stable mate, Nick Kerr. And he's got Curin as well. So up to position number four on the back of Jake Rowe. So they have all reshuffled themselves. We've thrown the, uh, the pack of cards up in the air. And uh, they have all shuffled themselves into a completely new order, as we say. So Quiddington now out in front. But by the time we go through the list again, it's not worth it because it will have all changed on the back straight once again. So Partridge coming back up the inside to retake the lead. He says, thank you very much. You've had the lead for quite enough. Thank you very much. And uh, Rowe settles in to third ahead of Jones, fourth, Curin and then the number 40 machine of Kerr. It's really been those six that have been at the head of the field throughout this weekend. It certainly is. Now, the four cars behind Nick Jones have got to be very, very careful here. They can't afford for this lead group of four cars to skip away again like they have done for the first two races. There's been a bit of a reset here. I was a little bit worried that at the restart, a couple of them might have missed the jump and that the gap would have become too large to overhaul. You can see now that there's actually a, a little bit of an air margin starting to fall between Curran in fifth and Kerr in sixth. There's a five second penalty that's just been levied against Brock Hamilton and I was a bit worried that was going to happen and it will be there was some overlapping at the start finish line. So we got a little bit too greedy, went a little bit too early and was deemed to be, he hadn't passed a car, but he was out of line and alongside the car beside him at the start finish line. And that's a no-no. Overlapping uh, the other purple machine of uh, Nicholson there. I saw that out the uh, commentary box window. So yeah, that was the uh, reasoning for that one. Uh, the only one I saw visibly at the commentary box that was overlapping at the line. So that's a big no-no, uh, a big, uh, a big, cross in Australian motorsport as we go three wide could we even go four wide on the back straight it yes. looks like we will who's gonna lift who's gonna be bravest down into turn number six Partridge was the bravest there and uh, just takes it back ahead of Quiddington Rowe and Jones just in behind Jones first slap of the race that was just before the safety car a 129-1, a really, really uh, flying lap, that one. Kieran was really strong in the race early this morning, late on. He caught back up to the top four at the end of the race and uh, had, I think, the fastest lap at the end. Really, he really did. came home strong. Uh, this time, though, he's going with them. It's a group of five, which uh, really plays him into this race, that's for sure. Yeah, Kieran said to me after race number two that he felt that the car was still understeery, but it sort of came to him a little bit later on in the race number two. But he's tried to smarten that car up. He wants a little bit more front end, just wants a little bit more turn in. He just feels like if the car's a little bit more responsive to his liking, he might be able to hang with that leading group of four cars and potentially challenge. He's doing a good job at the moment. He's just gone past Nick Kerr up into fourth place there. And the five of them are starting to clear out. When uh, Nick Kerr here in the number 40 is starting to become a little bit of a cork and champagne bottle. He's got Nicholson bottled up behind him. He's got Casamati in between the two of them. So they're the next group that just need to be able to try and bridge that gap. They're unsuccessfully doing so at the moment. And it's the leading group of five cars Curran making up that fifth car in the group. You can see here the margin's growing as well. Kerr in the green and blue number 40 with a rear view or side view mirrors full of Adam Nicholson's number 95 out of the Acura Motorsport stable. He's the best of the Acura drivers at the moment in position number, well, was was eighth, it's now seventh. And then behind him, Brock Hamilton's a couple of spots further in arrears in ninth. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, quite interesting looking at the round honours at the moment. If it stays as Partridge quitting to the first and second, it'll be a tie on 92 points. But Rowe is very much in contention as well. And if he gets the win and the other two are th second and third, it can all shuffle around. They are very tight on points, those three. I think it's going to be one of those three that wins the round. And here comes Jones, fourth to first. Thank you very much. I'll take the, the running. Thank you very much. So here we go. Let's have a look here at the corner here. Oh, oh, how close do you like getting to the wall? That was Lee Partridge, if you don't mind me asking. It was hard to see who it was. They were that close to the wall. You just saw rocks and debris flick up in the air and a wheel slide past the uh, Pertex sign there on the uh, concrete wall. That's the wall there on the left-hand side as they head 
back up the back straight one more time. Nick Jones was fastest lap of the race again on the last lap. Look at that. The top 12, All 11 of the top 12 improved. Laps. Yes, at their fastest lap on the last lap of the race. Quite remarkable. Very, very rarely do you see that. As jo uh, sorry, Rowe swings it around the outside. Oh, Kurt, Kurt's shot got the chicane and he hit the wall. No, he's oh. managed to keep it off the wall. That was could have gone straight to the scene of the accident. He had to take some evasive action over the back of the rumble strip at turn number seven, and that spat him out the other side. Just got an awkward bounce, spat him out the other side, didn't collect any cars, but it does take him out of what was sixth place. So shame for Nick Kerr, and it'll drop him down in well and truly into the mid-pack. And that releases Casamati and... Who's that one there? Adam Nicholson to try and latch onto the back of Andre Curran, who now is starting to struggle a little bit to keep in touch with the leading group of four cars, but they're starting to die. So when they start to get their jiggy on like this, that just gives the, the ascendancy to Curran just to play catch up. Have a look here, top of the hill, sixth car in the picture, took some evasive action and then just had steering the wrong way. And then the car just bounced on him and moved off to the right hand side of the circuit, but did a good job to keep it out of the Armco. As he uh, rejoined, went over that big curb and uh, had a bit of steering lock on and it's just swung around on him. Uh, so yeah, most cars, the saloon cars and those uh, Porsche 944s, categories like that, that curve's almost non-existent, but yeah. for a really low, uh, slung Formula V machine, yeah, that's uh, quite a curb and if you attack it the wrong way, that can be the result. And as you say, Kieran is just dropping off the tail of these four here, but he's, uh, just to say that, just one late break and he's back on the tail of them. It's been that sort of weekend in Formula V. John Casamati, very impressive. Fastest lap of anyone and the first lap of the race last time through. 28-5. He's now on the tail. He's caught up to Nicholson and Kieran to make it a seven-car train at the front of the field. Absolutely. I'd say it's going to be two laps to go this time around just looking at the clock there with about 20 or so seconds on it so that will give us another 11 lap duration so we had three 11 lap hit outs in formula v this weekend and going down to the wire yet again what a great way to start 2024 in formula v as Ash Quinton goes back to the lead of this race. It's going to be some veteran-like manoeuvres, I think, are going to be in the order of uh, the playbook here going into the final lap. We were very fortunate at the season launch to have Warwick Manderson give us a great keynote speech on just what it was like racing through the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s in Formula V and all the trials and tribulations that they went through. It uh, certainly picked up the interest of a number of competitors in the modern day just listening to what they went through and just be really thankful that we have what we have still, you know, some 60 years later and they're putting on an absolute show like they always do. Here we go up into turn six, scene of the accident earlier this morning. Rose going to get hung out to dry a little bit here. He somehow managed to find the gap that existed between Jones and Quiddington and slot back into second place. I was going to say, uh, Formula V, uh, the principle has very much remained the same. It's just brilliant jostling racecraft out there on any track that they are at, whether that be here, whether that be in Queensland, New South Wales, or around the world, of course, Formula V racing, not just in Australia, but globally. How do you like your top nine? Your top nine are covered by, what is this, 2.1 seconds, first to ninth, absolutely nothing in it. There could be a lot of position changes this lap, so you've got to keep your eye on everything going on here at the moment, not just for the race win and the podium positions, but everything happening behind. It went almost went three wide into turn one. Somebody went wide. It was Brock Hamilton who got unfortunately shuffled out a little bit there. He had a brake lock up in the middle of this leading group by the number 12, that's Ash Quiddington, who's now coughed up two spots. Nicholson up to fourth. Curran got through as well. He went to fifth and leading them up the hill towards turn number six for the final time is going to be Nick Jones. The question is, can he hold off the advances of Rowe, of Partridge, of Curran, of everybody lined up behind him, or is there going to be a freight train heading down the right-hand side and for Lee Partridge, take like the left-hand side of the circuit, 
We're about to find out. Hold your breath. Rowe goes right around the outside. That's the move to do. He shortcuts the back of the chicane and he gains the spot. That's going to be probably looked at, I'd say, after this one's over. There was some room given, but he did have all four wheels outside the track limits. Heading now down to the final chicane for the final time. There's some juking and jiving for the minor spots back in the lower part of this top five. But Rowe's going to exit the final corner with the lead. He's going to outdrag Jones to the line by not very much. He gets it done and takes a win. So three winners or three men cross the line with three race wins in Formula B. Oh, there's a contact Oi. at the end of the race there. What was going on? That's Hamilton and Casamati have come together after the flag. So Rowe, Jones and Partridge are the top three at the end of the race. At the moment as it stands, that would be enough to give Jake Rowe the overall honours by two points over Partridge and by six points over Quiddington, who actually finished fifth. So have a look at this. That's the bit that I'm sort of going to be worried about there. That we'll have to see what happens or what race control does after that with shortcutting the, uh, the back of the circuit. It was a fair attempt to pass around the outside, but we'll have to just wait and get final confirmation of that situation and confirm that Rowe is indeed the race winner. If it's not Rowe, it would be Lee Partridge, which means that we'd still have three winners overall for the round, but it would then mean that Partridge would be the round winner. So we'll wait and see what happens there. I want to have a look at what happened at this incident on the front straight because this was most unusual. Certainly was. I think uh, because they're in such a tight pack, People at the front slowed down. Here we go. The guys in sixth and seventh didn't. They so, Cas are... so Casamati is he in behind Hamilton? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. He went to pull out from behind Hamilton. I think as they crossed the line, he wasn't sort of maybe fully aware that the chequered flag was there. Brock's probably crossed the line and maybe just sort of taking his foot off the throttle to slow down. Maybe it's caught Casamati out. That's a bit of an unusual incident, that one. Yeah, they were they were separated by uh, mere tenths of seconds uh, across the line. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, bizarre incident that has occurred there but yeah, very uh, bizarre nevertheless there are the results just six hundredths of a second 62 thousandths between jake rowe and nick jones lee partridge rounding out the uh, race weekend with another podium in third just half a second back then uh, adam nicholson brilliant drive from him stayed out of trouble was really fast, made up positions and finished in fourth ahead of Andre Curin. Our race winner earlier on today couldn't quite uh, mix it with them on the last couple of laps and finished in sixth. That was Ashley Quiddington. He finished ahead of John Casamati, whose race came to a spectacular end. He beat Ash Clifford, Brock Hamilton and Shane Purvis to the line. Beyond that, we had Darren Power, Malachi Windsor, Nick Kerr finished down in 13th. Not quite sure what happened to Nick Kerr there late in the race. Uh, Cameron Bell finished in 14th. Rocco Spinley, 15th. Josh Munro, Claudia Lennox was highest of the uh, ladies in 17th. Head of Mick Fisher, Rob Vile, and Charlie Richardson brought her car home in 20th in that one. And uh, the only uh, non-finisher in that race was Kelly Egan, who found her way into the gravel trap at Andin on road on the opening lap of the race. Other than that, it was relatively clean b before the uh, checker flag came out, and then uh, we had an incident afterwards. That's right. So there'll be a little bit of a clean-up effort on the start-finish straight there. So there'll be a presentation for Formula V just down in the garages with thanks to GR Motorsport Electrics Online, probably in about half an hour's time. Uh, and from the club point of view, we would like to pay our respects to two of the life members that we lost in 2023. Some icons of Formula V racing here over the previous 60 years. Max Amos and Max Cobb unfortunately passed away in season 2023. So we'd like to send our regards to the Cobb and Amos families. Uh, and I'm sure they would have been proud to see that performance that went down just uh, a few moments ago, but also across the entire weekend. So we thank them for all their contribution to Formula V over the previous generation that has now taken over from the, uh, the, the historians of our, uh, of our sport. Short break here, and we'll be back with Formula, oh, sorry, with uh, Hyundai Excels on the other side of this.
We're back at Sandown. A little bit of a delay before the Lanatec Hyundai XLs make it out onto the race circuit as we clear up the uh, incident that occurred after the chequered flag in the uh, Formula V race. Before we move on to XLs, I just want to say we didn't really say what a brilliant drive that was from Nick Jones. Come, we, he missed out on the victory by six hundredths of a second, but he finished second after starting from 20th on the grid. Yeah. I think we need to uh, mention that before we uh, move on to XLs. Yeah, absolutely. Did a really fine job there in the same vein that Adam Nicholson did the same thing this morning. He started, you know, plumb last after being, or actually going to play in the sand with his bucket and spade <laughs> after yesterday's race. And then uh, he drove himself all the way from, yeah, 21st up to 8th as well. And he was, that put him in the mix for a good position and a good result in this afternoon's final race. So, you know, some very, very mature drives from the back of the field. And uh, in the case of Nick Jones, very much helped by the safety car. So he cleared the majority of the midfield. He was in prime position. The safety car came out and that, like, it just re-energised him, I think, at the end of that because he was back to the front in a heartbeat, showed no signs of slowing down. And looks like the gearbox change they did on the, the number 11 Silver Fox car was uh, absolutely the right call. Now, you mentioned before 60 years of uh, Formula V. Of course, Sandown had 60 years uh, its anniversary not too long ago and you can see this historic racetrack that surrounds the horse racing circuit on the uh, right hand side of the screen so much history around this place a relatively new category though a Hyundai Excels in, in comparison to Sandown I should say is mm -hmm. uh, Excels and uh, Jalen Robotham has taken two wins from two but neither has been easy he's had to fight and hold off the charging pack behind him in both of the races. Hugo Simpson started race one from the very back after a qualifying incident, worked his way inside the top 10 and then marched his way through to finish in second. Led quite a few laps in the race earlier on today. He will certainly be a threat for the race victory, as will Bradley James, who shuffled down to third late in that race this morning. And then Harry Tompkins has stayed out of trouble, but not quite had the pace of those top three so far this weekend. No, he's been there or thereabouts, sort of trailing the top three or four drivers. Just really hasn't had a chance to, to really get through. The others have just driven brilliantly they've defended brilliantly they've made the right moves and Tompkins hasn't sort of been in the right position to capitalize on even the smallest of mistakes and there's been very few of them from that leading trio of cars we get to Brad Verica he's in the Verica Brothers smash repairs number 96 he's he's done, had quite a nice drive two very very mature drives mm. this weekend in amongst the uh, the top sort of half a dozen or seven or eight cars which has been super competitive the same can be said about Tice Hodge there in car number 185 in sixth again very, very nicely driven uh, in very, very you know intense pack racing situation. Harry Strick in car number 630 starts out as seventh with uh, Ashton Kadich uh, in the AMR Motorsport number 13, who's had a good round as well, but been very, very quiet, but uh, still has been consistent. So I think that's the thing we look at with the top sort of half a dozen to, uh, to 10 cars is that they've all driven really, really well. Uh, they haven't made very many mistakes but they haven't been able to really capitalise on anybody else's mistakes. So it's been, you know, fast but fair racing at the front of the XLs this weekend. It really has, and uh, fingers crossed it can stay the same in race number three. So look a little bit further down. Cisco Morales will come out of position number line, nine alongside uh, Jet Blumeris. Then we have Jack Carpenter. And William Sala was uh, involved in a Term 1 incident in the race earlier on today and will come out of 12th. So a bit of a recovery drive. Same with Jet Murray after uh, race one had to march from the back of the field and uh, made wa his way up to 13th. Expect him to come a little bit further forwards and inside the top 10 in this one. He'll start alongside Ethan Wilson in the 53 machine, Lachlan Harvey in the number 25, and uh, Jack Johnson in 129. Two uh, legendary uh, surnames, those two coincidentally next to each other, Harvey and Johnson. Mm -hmm, certainly is. We get from uh, from 16th place. We go to 17th with Ed Narkowitz, who's had a little bit of a, an interesting weekend. He was, I think, facing sideways at one point in yesterday afternoon's race. Lucy Sidwell has recovered well after a little bit of contact in race one yesterday afternoon. She's driven very, very nicely in the number 32 machine. And then 19th there, you had uh, Lee Sellenmeyer and Dallas Harvey in 20th. Brendan Saler and Lee Kennedy on the next row from Peter and Carly Fleming, father and daughter there in 23rd and 24th and rounding out our grid there's a few of uh, Tabitha Ambrose in 25th she actually was extracted from the gravel trap 
in race number two. So she's the, was the last of the cars that got home in race two. And then we've got four cars off the back of the grid with the Brendan Jenner, who came in during the safety car period, Jacob and Abby Wingett, and then Glenn McKenzie, who we don't believe will be taking the start for this race because of the incident that he had in race number one yesterday. Didn't start race two this morning. We're not expecting to see the number 85 vacationer caravans XL. No shame because uh, he was running very nicely inside the uh, top 10, but a, a tangle with uh, Jet Murray saw them both end up in the wall on the outside of turn number three. So hopefully we'll see McKenzie back for round number two at Winton, which is less than a uh, month away. Quite remarkable. Quick turnaround between rounds one and two. That one a little bit further north of where we are at uh, Winton Motor Raceway in country Victoria, a stone's throw away from Benella if uh, you are around that region. And or entries. even in Victoria, uh, even in Melbourne, it's not that far, is it? It's only a two hour drive really from the Melbourne CBD, just straight up the highway. Yeah, it's about two or two and a half hours from where we are at the moment. And uh, I'm led to believe that entries will be opening fairly soon in the coming week. So probably in the next couple of days. So keep an eye out for those. If you, as Darren Smith said, if you uh, are planning to go, get your accommodation booked pretty quick smart yes. because uh, the, the nearest accommodation to the track is in Benalla. It does go fairly quickly and there's a few little surrounding areas. I'm actually told that uh, the last couple of years they have opened the campgrounds at Winton. There are a few people that do take up that opportunity if the weather is nice and it has been pretty nice the last couple of years we've been going there. So it is worthwhile having a look at that weather forecast, the long range forecast and working out if you want to take a swag or you want to take a tent or in some cases if you want to take a, uh, an RV and go and park in the camping grounds you can do that at Winton Motor Raceway. That's going to be next month as you mentioned i think the dates for that one happen to be the uh, the 16th and the 17th of march so smack bang in the middle of the month of march absolutely uh, we've got to thank uh, our sponsors for this category simrigs Com. Uh, first place in the XL Championship this year will go home with a $10,000 Custom Championships graphics kit from uh, the Simrigs.com team. So, yeah, they go home with a state-of-the-art simulator. There's also prizes for tyres and all sorts on the line just for round victory. So plenty to play for in this one. And it's the two-time Bathurst 1000 winner, Jay Robotham, that will come out of position number one. On the right-hand side, the black machine. On the left, Hugo Simpson has been a front-runner in Excels for a number of years now and uh, has really shown why, particularly earlier on uh, this morning, uh, sorry, late, late yesterday in race number one, we marched from the back of the field in the 117 machine. Don't rule out James or Tompkins either, or in fact any of the top 10. It's a real quality field in Hyundai XLs in 2024 as the lights go out. Very even jump from the front row of the grid. The best start of the top four was undoubtedly Harry Tompkins. A brilliant start in the uh, battery stop machine, the red and black one in the center of the shot. But it's going to be really tight. Who's going to be the bravest of the front two down into turn number one? Tompkins is right in there as well. He might try and take second position from the 117 machine. Not quite able to do so as uh, Simpson uses all of the road on the outside of the track, as does James, and that allows him back up the inside into turn number two. So it's as it was on the grid, but it wasn't quite as uh, simple as that. And Verica slots into position number five. As you said, Harry Tompkins got the best start of the lot. He had covered off third place against Bradley James on the run to turn number one, but then promptly coughed it up on the exit of turn number two. And it was basically as you were at the start of the race and they were sitting on the grid. So they're in their original grid spots. Robotham moved over on the front straight to cover off Hugo Simpson quite quickly. And he's doing the same here. He's allowing Simpson to make the first move, moving to cover the defence. You're allowed one defensive move to hold position. You cannot make more than one change of direction. Otherwise, you'll be deemed to be blocking. And Robotham is using all his experience from racing not only in XLs, but uh, in the Bathurst 1000 as a co-driver and also from his racing around the world in Thailand as well. He's putting all that to good use at the moment. He's held off Simpson for one lap and he's got to hold him off for at least another 10. Absolutely. As they come across the line, 13 minutes remaining on the clock. Of course, timed races 
in the Vic State Race Series. Look at Robotham holding the uh, inside line, defending that manoeuvre down into turn number one. Simpson, I don't think he'll be close enough on this occasion, but he can't be much closer as they head down into turn number one. Look at them all fan out further behind, uh, including the 630 machine. That's Strick. It is Strick indeed, and Carpenter is uh, recovered uh, nicely from a couple of issues earlier on in the weekend. It's got a different yeah, bar on the front of that car now. We saw yesterday after qualifying that car, the number 11 simrix.com car, it had the front end, was all smashed in, the radiator mount was all pushed back. They did a remarkable job to turn that car around and get it on the rear of the grid for yesterday's first race. And it just progressed forward ever so nicely over the course of the weekend. So big hats off to that team because they've done a fantastic job to, to get that car race ready after what could have been nearly a, uh, a weekend ending incident. Absolutely, and uh, that was uh, the same incident that saw uh, Hugo Simpson not record lap time in qualifying either, so both been on the combat trail since then. I can hear a lockup, can I? The uh, back of the shot down into Danny Road, no uh, smoke signals to uh, show that, so maybe it's just my hearing going, getting old. Anyway, we see. Uh, the 630 machine once again it's really nicely presented that uh, strip machine and looks very similar to that that uh, Cadell Ambrose uh, it is the same XL but it's a very similar livery to what Ambrose Cadell Ambrose the reigning champion drove late last year yeah it's got the accelerate uh, XL racing parts emblazoned across it which is a different livery and uh a different sponsor compared to what Ambrose had yesterday, but you're right, it looks remarkably similar to the livery we saw with Cadell Ambrose in the latter half of the season last year. I remember oh. seeing the uh, another livery, the uh, the old familiar orange and black is the one that I remember of Cadell Ambrose, which he sort of campaigned for the first half of the yes. season before yeah. he made that late switch. I think it came around sort of Phillip Island was at last was when we first saw that livery. Uh, that's now on car number 630, been piloted by Harry Strick. All bouncing all the way over the ripper strip. A little bit of uh, too much aggression. I think it was there for the car that's in fourth spot or fifth spot in the moment. I think it's Tice Hodge was the one that was sort of bouncing over almost towards the wall at turn number four. So you see them go over the rise. Top three have pulled over two seconds over Harry Tompkins in fourth position. He's sort of by himself because there's a battle here for fifth position. Hodge, Verica and William Sala going down into Dandenong Road. So three-way fight for first and a three-way fight for fourth position. Oh, a couple of wheels dropped over the gravel on the outside there by Hodge, but he's kept up the momentum and uh, kept it facing in the right direction. It's been a, a really good uh, weekend for Hodge to this point and touch wood. I am touching wood that uh, it remains the same for him because he's uh, yeah, really had a uh, strong performance from the word go. All right, so here's Tabitha Ambrose, who was in the gravel trap in this morning's race, but has had a spin and recovering from that spin now and making her way back up through the field and is going to be outside the top 20 at this point. And the car in behind there is number 122, which is Peter Fleming. So they're dropping down, it looks like, to about 22nd or 23rd. Back to the front of the field. And you're right, this group of three, they've kicked away really early. This is a big surprise, all things considered, with the way that the last two races have gone, where we had four or five cars and they were right in the thick of things. This lead group of three, they're, they're checking out. They're in the 33, so 33-6 for Robotham, 33-6 for Simpson, 33-5 for James and fastest lap of the race. They were all personal bests that last time around. And then the next group, all with personal bests, are in the low to mid 34s. So they're, they're not, they've, they've picked the conditions right here, I think. There's the track temperature's definitely gone up. I did see a few people out with the temperature guns reading them in the pit uh, paddock and in the pit lane area. I think I saw on the gauge was up around 41 to 43 degrees. As there goes Carpenter. He's had a moment over the top of the hill coming down through six, seven, eight, and nine and now having to recover. Be really careful, there goes, I think that's Brendan Sala, right around the outside of the slow moving number 11. Looks like a lose at the top of the hill around the very first and uh, sketchy, if you get it wrong, turn number six, and it looks like there was a sketchy moment 
for the uh, number 11 machine. If Carpenter has lost at least a handful of places, I'm watching him plummet down the uh, timing screen. Here we go, first change of the lead in this race. Hugo Simpson very, very briefly holds the lead and will continue that momentum and take it down at turn number two. Robotham, no choice but to slot back in behind there. You can't really keep the position on the outside and fly back up the inside at turn three. Generally ends up in an incident, quite a spectacular one, as we've seen over the years. That's what happened Ooh. to Carpenter. I'm not sure if there's contact there, but there's certainly a lot of noise. Didn't, yeah, a lot of noise. It didn't look like there was some contact. The car that was directly behind sort of seemed to go straight through. So maybe a similar incident to what we saw with Bradley James this morning, although coming off a little bit worse for where not being able to keep the, uh, the car on the blacktop. Had to use a little bit more of the off-track real estate to get himself going again. So Simpson had thrown down the gauntlet to Robotham in race two this morning, and Robotham sort of took everything that Simpson could throw at him, but didn't quite crack. So this is the first proper time that Simpson is in front all weekend long. And really now he's got to show Jay Robotham what he's got up his sleeve from a defensive point of view. If you're Simpson, you'd be looking to just drive away, but Robotham's gonna have that number 117 XL basically on a fishing line and not going to want to let the big fish get away. Uh, behind on the left hand side of the screen we can see Tompkins has been caught by Hodge and in fact it's actually Hodge that's gapped the two behind him so uh, he's closed that gap because uh, Tompkins is very much by himself. Verica is the one that's actually dropped back that's yes. the thing I think that's the obvious picture there Tice Hodge and Harry Tompkins they had Brad Verica for company he's actually dropped back behind William Salen now so lost one spot there in the last lap or two has Brad Verica in the, uh, the, the Verica Smash Repairs number 96. And this is what I was saying before, I think a few drivers might have picked the conditions quite nicely because that track temperature has been going up steadily throughout the day. Air temperature is only about 24 degrees, but you can very much close to double the track temperature and I'd seen it sort of was up around the 43 degree mark. That dictates a lot of things. It dictates, you know, your starting tyre pressures. It, it dictates a little bit of your setup as well, but predominantly the tyre pressures. And if you get it right, you get a good result like these three have out in front. If you get it wrong, you start to plummet down the field because your tyres become a bit too inflated as the pressures go up. So you start the pressures a bit lower and as the race goes on, the builds the pressure up. You don't want to start them too high because they'll overpressurize. you've got not enough grip you know that's the complete opposite to what you would do in the wet you'd start your pressures a lot higher so you can clear the water but because you haven't got all the tarmac or uh, being put or your, your rubber being put down to the tarmac your tires are in the wrong state you just lose time hand over fist so these three i think have guessed it right they've worked it all out and a couple of the others not so much absolutely as uh, you may be thinking jay robotham why is he driving a hyundai xl just uh, keeping his race craft nice and sharp ahead of uh, what's going to be a, a pretty busy season for the youngster, of course, uh, headlined by a couple of drives for uh, yeah, yeah, expected drives in the uh, endurance season once again later on in the year. And Robotham is right on the tail of Hugo Simpson. As they exit the turns one, two and three, all nose to tail Tompkins and Hodge nose to tail as well as they roar up the back straight one more time. We've seen in the first couple of races they just kept jostling for places. Apart from the switch between Simpson and Robotham at the head of the field, there's not been anywhere near as much overtaking in this one. And that's well, a thing, oh, just to say it. Devil. Yes, here comes Robotham then, swinging it around the outside. I was going to say, this is how these guys have broken away from the rest of the field. And if they do battle, could the others come back into contention? So Robotham retakes it at the front. Oh, bit of a love tap there, I think, from mm. James on the tail of Simpson, but no foul. Yeah, that one Play will be on. Okay. That one will be okay. They're, for a long time in XL racing in the early years, we did see quite often at Phillip Island there was a lot of bump drafting mm. going on. Mm. That's actually something that's been outlawed in the regulations for a little while. So car to car contact is strictly prohibited, oh, yeah. but not that kind of car contact. That's a big shunt coming down the hill towards Dandenong Road. That's Wilson in the, the Masterpiece Homes 53, and that's got significant rear end damage. That'll facilitate a safety car. That car's going nowhere. 
and I would not be surprised in the next 30 seconds to see this race nullified. But that is now the opportunity. Here comes Tice Hodge on Harry Tompkins. Got to get this move done before the yellow flags come out. Otherwise, he'll have to slot back into place. But Tompkins is having absolutely none of it and fights off the driver of car number 185 and should hold sway with a good exit here up the back straight. There'll be yellow flags at the top of the hill, so there'll be no passing heading down through turn six, seven, eight, and nine. They'll have to wait till they clear turn nine before they get the green flag to go racing again. It'll remain to be seen whether or not they actually throw the safety car with little over two minutes remaining. They might just be content to leave the, uh, the yellow flags out. I think Simpson was having a look there, but saw the yellows and had to back out. And, uh, yeah, as you say, all the way down here, not an overtaking opportunity till right now on the exit of the corner. It's back to green flag racing. So it looks like we're going to keep it with local yellows down there at turn six, seven, eight, and nine. And the rest of the track is go as hard as you like. James temporarily uh, dropped off the top two. And uh, now he's caught back up to them. So uh, James says, uh, James Fusslap of the race of... These three is a best one tenth faster, but again he seems to have dropped off in a straight line. So not sure if James is struggling with some uh, straight line speed. He's dropped miles back. There's, I think there's some uh, issue with the James car in a straight line. He catches back up again in the corners, but he's certainly struggling in straight line performance. It's a tale of these two now, and Simpson takes it around the outside at turn number one and now as the inside for turn number two brilliant race in between the two and it's simpson once again that takes the lead robotham a bit of an overlap but has to slot back in behind it's turn number four and james is right on them again but i think by the end of this very long straight he'll be miles back oh the uh, dejection real disappointment for wilson uh, good to see though that he's got out the car okay as we're looking a bit further back, there's a bit of smoke coming from a car. No, I think we're just looking at a replay there just to see, yeah, there might have been a little bit of smoke coming out of one of the back of the cars. But let's have a look. Have we got the yellow flag still out here at the top of the hill? Yes, we do. So there's no passing up into turn number six. So with one more lap to go after this one, there's not very many opportunities left to make a, a passing move, but we're hearing that the chequered flag is actually being readied at the start-finish line, potentially. So this race might be over with one lap earlier than we anticipated because of the recovery that's going to have to happen after the race is over. I'm looking from the position here to see what's good going run. on the start-finish line, but it's a good run out of the final corner for Robotham. But if the flag's out, which it is, there's nothing he can do about it. There's not enough time to get that done. And the chequered flag does indeed go to Hugo Simpson with Robotham and James. The three of them separated by a little over three-tenths of a second. So James caught back up in the end, but unfortunately couldn't do anything about the leading duo and for Robotham, second place for him unfortunately ruins what would have otherwise been a, a perfect weekend with three race victories. 98 points though, nothing to be sniffed at. Two still wins winner. and a second as Atlee still takes the round win and Simpson and James joint second on 86 points as we uh, see them continue to come across the line. Tabitha Ambrose there crossing the line in position number 18. Here is a replay, I think, of what happened. The accident. Oh, the car in front own. got crossed up. He got even more crossed up as a reaction. Can't save it. Oh, oh that's, that's a, a big, big hit. hit. That's a massive hit. That was looking likely for the first half of it. It was almost going to be like Bradley James from this morning's race being able to save it. But no, just the, the car swapped ends. Had a little bit too much speed. Swapped ends. He'll be winded because of that, Wilson. No doubt about it. That would have been quite a uh, the hit and he'll be going straight off to the medical facility, I would say, for a checking over. Oh, for sure. Uh, the, the rules are if you hit a certain amount of G, uh, G-force is in the current accident, you do go to the medical centre, and that certainly recorded a lot of G-forces, so much so that when the rear of the car hit the tyre wall at high speed, the front two wheels lifted up into the air. Uh, such as the uh, extreme speed at which that car decelerated. So really glad to see that he's hopped out of the car all right. Um, uh, yeah, really, uh, really fast incident. That one, of course, smashed the rear windscreen as soon as it touched the tyre wall. But it uh, looks like um, the car can be recovered.
That's what the roll cage in that car is for as well. That would have shielded him quite well from the impact. But yeah, he'll definitely be winded. He'll definitely need to be checked out. They always say race cars can be repaired or replaced, but uh, humans unfortunately cannot. So good to see that the safety mechanisms in the cars these days are doing precisely what they have been engineered to do. Absolutely, and uh, the uh, recovery team straight down there, the fire marshals and everything. Brilliant, brilliant job from our volunteer officials that have done such a good job, not just on the track, but also uh, running the show as well in the pits, you know, we're making sure everyone's on the grid, um, everyone in the uh, secretary's office as well. It's uh, really been a great team effort for round number one, and it's uh, run very smoothly thus far. So, yeah, and a big... Big uh, thanks to the uh, MG Car Club, who of course run this round in particular, uh, round number one of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. Bit of a car park down there at the moment as all of the uh, XLs come into the lane. I see a sort of retro mobile livery there on uh, that machine as the cars continue to come through. We should be out with Vic V8s in the uh, not too distant future, but. For the XLs, there's uh, plenty to talk about throughout the weekend. Shame that the uh, the race finished the way it did. We'll run you through uh, those results. So it's Hugo Simpson that did take the win from Robotham. James uh, Tompkins finishing three seconds behind in the end, but held on to finish in fourth position ahead of Hodge. And uh, Verica, those were very close in the end. William Sarlett not too far behind. He beat home Strick. A good recovery from Jet Murray coming from 13th to finish in 9th ahead of Cisco Morales, who rounded out the uh, top 10. Yeah, certainly did. So your round winner is going to be Jay Robotham, 98 points. So just two points off a perfect round. And then you get down to Hugo Simpson and Bradley James on 86 points apiece for their uh, victory, one for the victory in that race there. And for James, a consistent trio of uh, podium finishes throughout the weekend. So those three were the class of the field this weekend, no doubt. They, uh, they kicked away fairly comprehensively and uh, definitely deserve their podium finishes over the weekend. Oh, yeah. Mentioned Jet Murray there. He's sponsored by uh, Lodge Bros Stonemasons. And uh, Lodge Bros Stonemasons uh, give a uh, tyre set to the uh, winner, the round winner in the XLs every single round. So Jay Robotham will be taking home a new set of Dunlop tyres for the next round of the series. Uh, we'll be back after this short break with the big banging Vic V. can see the uh, 53 Wilson 
Machine coming back to the lane significantly shorter at the rear end, unfortunately, but that incident could have been worse. I'm very pleased to see him come out of that vehicle with no injuries. And that's because of some of the, uh, not only the safety of the vehicle, but the uh, improvements that have been made to this track over the years, the historic Sandown circuit, plenty of action zones. And we uh, saw an action, big incident in that last one at one of our action zones. Very long straight into the tight 90 degree left-hander. We saw this incident in the XLs last year. The two cars rolling over down at turn number one. Turns two and three, very tight through that chicane. And then the all important 90 degree left-hander up the drag strip. Press the rise of the hill and go down into turns seven, eight, and nine. That's where we saw the incident just before. Turn around turn number 10, then around turns 12, 13, and across the line. It looks simple on paper. It's not a very simple circuit at all. A real mixture of slow speed stuff, high speed stuff, and you've got to use a bit of curbs as well, particularly in cars such as these big uh, Vic V8 machines. Uh, Steve DeFries has called the first couple of races with me for this series, but Darren Smith, let's jump back, to, back in the box and back alongside me. Uh, it's been a pretty uh, eventful weekend so far in Vic V8s. Yeah, it certainly has been, Dan. Great to jump on you, air with you. Not jump on you, Jay. <laughs> jump on air with you in the Mentone Premix Concrete outfit. Uh, Mr. Finamore's, Finemore's uh, operations down there in Mentone near the uh, near the Moorabbin Airport. Great to see them on board and certainly a uh, fantastic call a race with you, Dan. Of course, you'll be heading up the live stream for the uh, Adelaide Motorsport Festival, which is on the same weekend as our next round. So sadly, we won't have you as part of uh, our coverage there, but certainly you'll uh, be advancing your on-air career and leading the whole city over in Adelaide into what is uh, gathering momentum to be a very, very significant motoring festival. Oh, certainly uh, some big announcements in the, the recent days, including Damon Hill, uh, Valtteri Bottas. So yeah, it's gonna be a really, really big event. Lots of XF1 cars. So Brian <laughs> Finn will come out of position number one alongside John Adams, behind that Aaron Wheatley and David Radcliffe. Plenty of people in Adelaide just looking forward to that though. Dan, I'm sure they are going to have a great, great time. But we will be live and trackside at Winton Motor Raceway that weekend with this fantastic series. Let's have a look at how this grid will line up. They head out on track. Brian Finn did a terrific job in uh, race number two for the weekend. John Adams into from Queensland into P2 in the 55. Aaron Wheatley in the 76 in P3. David Ratcliffe working his way back up through the field throughout the weekend. Aaron Van also the Victorian in the number 44 out of P5. Gary Finemore in that magnificent uh, X, Melbourne's cheapest cars, XB Coupe, out of position number six, which is a feat in itself. That really is a weapon of a car. Mark Curry in the uh, 39 Commodore, Gary Bella. Victor Argento in the, uh, the number 10. Looking forward to seeing how, uh, how he goes in the number 10 out there as well. So we go back to David Hender in uh, the XY bodied uh, outfit there as well. And he's coming out of position number 10. Adam Cadeo back to Nathan Bell, Mark Pezzavento, Anthony Monday, Matthew Horn, Brett Lehman making his way into the Vic V8s as well. And Greg Lynch looking forward. I haven't seen Greg on this outlap, but has had one of his worst weekends racing after uh, getting a nice new engine rebuilt. There's been other little bits and pieces going on with that car. And Dean Lilly and his crew working very, very hard to keep Greg out on track. Double entered as both a sports sedan and in the Vic V8s. You are on Bloodline TV. This is the first round of the Triple Eight Homelands Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. A big shout out to Mentone Premix. There goes the man himself in that green and white magnificent looking uh, XB Coupe. And what a weapon it is. When you look at the equipment around him, it is absolutely awesome. Take absolutely nothing away from John Adams though, sitting in that, uh, that 
I'm going to say non-aero equipped XY Falcon on the front row of the grid, car number 55. What a sight to see. Great to see Lynch join the field once again for this one. It's been a really difficult weekend for him, not only in Vic V8s, but in sports sedans as well. So he'll be looking to end the weekend on a high. Watch him march through this field. There he is right at the very, very back. But on the front row of the grid, We've got Finn on the right and Adams on the left. Lights are out. Oh, no. Stall. Stall for Adams. He's not moved an inch. Now he has. He's lit it up and Lynch has stalled. His weekend goes from bad to worse. Well, Finn, he's uh, got a bit of a gap and he will comfortably lead into turn number one ahead of Ratcliffe in the number 72 machine. And a uh, good start as well from Wheatley. Wheatley was a real fa uh, fast charger in race number two this morning made up many positions particularly late on in the race and was one of the uh, top three fastest drivers out there so uh, watch for him to potentially even challenge Finn in this one. Victor Argento on screen there in the yellow and blue Falcon there as well. Cadeo in that uh, magnificent looking walk for Commodore as they were known as and Greg Lynch there he is off the back of the field and I can tell you the rev limiter is working on that car he's come past the uh, line once he's got going and clicked it a couple of times between gear changes there as he starts to romp his way back up the back straight as does John Adams have a look at John in that white falcon bright green headlights on a 55 the Ford with the green stripes down the side, little bobtail wing on the back, and that is the only thing aero about this car. And the 48 has been more. given a starting infringement. That's uh, fine more in the uh, Mentone Premix car, the uh, the company that is sponsoring Vic V8s for this round. As we see the recovering number 55, where will Adams be when he crosses the line? Of course, started in position number two. And crosses the line in ninth position, nine seconds off the race lead. It's a recovery drive from here in the old Falcon for him. Uh, it looks remarkably similar to the uh, Stephen Johnson TCM car, I recall, from many years ago. I'm not sure if it is that same vehicle or just painted that way. I'll tell you what, though, it is absolutely rapid. He wouldn't have thought that the company he was um, mixing it with, the cars that have got, definitely got aerodynamic aids, and, and just the Hender as well, he does a tremendous job. But uh, they just get these big horsepower numbers out of these things and go racing. And what better place to be horsepower car than Sandown to be able to stamp your authority? As we look at Valor just di dipping out of the stream there, the 97 also just grabbing some fresh air as well. And uh, Brent Lehman working very, very hard to uh, push way through this field. There he is right off the second last in this one there as well. There's the 40, uh, sorry, 14 of Cadeo. Very, very striking livery in Australia. And Motorsport oh. gets a tap from behind and the 14 goes round. Cars behind have to take uh, evasive action. Was, uh... well, that's Lehman that's gone through the gravel. It was Horn that tapped him in the tail. Can Lehman get back on the circuit? He can, just about. Almost turning the thing into a rally car out there. It looks like Vic Argento was running wide there as well. So, yeah, that looked a bit to me like uh, Horn just nudged into the tail of Cadeo in the braking zone and that's what sent him into a half spin. I'm pretty sure there's a rule that's saying you're not allowed to run into a TWR uh, Commodore like that in uh, this sort of racing so uh, that's a shame that that's happened but uh, the VL gets no other damage luckily luckily no other damage as he went sideways and parked across turn nine field comes streaming out here it is again the 14 going on his merry way the 50 arriving at the scene. Got a little bit wobbly on the back of the ripple strip there. Clipped the back of the 14, and boy, he grabbed a whole lot of brake there, didn't he? As the, uh, the dark coloured Commodore there just about gave it into the door. That would have been a pretty scary moment or two there. Looked to me like Horn was committed to the inside, and uh, unfortunately, the uh, the gap had already been filled by Kadeo. Kadeo was holding the inside line, defending the move, so uh, just Horn just ran into the back of the machine. Uh, Lehman, after the uh, gravel trap excursion in evasive action, has brought the car straight into the lane. I didn't think there's any damage on that car. Maybe a, a severe flat spot turned his uh, tyres into 50 cent pieces and uh, has lost all his fillings as he's brought the car <laughs> back into the pits. Oh, well, lucky Greg Leach is in the, uh, in the race. He's a dentist. He'll be able to uh, put the teeth back together during the week for him. So <laughs> great to watch um, both Gary Vella and Mark Akuri engage with each other down at Dandenong Road there as we go 
back out towards the front of this race. That's where, so. uh, Ratcliffe and Wheatley we're watching now. That's Wheatley in the uh, in the 76 coming up to turn four, and Ratcliffe in the, in the 72 there as they come around onto the back straight and charge their way up the hill here. And it's uh, the Hender entry just in behind there as well. So David Hender in the number 53 blue. And we've got two XYs line astern with each other on the straight. John Adams was still in the front row of the grid. Hender recovering from a, uh, a spin this morning here in the Mentone Premix Big V8s. Absolutely. Vic Argento there in the uh, yellow Falcon. He's had a, a, a challenging weekend, a couple of uh, incidents, but sitting just uh, outside the top 10 at the uh, at the moment. And here are the two old Falcons. Don't they look absolutely magnificent under the sunshine here at Sandown. It was a bit overcast this morning, certainly not overcast anymore. In fact, not a cloud in the sky, as we can see on the uh, Blendline TV images as we roar down the pit straight. Ratcliffe struggling for a bit of speed at the moment. Two seconds off what he was doing earlier on in the race. And he might lose another position to the 44 machine. That's uh, also, he's really uh, forming strongly in this particular race. But he's got Hender behind him. Hender has got Adams behind him. And look who is there. Greg Lynch has marched through the field. Fastest lap of the race last time through. Did a 1.18.1. That's faster than the race leader at the moment. As the two Falcons go side by side. Oh, using all the road on the inside there was Adams, that's uh, uncomfortable to say the least. You don't want to be using that uh, little curb on the inside of the kink. It really unsettles the car as Hender makes a nice move on also over the crest of the hill. Turn number six and down into Dandenong Road. His next target is Ratcliffe for third position. So it's been a uh, nice recovery drive from Hender, who had a big spin down at Dandenong yeah. Road in the race early today. That was, uh, yeah, cutting that corner. John well. Adams, yeah, you don't want to cut your tyre up there, old sport. I'll tell you what, you've done well. These two XY cars are uh, absolute weapons. They do not want for any more horsepower, do they? They absolutely open it up as they look right in the back door there of Greg Lynch. And he is fighting back last time around, went up a spot. He's now into six, though, just ticking the boxes. Under uh, the inside now of Arthur Van Orso, gets it done there. Up on the ripple strips. Gee, it was messy there for Greg Lynch. But uh, Hender and Ratcliffe now. Ratcliffe, you get the feeling, Dan, is just driving off his mirrors at the moment. The Pearsdale plant hire, number 53, ranging up there as well. I think he might be using his mirrors a bit too much because he uh, made a big mistake down there at turn number one. Lucky to keep it on the road. I think he's looking at Lynch and uh, Hinder fighting away behind him. And here comes Lynch on the run up the hill. He's got a great run around the kink at turn number five. In fact, they've both got through on Ratcliffe. I'm, I'm pretty sure Ratcliffe's car is not quite running right in this final race. To see both of those cars so easily make their way by the fact that he's continually uh, a couple of seconds a lap slower than uh, what he was earlier on today. So two positions lost there for Radcliffe, two positions gained for Lynch. And uh, Hender, despite uh, overtaking, Radcliffe finds himself still in the same position as they come around the final couple of turns. Look at Lynch. He has bolted. He's come from the back of the grid. Despite a stall, he was miles behind the pack as they got to turn number one. He still managed to make his way all the way up to position number three. Although his next target, Wheatley, is five seconds down the road. Here comes the XY Falcon up the inside, all on the dust. Oh, he's going to make contact with the other one. No, he isn't. But he's had to spin in evasive action. It came in there hot, didn't it? It was always going to end in tears, but he does not want to lose another spot. That is four regains the spot that he just gave up. Made up three spots, handed them back straight away and continues on with them there. So some really good driving being displayed here by uh, David Hender and John Adams. As John Adams now has to try and catch up again. Five and a half minutes left to go in the distance, so uh, plenty of time to do it in. Let's have a look as they uh, come into turn one up on the ripple strips. Upset the car and uh, the uh, gathered momentum put him around sideways, spun him into the uh, into the traffic. 
brilliant uh, uh, heads up driving there by Hender. He saw the car all sideways locked up on the inside and he opened up the steering and said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave you a bit of room. I don't want to damage my uh, Falcon and uh, did just that. So great heads up driving and uh, actually uh, didn't lose a position at all in all of that. So uh, as the uh, other Falcon of Adams spun around, he has managed to hold on to fourth position. Another first lap of the race last time through for Lynch. He's cut the margin down to four seconds to Wheatley, but we're looking at this battle on the screen. This is between the uh, number 50... I can't quite see where he is on the, uh, on the timing, but it's... Uh, sorry, I've uh, lost track of where we are. Vela, there he is, 57. Couldn't quite see him. He's further down the order than what I thought. Vela was running up a little bit further than that earlier on today, so I wasn't looking that far down the uh, timing screen. But nevertheless, Vela having a good battle with Kikauri for ninth position there. Here comes Darren Hender. Up the, uh, sorry, David Hender up the uh, shoot there as well out of turn four over the causeway and up the straight. And uh, his old mate John Adams in the identical model car really starting to hump along behind him. Of course, is uh, Gary Finemore and Mark Akuri, Vela, Mick Argento, Bell, Horn, Pizzavento rounding out the 14 currently on track for the big V8s. Putting themselves very, very nicely indeed. I think we see them again at round four when the Australian Sports Sound Association promotes the August round. And uh, they do a very, very nice job indeed. It's not just uh, Commodores and Falcons. Well, it kind of is, but not all of the same era. Across the board there, of course, Gary Finemore brings that beautiful XB coupe to the uh, to the scene as well. It's Brian Finn at the moment with three minutes left on the clock to Wheatley. Greg Lynch start a rear of field up to third now, trying to impress on the uh, front runners. David Hender, Arthur Van also Radcliffe, Adams, Mark Kukuri, Gary Finemore, and Vela rounding out our ten. Absolutely, yeah. It's good to see that uh, Vic V8s, as you say, round four, they normally end up on the sports, uh, end up on with the sports sedans. Uh, round four, sports sedans promote that event, so don't actually race at that one. So Vic V8s get their own track time. And it's really good to see that because they've brought such a big grid here this weekend, that uh, the MG Car Club said, you know what, no, we'll give you your own track time for this round as well. So two standalone rounds for them at uh, Sandown this year, which is really good to see does it mixes it up for them a bit there as well they travel uh, around and do different bits and pieces of various different series and uh, things like the HQs do sort of pick the ones they want to do and not do and uh, these guys do put on some fairly good racing Greg Lynch now has gone into P2 has taken Wheatley so uh, that gap is now 13 seconds a minute and a half remaining so essentially three laps more in this one is what we'll probably see. So uh, can he make up 13 seconds in those three laps? We'll wait and see. He's done, he's made up uh, 16 cars in in nine laps. So let's see what he can do over the next uh, couple of minutes. His last lap, the fastest lap of the race, 1.4 seconds faster than anybody else has done at any point in this race. That is quite remarkable. And he, uh, he did take pole position earlier on in the weekend by uh, over half a second, but it's, uh, it's all gone wrong since then, sadly, for Lynch. I'm glad to see at this point in time anyway, he is ending the, uh, what's been a turbulent weekend for him on a high. As we look back and see Horn in the uh, number 50 machine, it's been a uh, bit of a challenging day for him. Started off nicely yesterday, but Horn finds himself down in 14th position and holding off uh, Pesavento just behind in the number 42 machine as they head up the hill. Listen to those V8s roar past the camera. They send absolutely fantastic two laps to go. This is the penultimate lap of the motor race. As he flicks it into turn six in the rap studio looks great i don't think you can go wrong with a uh, black and green car i think you're right there the uh, the green really pops when it's combined with the uh the sort of i guess matte black looking kind of wrap there as well looks great but uh i really do like this uh xp gt coming down the straight there as well look great in the uh, melbourne's cheapest cars red livery i think this livery looks better actually the oh, way I'd they've agree. gone about it some the nice corporate colors that Mentone Premix have, and they've uh, 
uh, thought long and hard about the lines of the uh, the coupe, and they've done a brilliant job in bringing it to the track. Always looks to be in bucks, and, uh, and uh, Gary always presents a very, very nice car. For those that uh, missed earlier on, uh, we were talking about that car, and uh, yeah, that is the ex Eddie Awalnika Touring Car Masters machine. So yeah, a bit of history uh, in that car, as, as many of these cars do, of course as the two Falcons are back together once again. Oh, a bit of a lock-up from the 55 machine. But Adams certainly has some good pace. Fastest lap of his race so far. PB 119.4, second fastest car on the racetrack. So really coming home strong. Unlike Hender, who was a good couple of seconds at least slower last time through. And it looks like it's been similar again this time. Here comes Adams. Got a good run out of the corner. And last lap bought out, so got to make the move now. And is doing so up the inside down into turn number one. This is where he made the mistake earlier. Got on the dusty, dirty side of the road. And you can see the dust earlier, no dust there. And uh, as a result, had a bit more grip when he tipped it into turn number one and makes that move successfully. That's not good. Oh, oh. big air, huge air. That must have been a meter in the air. Slides it back out onto the racetrack. What car control, he's dragging all sorts of bits. I think that's an exhaust trailing behind. Crikey, is that an eventful race? He certainly has, and I'll tell you what, he is uh, challenging Luke Gretsch Gumbo for uh, how you uh, can fly a big, heavy V8 Aussie-built machine through the air there. Car number 16 now, just skating through our screens, and has done a fairly good job, has that Monday. And uh, the check and flag has been waved to Brian Finn, takes the win in the 3D outfit Groove Train Eastland stickers across the front of the car. Here comes Greg Lynch, who started from rear of grid. What a mechanical marvel after such a testing, trying weekend. Greg just uh, crawls across the line there. No hurry to get to the end of it. This guy is absolutely in a hurry. Wheatley in the third. <laughs> and uh, dragging still along. something dragging along behind there. Looks like some brake ducting, maybe. It's Wheatley to Dave Hender, Arthur Van Orso. Here we go. Oh, yeah, that's, that's huge. Big hit. And that's uh, incredible. stuff being torn out from underneath the car as well. So uh, if Luke Gretsch Gumbo is watching, he's probably having a bit of post-traumatic stress disorder after that one. <laughs> it sounds like a wedding car as it drives up the back straight, jingling along. That, uh, that was uh, quite a bit of air, and I think he's ripped everything off the car that was underneath it, in fruit, including a bit of a front splitter that came off and all sorts. So uh, lots of damage underneath that machine, which is a, a real shame because it's so nicely presented. It is brilliantly presented, and uh, the Vic V8s do, a, do do a tremendous job of presenting their cars as best they possibly can, and uh, a little bit of willing racing during that uh, particular particular event but uh, they've done well as Brian Finn brings the win home over Greg Lynch and you've got to say returning nicely and the, the well I guess the points at the end of the weekend are only 38 and the cars around him are 98 86 70 68 and uh, he's done the had the opportunity to go as much racing so he's going to be wondering what would have been out of this weekend if he could have finished all the races here it is confirmation on the uh, Vic V8's race three. Brian Finn, Greg Lynch, Aaron Wheatley, John Adams, David Hender, Arthur Ben also, David Ratcliffe, Mark Curry, Gary Finemore, Gary Vella. Fastest lap of the race to Greg Lynch on lap number 12, the last lap there. So he's done well there. Gary Vella rounding out our top 10. Greg Lynch fastest lap at a 116.8987. Vic Argento, Adam Cadeo, Nathan Bell, Mark Pesvento, Matt, Matt Horn. And Anthony Monday, our finishes in that race. Dan did not start, Brett Lehman and Luke Wall. Dan, thank you very much, mate. You've had a big old stint on air again today. Brilliant job uh, along the way for that. And still fantastic pictures we're uh, being delivered up by our cameraman and the broadcast team there as well. We have got HQs and historic touring cars coming up next. Back in a moment.
Welcome back, trackside, ladies and gentlemen. Cars heading back out on the track. We've still got four races left to go as the uh, cars start to appear down at turn one, two, and three. The difficult complex, clearly, cars in the Vic V8's been going to do some lawn mowing through there. The uh, lawn mowing contractors can stay away from that part of track. It's been looked after for by the competitors here this weekend. In fact, it's probably been the most visited bit of grass in Melbourne this weekend out there. Darren Smith here right alongside me for uh, the HQ race and the historic touring. He knows both equally as well and that is uh, Dave Amor. Welcome Dave back to uh, what is going to be a sensational uh, race three for the weekend for uh, your beloved HQs and the historic touring cars. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is going to be absolutely fun in the sun here at Sandown this afternoon. Um, we've got uh, 15 minutes of racing. That's when they come out of um, pre-grid to when they decide the last lap board comes out. So um, fantastic. It's good. We've got plenty of racing. We've got Group NC and B and also my beloved HQ Holden. So it'll be interesting. Magilton's gone back a long way. He put it on pole. He won the first race. He, and then in the second race, he put it into the sand trap down in Dandy Corner, so keep an eye on that. Thank you, Ty Power, for the major sponsoring of the HQ and all the other HQ competitors. Pedder Suspension, Kenda Ties, three-speed Holden, up over the top, doing around about 175 in kilometres. But the man himself, the man who's never won a race until the previous one, Steve Banks, the fastest plumber in HQs and 176, is going to try and make it do it again. Fantastic as well. Let's have a look at the grid now as the cars make their way very quickly around to the grid. Brent Trengove will be on pole in his Camaro to Adrian Moyle right alongside him there as well. There we go. The Chevrolet Camaro SS. Dominic Leo in a Camaro there for car number 84. Peter Mulliman, the first of the FOMO Co's out there as well. That's Fords to the kids at home. And uh, he is hoping it means first on race day. I can tell you the driver of car number 44. Nepean Welding, Ford Mustang, Peter Mulliman as we roll our way through the grid sheet now. It's Jeff Monday. He's also in a Camaro. Ray Hepburn out of Western Australia in the, uh, the, like the Mark type of uh, Mustang. Had a fueling history, had a fueling issue and an history yesterday. But it is history now for him as we tangle up my words beautifully there. Don Knight back to Bill Trengove, Luke Patterson in the mini, Pete Oliver, Brett Hodgkin, Andrew Baird, Leo Tobin coming from rear of the grid, as is Trevor Talbot. I didn't see Trevor out there, nor is Connor McLeod in his uh, pink Tirana as well. Here is our HQ grid, and we look about set to go as the cars have done a very, very rapid warm-up lap. Revs are rising. And away we go for the group of historic touring cars and they blast down a couple of Cortinas off the back of the grid there with uh, Andrew Baird and Brett Hodgkin. Have a look at this run up the inside here. This is a fantastic start right onto the back of the uh, black car there, which will be uh, the 25 of Ad Adrian Moyle. Started off the front row, being gazumped a little bit there by Dominic Leo. And this is how the field will come down through turns three and up to four. There's the 86 down the side there as well. And that's Andrew Baird. Great looking race car. Here's the HQs. Right oh, through turn one, we've got Banks, Ryan Woods. Oh, right on the outside there. Kenny Wright, CR. There is in the 13 car, we've got Tony Maloney. Now, don't forget, we have got Andrew Magilton and Glenn McDonald coming from the rear of the field. They're normally front front five, front six cars, ladies and gentlemen. So let's see how they groove themselves and get themselves back up into the top 10. But here we go, Banks, we've got Ryan Woods on the outside, Banks on the inside. Magilton's already got one, two, three, four cars already. The ready race car, Glenn McDonald, done a gearbox. Done a gearbox in race two as they start to come up over. Oh, door and door. Bumper to bumper. Look at that. Three, almost four wide, ladies and gentlemen. Up over the top. And this is the first time up over the top. We've got plenty of time. Banks has gone through. Woods has gone through. God, Magilton's right up into. I can't believe that. It's in fifth. Ryan Woods in number one car. Tony Maloney. 
And also going right through there is also Rebecca doing extremely well in the 36 car. The undercoat grey car, you could say. But fantastic. Good to see what's happening and what's going on now. Have a look at the front of this. The 25 car, the NC, he's got his mojo on. He's got it happening. And he's punched it back out in front by the looks of it. So um, he didn't have a real good start at all and through turn one, did he? I splashed a bit of mojo boy. on this morning as well, Dave. I didn't know whether you noticed my animal magnetism here in the commentary booth. So there's mojo going around all over the place at Sandown here this oh, weekend. OK. Get on it. Uh, yeah, psychedelic, right on maybe. It. That's it, that's it. Uh. Tringo leading the way from Muleman in the 43. Got a great start. Leo, Moyle and Baird. And uh, this is looking fantastic. What a great view outside. I guess that's the passenger side of the left hooking Camaro, isn't it? And yeah. uh, power down up onto the ripple strip. Bit of a bumpy old ride through there. But the charge out of the Camaro. There it is. That's what we're riding on board with. That one right there. The 86 there, and it's been a good ride with Andrew Baird. He's pushed his way up into P5 after starting off down in 11. So uh, he has certainly jumped away very, very nicely in the opening two laps of this race. So for just cars, the historic touring cars under brakes, the 25 grabs the 22, and it's Moyle getting Trengove in turn number one. Didn't really put up a fight for it, did the, uh, the blue-eyed monster there? The number 22 of Brent Trengove just opened it up and let it occur. Car number 25, Adrian Moyle. So the guy who just hit the lead of this race has been uh, hit with a five-second start infringement penalty. So right here, right now, Dave, he needs to get himself six seconds out in front so that penalty doesn't uh, change the race result. Yeah, that's for sure, mate. Now, you'd almost say he's, drive, he's driving it like he stole it, mate. Like, like, look at it. He's got a bit of damage on the front of it. It's, you know, he's going very, very quick and very, very fast. So I have to wait and see. Five seconds, yeah, it'll make a difference. Yeah, so that's uh, interesting as we're getting a good look at the bed again there as well. In the 86, here we go, back to the Qeys. And it's oh. car number one looking down the inside of the 176 of Steve Banks. And they're getting very racy with it up to turn four. Oh, he is. Oh, Ron Woods has gone round the outside on turn four, round the outside as they start to come up. Ryan Woods is in front of the banks. Then we've got Kenny Wright, and we've also got Andrew McChilton right behind him. Ready Rose Car, Glenn McDonald's had a really good run also. He's come from back of the field. So we've just been told that we've got five-second penalties for the, the first three cars off the starting grid, mate. Not the first three, but uh, those three cars there, which is going to be Adrian Moyle, it'll be Hepburn, and the number 64 of William Trengove with the Ooh, okay. uh, plus fives on the Just Cars leaderboard there from Blendline TV, keeping us right up to date with all the goings-on coming out of Race control. Moyle, of course, uh, need, will need to get six seconds out in front now so he can Looks claim like the Cortina. victory. Looks like we've got a Darren, coming underneath the, the bridge there. Looks like that was slowing down, so he'll probably get, try and get himself back to the pits. But have a look at this. Banks, he wants to be out the front. He wants to lead. Ryan Woods, the number one car. Number one because he won the championship last year, ladies and gentlemen. Then we've got Kenny Wright. We've also got Andrew McJilton coming right behind him. And also Tony Maloney in the 99 car. Mount Nurarat, Tony Maloney's trying to go down the inside. This will be interesting. Tony doesn't mind swapping just a little bit of green paint. Down through turn one. Here we go, turns two, three and four. Woods is back in front of Banks again. Banks has got plenty of horsepower. Keep an eye on Banks if he comes out clean at turn four. He'll pull up and he'll pass Ryan Woods. I can tell you that for a fact because he's got a little bit more mumbo under the bonnet up the top chute. Keep an eye on this. Banks is behind Woods. You see him come up over that little bit of the hill. You can see it up over the top there. Have a look at this. They're side by side. No, not quite at the moment. Banks has just come back in gently. Woods is at the front. Just getting a look at Ray Jardin at the back of shot there, the guy yep. that's had the engine out a couple of times over the last 12 months to try and uh, work out what's going on with it. A brand new engine, he was uh, certainly hoping for a bit of a gain, but it doesn't really look as though he's had the gain that he was trying to, to make so far. 
but uh, good to see Ray back on track and having a go at getting it right there again. So this is Baird again in the, uh, the 86. Doing a nice job there indeed in the uh, Camaro. It looks mint, this car. Absolutely magnificent. Behind at the moment is the, uh, the 68. And that's Jeff Monday just been around quite some time and knows, knows his way around the Victorian racetracks. That is for sure. But uh, Baird... Just looking the goods at the moment. This car looks brilliant, as they all do, don't they? The, uh, oh, yeah. the HQs and the historic touring cars, they really do go to a, the extra effort to make them look the part. Certainly is. As we're coming down the front chute, you can actually see that. Grandstand's off to your right. She's a pretty hard brake, 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 brake. Turn one, turn left fairly sharply. Oh, oh. here we go. It's happened. Milliman contact with the HQ. That's two classes getting tangled up. That shouldn't have happened. Now it's going to be a swap for position there. Baird gets, goes back on to Monday. That was a real shame, that magnificent Mustang. Getting tangled up with that HQ on the way through. The Mustang clearly the fasting ca faster car coming through. Up onto the ripple strip goes Baird. Got to have a bit of spatial awareness about ourselves here. Right, I've got a bit of a replay. He's coming down the... Oh, very, very tight. Yeah, he's, clipped, locked up. he's clipped the left-hand um, you know, corner there, which has then unsettled him straight into Kenner, the 66 guy. So he's showing a little bit of damage. You can see that there. So he had a, had a lock-up, lock Dave, into the corner there. So it was quite well. shallow in and locked up. And then once that happens, you lose all steering. And uh, basically a passenger sadly got mixed up with the HQ on there as well. And uh, Moyle just uh, waving to the uh, HQ as he goes past. Thanks for uh, getting out of the way. Certainly on with is, it. mate. God, he can certainly drive that thing in there. He's, he, he's given it everything and a little bit more. You can say that 25 car. There's Tony Maloney, the 99 car. Oh, yeah, smoking those Kenders. Smoking those Kenders, baby. The they 99 and the 87 both locking up in unison there. So no net gain for either of them. Car one leading the way here. It's Ryan Woods in the HQs to Steve Banks. Kenny Wright is doing an absolute drive of the uh, season, albeit it's only one day old. But he is doing a ripping job. Andrew McGilton, Glenn McDonald, and Tony Maloney. Certainly is. So I'm um, doing extremely well. The 13 car of Kenny Wright, brand new motor for this weekend. Ryan Woods has had a little bit. Look at this. Here we go. Banks. Banks trying to go around the outside. Woods is trying to make his car very, very wide up over the top. We're just waiting on Tony Maloney, the Ready Rose car there. And Jilton is up into fourth position for the HQs, doing extreme. Ray Jardine's all of a sudden caught onto the back of the Ready Rose car, which is really good. You know, Ray's had a very lot of bit of bad luck, mate, over yes. the last 18 months. Yeah. And uh, he's disappointed with himself. And I said, Ray, have you touched it? No. So what's wrong with it? Oh, it's not quick enough. Well, mate, we can blame everything, but if you're not pulling the head off it and, and changing the diff and everything else like that, it comes back to racecraft. Now have a look at this. The HQs, single file down the down the front chute. They look Overstar for, finish line. Look for Dom Leo as he just comes charging past on uh, the right-hand side of the drivers there. He just took the line straight down the outside. So uh, that's nice to see the HQs not tangling oh. up with the historic touring cars. But this, Dave, is a race for the ages going tight, up at Ron Real. Slice of cheese between Banks and Woods, or two coats of paint, whatever you want to call it. Ladies and gentlemen, through turns three and four. Banks, the plumber in front. Support number one, beautiful HSD, or HSD, yes. That's Eddie Woods there for all your cylinder heads. But have a listen to this, Darren. Have a listen to this baby on board. It's a screaming match, isn't it, really? There goes the HQ. It's going to be interesting across the top here. Draw alongside, get through. There's the wall starting to open up now. Bang, left-hander, aim at it. Straight up to the back of uh, Monday as they wiggle their way down up over the ripple strips as the uh, touring cars often do. Staying off that one. He just gets up on a bed there as well. So that'll cost him just a tad of time getting out of that corner. But uh, avid, avid competition here as well. And they are making every lap count. They certainly are. As you can see, 
We've got coming into pit lane just there on the right, but he's going to stay on the left. I hope he does. There we go, down the chute. You'll see the start finish line right about there. Oh, here we go. This is a bit interesting. Chad Monday. He cut his nose off. Little Cortina there, it's going down the inside. This will be interesting. Who's got the better brakes? Monday got has got track position in that one, Dave. Oh. Track position just in front can sweep yep. across and he reclaims his own piece of the racing track. No one gets through there without uh, coming off and doing something silly. Keep it all in single file. Now it's all about power down. Runs it really, really wide there past the sports bet signs. And we make our way up the back straight again here as the uh, Cortina continues on. Yep, Steve Banks right behind Steve Banks Rollers. Andrew Magilton's up into third. Ladies and gentlemen, back up into third. Car 14, the Amidis car, absolutely fantastic. Back up into third, keep an eye on him. They are mates, one and 14 are mates. They came together, done the four hour together in the 14 car and blew everyone away, even the New South Wales guys. They were a team that just came together, grouped together and won a race, well, sorry, Saturday and Sunday, which put together, you win the four hour race up there at Winton, which is our, our sort of like mini Bathurst, long race. One minute left in this the last competition laps for the hqs and the historic touring cars for round number one of the triple eight home loans victorian state circuit racing championships if you've got any issues with your home loan or you just want a health check give the team at triple eight home loans a call tell him you heard us heard us talking about it on the uh, blendline tv broadcast for round one of the victorian state circuit racing championships and i'm sure they'll look after you better than well, I'm not sure there's better than anyone else, but they'll certainly look after you. The Just Cars, historic touring cars, continue on at the moment. It's Moyle with a handy half a second lead now as the car number 80, is it? Just jumps out of the way in the HQs there. Yeah, he certainly is. But we've got to remember, mate, that's only half a second. He's got a five-second penalty. So he really needs to get, you know, up and going. Well, at the way. moment, it'll put him in third because third position is uh, 24 seconds behind. We've got two laps to go. This is uh, our penultimate lap. Oh. Out, out the dirt with the HQs. That was Banks. That was Banks sort of taking a bit of dirt there. But have a look. Ryan Woods is in front of Banks. Now it's also Magilton is trying to go around the outside. No, Woods decided to block his own teammate. Oh, oh here we go. Oh! Have a look at this, 14, right across the front nose of Banks there, up over the top. Ladies and gentlemen, that's 175, 178 kilometres and a HQ Holden. She's a four-door, single carby, three-speed, over the top. You don't back off, you can't afford to back off, or someone will go down the inside of you. Or, or into the back of you when you're that close, if you have a back off at all. Here we go, this is it. What oh. magic stuff in the HQ field for tyre power here this weekend. Rainy Champ comes out with the goods there. And we go back onto the uh, the main straight as they start their last lap of this distance. There's Peter Milliman in the 43 Mustang. Charging back up through the field after a bit of a coming together. Still not really sure I'm ahead how that all, start, all transpired, but it certainly did. The tyre power field start to weave their way through turns one, two, oh, three, and four. Oh, number geez. one, hippie, hippie, shake, Ryan Woods. Oh. The old egg wheel left and right, left and right. He's still gathering it up in car one. Still gathering up. I think his teammate, I think he tapped his teammate to try and straighten him up between, between turns one and two. But now he's lost a little bit of momentum. He's back to third. Now McChilton, rear field for the HQs, is now leading the HQs. Adrian Moyle has done the fastest lap out in front of oh, the uh, entire field here in the historic touring cars. And uh, he does have a five second penalty hanging over his head, as does car number 64, William Trengo. And uh, that's a check and flag there for it those is, guys. Popping the line. So let's see where uh, they all start to finish and we'll cleanse the field. So Moyle will go back to P2. Brent Trengove will take the race win, and then everyone else will remain the same. Dominic Leo into P3, Baird into four, Monday into fifth. 
Right, oh, here we go. The HQ is coming on to the front straight. Can Banks do anything? No, Magilton. Magilton is showing at least one and a half car lengths for the HQ Holmes. Magilton, we've got Banks. I'm just trying to work this out, ladies and gentlemen. And then we've got Ryan Woods and also Kenny Wright there. So he'd be fairly happy with that. I'm just trying to see the Ready Rose car. Ready Rose car is in eighth. Tony Maloney, sorry, in sixth. Maloney's in fifth. Ray Jardine, be quite happy with that. Yeah, he's a little bit off the pace, but the car is still running. It's still running, and he's back out going racing again rather than hanging around in the pits and watching That's everyone right. go about it. He's got to fine tune it, mate. Yeah. The driver never blames himself, only blames the tools. And we know there's nothing wrong with the tool. <laughs> so, there we go. Controversy or not there by uh, Dave Amor. Brent Trengove takes the, the line honours, but I'm going to say not the win at this point. That will go to Moyle, then Dominic Leo. But the round points, importantly, Brent Trengove over Moyle, over Dominic Leo is where it will sit for the historic touring cars. In the race, though, Monday home in fifth, Willeman in sixth after a coming together with Trengove in seven, Knight, Aaron, uh, Don Knight in uh, eighth, and Jilton, the first one home in the HQs, the Banks, Woods, Knight, Maloney, Donald, Jardine, and Riches. And the cars stream their way back to the pit and paddock area. David Amel, thank you so much for your time. As always with the HQs, always fantastic to have your insight into uh, how the HQs go about making their speed. Look, thank you very much, the HQ Association. I'd like to thank the MG Car Club, Sandown Racetrack, and all the officials and everyone that's been here all weekend. Thank you so very, very much. So we, this is the official results now. Brent Trengove into P1, Moyle into 2, Dominic Leo, Baird, Monday, Milliman, Trengove, Knight, Magilton, Banks, Rounding out our 10, Adrian Moore, although being relegated a spot, did get the fastest lap of the race on a 122.18. And what a fantastic event that has been. And I will echo the thoughts of David Amor. A big thanks to the MG Car Club and, of course, the staff here at Sandown Raceway for keeping such a magnificent facility alive and well. Your trackside here at the Triple Eight Home Loans, round number one for the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championship for 20. 24 next on track is the mg and invited british cars we'll be back in just a moment
Welcome back trackside here. This is what I love about State Series racing. We go from one finish to another race start and the next battle lines itself up, ready to go. Now look, in a decade or so ago, you would say that the MG and invited British racing cars could be blamed for putting on demonstration type racing. It hasn't been the way for about the last four years. And I blame the TV cameras pointed at them. I reckon these guys like the reflection of themselves. Back off the lens, I'm, uh, I'm talking with Sean Herlihy, who's joined me here. And uh, there's something about the, uh, the personality of an MG racer. They, they like the reflection of their highly polished racing machines, don't they? Oh, indeed, Darren. The, uh, the passion tends to come out on the racetrack. The, uh, the red mist descends and, uh, and, and it's all go. Certainly is, and we've got some pretty fast cars sitting on this front row, as it has been all weekend long. Phil Chester blew into Melbourne again this weekend to uh, sit on the front row of the grid and uh, show us how to race his MG B GT V8, the Monty Power entry, and he's done a pretty good example of doing that this weekend all along. Richard Milligan alongside in car number 10, and that has been a, a momentous moment for the Victorian state race series he is uh, certainly um, acquitting himself very very well in a very famous car that was raced here a lot by a South Australian so great to see Michael Trathan and no Gary Bulmer. No Gary Bulmer this, uh, this afternoon unfortunately he's had to withdraw a few blank spots on the grid this afternoon not not untypical of MGs having to uh, withdraw from a weekend after the heat and uh, the abuse that these cars take but uh, nevertheless, uh, behind him, we would have had Rodney Wells, who I believe is out there today. Uh, and uh, very closely behind him, Chris Gidney and Hank Swadavine, followed by Tony Volibrant and uh, Greg, Gary Grip Gibson in the old TR6. Beautiful little car, that one. And uh, behind him, we've got Adam Aliff, who is back out there, followed by Peter Rose and Jim Dodd, closely behind him. And again, behind those lot are basically the withdrawals. Unfortunately, Danny Siama having to withdraw after that last race for a minor incident with the wall up the top of the hill. And uh, uh, Shirley, excuse me, St John Cox has, uh, has also had a bit of an issue with her engine and withdrawn as, as well as Jason Edwards, Simon Elliott and David Montrum. Yeah, real shame, but this is uh, what sort of happens at the end of a weekend of long racing here at the home of Horsepower. So much part of this lap is, at, is wide open throttle and that does demand a lot from the mechanical package. Here's a couple of guys on the front row of this grid that are demanding a lot from themselves, each other and the field behind them as Phil Chester gets beaten off the line for the first time this weekend by a car that knows how to lead races here at Sandown and Richard Milligan getting his head wrapped around what is underneath the, uh, the number 10 here. But uh, Phil Chester to be just cruising up to turn one that time around. Yeah, it looks like he probably got a bit of wheel spin off the line and uh, just allowing Richard to, to follow the first lap through. How Again. hard would it be to not when you get wheel spin in that car, not to just leave your foot in it and just leave a couple of the number 11s down the race? Oh, it would be hard, wouldn't it, Darren? Yeah. I reckon I'd stick it flat and just hold on. <laughs> just let the tyres do their thing or all they blow up. That's right. <laughs> before you hit the turn one, but uh, certainly from Chester, that's a brilliant car, as, as the, all of them. I'm not going to be discriminating against them, but Michael Trathen at this point in time, he's got some work to do. He's uh, in the number one. He's been sort of left behind a little bit there at the moment. As yeah. these guys get on with it at the front. Yeah, Phil will, Phil will be really putting the pressure on, on uh, Richard here. I reckon he'll, uh, he'll really make him work for that win, but uh, we'll see what, what happens down the front straight when the power comes onto it. Good to see Richard having a bit of a lead of the, of the race every now and then, though. Again, this car is, as you say, not, not unfamiliar to be out front. And uh, R Richard's uh, definitely doing well in this car this weekend. And uh, he, he actually runs a nice classic car workshop up in, uh, in Bayswater, I believe, uh, looking after these old things. So, again, not, not unfamiliar with the old MGs. Yeah, this is a good run here. The, uh, the car does look brilliant and it has done for its entire racing life that we've, uh, we've all been enjoying it. Phil Chester now right into the, the rear wing. A couple of cars with massive rear wings. I do not think they were ever intended to have on board, but uh, obviously work very well and they're just just inside the confines of the bodywork, aren't they? Just indeed, yeah. Look, a lot of, lot of strength goes into these chassis to make them work the way that these two have, uh, have been built with, with you know, upwards of 500 horsepower. Again, Phil really putting the pressure on Richard, making him, making him work for it. We'll see what happens up the back straight here as, uh, as Phil opens up the, the big V8. Drives on by, that's what happens. Richard Milligan notices the gap in the air, drops him behind the 72. And the multi-power blue MGB GT V8 
goes into the lead of the race on lap number two. 12 minutes remaining. And uh, I get the feeling now that Richard Milligan's not going to let Phil just slide away with it. The look on his face as he leant into that corner at Dandenong Road was, yep, I'm not going to lose sight of you, pal. I'm going right with you. Bit of a note across the bottom of the screen for un uninterrupted coverage. Go to glenline.tv forward slash live on YouTube and you'll be able to continue with uninterrupted to watch it. If you are watching via Facebook, you will get interruptions throughout uh, throughout the day and you can certainly engage with us at www.vsrs.com and uh, we'll love to have a conversation with you also via our social media channels there it is vsrs.com.au for the official website as uh, the lead has changed yeah f fair bit off the pace these two at the moment uh, they sh should be doing a good three or four seconds a lot quicker than they are at the moment so look i'd say phil's just having a bit of fun there letting things warm up nice and slow and uh, see how he gets on later in the race maybe they're just like the rest of us sean just wilting a little bit in the heat Oh. It, the, the temperature's still only 25 degrees, but it feels substantially warmer than that, doesn't Look, it? Look, I reckon that, that track temp would be up around the 40, yes. 50 degree mark. Sure. And uh, as you say, that, that really takes a bit of toll on the tyres at the end of a weekend. And again, being an MG, you, you do have to uh, nurse these things through a weekend, despite of the uh, engineering that's gone into them. There's the official weather, 23.6, 57% humidity. humidity. South southwest uh, direction of the wind at 9.6 kilometres an hour. An officially cloudy day. From where I am, it is an exceptionally clear blue sky for Melbourne. Yeah, no, we've definitely had the weather put on this weekend as we see Rod Wells just go over the top of the hill there in front of Chris Gidney and uh, Tony Volibrid. Well, our leaders side by side across the line there as we get a good look at this battle here with Wells, Gidney and Volibrid there. Yeah, it's interesting watching these guys because Rod's, give you a bit of an idea, Rod Wells, that little midget, it, it is running a modern MG Rover K-Series engine, as are those two ZRs behind him. So very similar paced uh, cars on track when it comes down to it, but completely different cars when they come, come to the basics. Yeah, I guess it's a, a modern engine put into an older... Um, older car, mm. but the two cars behind with their designated production engines on board. Yeah, bang with, on. A, with a with a good tune on board. Of oh, course. a little bit, a little bit tweaked, I'd say, Darren. Just for racing, a few forged bits have gone into those ones. As uh, Chris almost takes a look up the inside of Rod there into turn one. Doesn't quite it's a make a long it. way back though. Is he going to have was. to do the big hull, Mary? Oh, I think he's just putting off. the pressure on Rod, really making him work for that. He'd feel the pressure too. They're sitting sitting uh, fairly exposed uh, in the the number 60. Well, I suppose the great thing about this car is that 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 frontal area is is very small compared to the ZRs behind. Oh, they're pushing quite a, quite pushing a lot a of air through the air. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, look, it's great to see Rod back out. He has has had a bit of time off the last uh, probably 12, 18 months and uh, having a chat to him after qualifying, uh, seeing how the arms were feeling after a big hard drive. He's, uh, he was definitely feeling it, but great to see him out there doing so well. Phil Chester's pulled out a handy lead of four seconds over that last lap, and indeed it was on that last lap, a 117.8 for him and a 122 for Richard Milligan. So uh, Phil has just opened up the tap on that last lap. And uh, I'm starting to feel a little bit inevitable here for uh, Wells because Chris Gidney and Tony Volibrecht are poised for uh, a manoeuvre here. Oh, any mistake will uh, open the door for those two. So hopefully Rod can keep it, keep it in a straight line and bring it home. Now, Sean, you were saying uh, Danny Siamo did, uh, has got a bit of bit of damage on board the MG GT V8 as well. We're to the point where is you've already got it back in the workshop. Yeah, look, unfortunately got caught up with a bit of oil on track there at the top of the hill and uh, and slipped his way into the wall. A uh, bit, bit unfortunate for Danny, but look, uh, no doubt he'll, we'll get that sorted out and get it fixed, get him back on track before the end of the year. Great to see uh, the wheel work going on inside uh, the Wells car there. The lack of roof and windows, you can see the hands up up right up the right angles of the uh, the windows, almost like the the next category we've got on track next Formula Fords. You can see exactly how much lock they're pouring on them when the the hand goes past 90 degrees and starts to pull it around to 180. You know you got a fair whack of lock being pulled on. Yeah, it looks looks a little bit cool, calm and collected there, Rod. But uh, no, nah, look, I'd say he's been absolutely steering the hell out of this thing, <laughs> trying to keep in front of these two modern ZRs. I'd say they'd have a little bit more power, but like, as you say, a bit more weight and a, a little bit less aerodynamics. It's uh, it makes for a bit of a dice. It does. Well, they're just giving it a bit of a seesaw action on the wheel to tip it in at the top of the hill, which can be a bit of a, a confidence booster. See what sort of uh, grip you've got under you. 
decent set of slicks on the uh, Sebring front of MG there as well. So uh, you should have plenty of grip. Who knows how old those slicks are, though. That's uh, That can be the, the weighing story, can't it? Yeah, indeed. Look, they're probably not brand new. But, no, look, Rod's doing very well either way to uh, to be, be keeping in front of these two. Look, the midget, is, as I said, uh, I think in the earlier race today, you know, the, well, he's definitely got weight on his side. But, uh, you know, getting that power down in a nice little car like that, uh, I think you need a big sticky slick to, to get it all down. Talking about that, just up the road from uh, Rodney at the moment is Mike Tratton, car number one, the reigning champion, and rightfully so. Just uh, consistently getting results out of every single race and being able to pounce on the uh, front runners when something does go wrong. At the moment, I'm not feeling as though there's a whole lot going on, going wrong either for uh, Phil Chester and or Richard Milligan, only that uh, Rich not being able to quite match the pace of the, uh, the Monty Power outfit there of Phil Chester. It's about to continues on, and we're talking about fourth, fifth, and sixth on the road. There goes Mike Trathen just disappearing out of shot in P3. Looks like he's having a bit of a Sunday drive, uh, Mike, out there in, in no man's land, but I'm sure he's having a bit of fun with himself. Punching out 130s out of a 1.3 litre is uh, a pretty good day in the sun, isn't it? Not, not, a, bad, not a bad little steerer, Mike. No, he's done very well. Again, there's a reason he's uh, won two championships the last two years. So it'd be, see, it'd be great to see him uh, you know, get close to that this year. But look, you never know what happens in, throughout a year of racing when, uh, uh, as we've seen today, you know, all sorts of incidents can, can have a play to part in the, uh, the, the overall championship for the year. So, well, after round one, uh, you know, Phil Chester's definitely going to be up there. But uh, it'll be interesting to see what Mike can do for the rest of the year. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I had a couple of um, fans down there just chatting away and one of them said to me, why is it that the, the Trathan car did win the championship? It's, it's simple. Finish every race, finish on the podium and uh, one of the others just has to trip up along the way or not run up to a round and there's number one on the side of your car nah, before you know it. That's simple. On. It is indeed. Consistency <laughs> is key, Darren. I, I wish it was that simple. <laughs> yeah, but it is consistency. Yeah. Finish every race, drag points in. Indeed, yeah. Look, we, we have a, a point structure in the MGs that, that does basically allow for, for any car to win dependent on, on other competitors and, and other class uh, class competitors in the sense. So, look, it's a really good category in that sense that, that, that it is, as you've seen, you know, we've got a, a, a v, an open V8 run and you know, generally 117s around Sandown uh, hasn't won the championship for two years so you know it's great to see a little midget winning the championship yet again it, it, it happened probably five ten years ago ten fifteen years ago uh, but it's great to see him back out there running number one yeah and it's not easy these cars need uh, constant uh, attention they need their blood pressure taken on a daily basis oh, dear. they need their emotions uh, talked to and uh, kept in check don't they well look being that he's or running is that a, the drivers a bit of both i'd say <laughs> Darren, yeah, in that sense but look being that he's running a bmw engine i, I would have thought the bmw reliability came into it but uh, you know you got the worst of both worlds there being mg and bmw <laughs> but uh, no look mike's done a brilliant job he's, he's a bit of a spanner man himself and he's he's predominantly done 99 percent of that work on that car himself so, again, huge credit to him to see him out there uh, again running around in I, third. I don't think Mike would be disgruntled with me if I said he's quite the boffin when it comes to getting this car going fast. No, nah, brilliant, brilliant engineer. You know, yeah. It's it's, uh, it's nice enthusiastic. chatting. enthusiastic. Indeed, yeah, very positive uh, being. So. Here comes Phil Chester now. He's got those Le Mans flashes on. I think they're being used up at Mount Panorama now that it's pouring down rain in the 12-hour uh, the up there this weekend. We hope all the competitors are... Uh, safe and sound up there because it can be a bit of a treacherous place in the rain but Phil Chester got the safety lights on just letting everyone know that yes car number 72 that's why they're waving the blue flags at you is uh, coming on through he does show great manners in fact when he is coming through the field Phil he doesn't just come up behind them and uh, blow the doors off them. having said that that's what he's about to do to these guys yeah. but they've got their own race and he's quite respectful of that he just comes uh, easing his way through there as well there's no setting lap records when you're uh, in involved in being gazumped in the traffic. Not at all, but despite that, Darren, he's actually uh, stretched the, the, the lead to, to Richard Milligan out to a bit nearly 16 seconds. So, yeah, great to see Phil getting stuck into it again, and, uh, and off he went. Wow, I'll tell you what, though, uh, we've only got two and a half minutes left in this race, and that has absolutely zipped by. So the MG and invited British cars, like they've done over the last two seasons, and I'm mean, convinced that they can see themselves in the TV lenses. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get necked on the way out of here tonight, aren't I? Not at that? all. No, I reckon that's <laughs> I reckon that's a driving factor now with when it comes to paint and panel. I, I reckon guys are starting to paint their cars a bit brighter just for that blend line coverage. <laughs> so uh, you know, bring it on, guys. Bright green, bright orange, bright yellow. 
That's what it's all exactly about. right. Bright LED lights flashing as you're coming up on the traffic. Old Hollywood Phil Chester as he comes through. Well, Chris looks like he's going to have a bit of a go here. He with the rod. He's slowly edged closer and closer for the last few laps. Doesn't quite get alongside him, but he's really put he's the in, pressure on there. He's in the distance. He's in the in the zone now, isn't he? Yeah. He can certainly pounce. Again, big brakes on these ZRs for what they are. Again, fairly light shell, but uh, yeah, very well broken. So if if Chris has it, any chance, he'll he'll give it a red hot go. I'd say. Gee, have a look at this. He's well and truly in the zone there. And interestingly enough, he hasn't left Tony Volabrek behind either. Tony's just going completely and utterly with him at the moment. There's Richard Milligan ranging up in the background. Will he have an opportunity in the next minute and 29 seconds to catch them? Now, there's the Lucas headlights we like. Just a little bit of oranging uh, dullness to them there as well. Not yeah, the Richard's, LED effect. Rich has definitely got the candles uh, lit on the front of the V8 today. Sealed beams <laughs> off the front. Just quietly, Darren, the, uh, some of this footage is sensational that we're seeing on Blendline today. It's uh, Some of these uh, extra views we've got are, are just impressive, so it's great to see. Stepping up is the uh, the crew down there at our production company that brings us all of our pictures right around the world. And uh, really, it literally is right around the world. People enjoying the pictures we're coming out. Look, it can often be a, a bit of a click and mistake and just get onto something. But when you do see some of these international viewers that click by mistake and they stay for an hour and a half, it's not a mistake, is it? Not at all, no. You're there to watch. Here we go. Richard will just wind through the back markers here and uh, find his way through the field. To be fair, these guys aren't actually back markers now. This is middle of the field. <laughs> True. Uh, our leaders are starting to range up on. 29 seconds left on the clock, so we'll get an extra lap on top of that. And Phil Chester's just gone over the line to uh, take the last lap board as we come to the end of our uh, race three for MG Racing. Again, great shot. Look at that. You can see his hands and the power come on. A bit of opposite lock, a bit of a correction there which is always going to happen when you start to pour on that sort of horsepower and a light uh, light and chassis. Here's our race leader, car number 72, Yarra Valley towing, Monty Power, entry of Phil Chester. And uh, this guy certainly lifted the bar along with his great mate Vince Cacciato with the green car, which we've, uh, I think it's probably been sold by. It has it? actually, that, that car, just a bit of inside information, it has been changed hands and uh, hopefully we see it later on in the year. The, the, the gentleman who's bought it uh, has expressed that he'd like to come MG Racing in it, so it would be awesome to see that back out. Here we go, Phil Chester, last lap. Still got the flashes on there. So yeah, that'll be interesting. That was a menacing looking car in that olive drab military sort of uh, looking colour compared to the, the bright blue here of um, of uh, Phil Chester's car. But boy, they were a sight. Throw Robin Bailey in the mix with the black car with that massive bonnet bulge. And uh, that was a, a heyday of uh, MGB GT V8 racing. Absolutely a heyday of it. And Phil just uh, loves to get behind the wheel of this car. And it really is an expression of himself as well, isn't it? Uh, gets out there and just wants to go fast. Yeah, it is indeed. Look, Robin Bailey was chatting to earlier. Actually, he's, he's on on the uh, on the mend. In that sense, the car's getting its final bits and pieces to come back out. So we should see that car uh, yet again throughout the year. Phil Chester just uh, dropping in behind there, the uh, the midget going on through there. Is he just going to let this car get an extra lap in at the end of the race and just follow him through to the line? Yeah, nice cool down lap for Phil. He'll uh, be uh, winding this one back just ever so slightly. Allow, as you say, allow some of those uh, those midfielders to, to get that last lap in. <laughs> he's given him the hurry on, isn't he? <laughs> well, at least he's turned well, the he's, lights off. And he's waved him on through too. He's given him the go <laughs> wide. Go, I'll, I'll open up the track for you. And he's like, no, nah, have another lap, mate. Go go for it. Uh, but this is what sportsmanship's all about. You know, look, Phil doesn't need to open it up and try and get a lap record on the last lap. Just wind, wind it back slowly and, uh, and allow some of these guys to finish their race nicely. I mean, motors across the line there. Enjoys that checkered flag wave to him as uh, we continue on with this one, get another lap. In the end, Richard Billigan, I guess, uh, to the fact that Peter just slowed down for the last four or five corners there, the lap, the uh, win was by 8.42 seconds. And uh, we have got the entire field just streaming across the line. Now there's car number one, Mike Trathen home in P3. Rodney Wells, who had a... Very patient. Christopher Gidney and Tony Volabrek in his mirrors the entire race long. And uh, looks like we're going to a replay. Ah, oh, here it is. These two are getting willing, are they? <laughs> oh, Tony oh. having a real good go there, locking it up. Just overcooking it into Dandenong Road there. 
Great Triple Eight Home Loans replay from uh, Blendline TV. And uh, watching our field coming, streaming on through to uh, finish off this one. Yeah, that's it uh, for MGs from round uh, round one for the Vic State Racing Series. Is that Johnny Makem coming to the line? That is our, cl our our category captain. Yes, indeed, John Makem. Were you going to say Fat Controller? <laughs> not at all. No, not either was I. Not from my mouth. No, not at all. Absolutely, I am not going to get out of the property tonight without a black eye, am I? And yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. We're, we're actually off to uh, Tail and Bend for the next round of our of our season. So uh, uh, running uh, at Tail and Bend in May, and uh, we'll be back for the Vic State race, I believe, for round four. Fantastic. So there is the final results. Phil Chester, Richard Milligan, Michael Trathan, Rodney Wells, Chris Gidney, Tony Wallabrecht, John Makem, Jason Edwards, Pete Rose, Adam Ayliff across the line there as well. James Dodd, the last of our uh, of our finishes there for the MG and invited British cars. Sean Hurley, thank you so much for your time throughout this weekend. Um, love and wishes to uh, Danny Siama and his car and the uh, getting it ready for uh, the next time it hits the track there as well and uh, really appreciate your expert coverage Sean. thank no, you so much no thank you Darren you, you've done a ripper job up here and uh, again massive thank you to the blend line team and, and all the officials and, and all the people behind the scenes that make these events happen yeah, it really is a, a virtual uh, community, isn't it? Well, not even a virtual community. It's a real community. Yeah. It really is that keep uh, these events going. It's motorsport, it's grassroots racing, and it's everyone just wanting to go to the racetrack, isn't oh, it? Oh, that's right. And a lot of these competitors, they just love going back onto YouTube and, and, and watching the race, reliving that, that weekend off in a sense. And, uh, John and just, just make delivering a horse's head to me during the week, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway... Great to have John back on track. We should say that too. He had a little bit of time away from the track, so uh, fantastic to see him out there. And I'm just hoping he's brought his sense of humour with him this weekend. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, John. We'll have a quick break, and we will be back. We've got two more races still to go: Formula Fords and saloon cars. And let me tell you, don't go away because they are going to give us plenty of action. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back trackside here. Without too much further ado, the Formula Fords are already, already halfway up the back straight. I'm Darren Smith, Paul Zitti, category expert, race driver, and all-round nice guy of uh, Australian motorsport has joined me here in the commentary booth. Paul, let's get this one underway. Absolutely. Let's run does. through the grid sheet. Yeah, sure. K Cody Mains Ruddy, by virtue of two wins, uh, is uh, starting the last race from pole position. Well-deserved Jack Bussey. Uh, and Eddie Bezik and Daniel Frugus will round out the top two rows. Behind them, Bailey Collins and Lachlan Strickland from Will Lowing and Jamie, uh, Jamie Rowe. Uh, then we have Lachlan Evanet, Imogen Radburn rounding out the 10. Ethan Fitzgerald all the way from South Australia and Carly Fleming in your top 12. 
Liam Loikono and Zach Lobko, uh, followed by Logan Everly and Fraser High in his spectrum with a new clutch on board. Jack Wynack rounds out the Duratec cars. Then we have the Formula Ford 1600s. Richard Davison, two wins as well, pole for Formula Ford 1600. Behind him, Andrew, or alongside him, will be Andrew Torty. Uh, then lining up on the second row, Gavin Dumas and Mark Zellner, followed by Jared Hurst, Adrian Wilkinson, James Hagen in the Van Diemen RF86, Malcolm Coleman and Phil Marinon in that beautiful old Galloway round out your overall grid. He does keep that Galloway up in tip-top shape, doesn't he? Uh, Phil Marinon does the whole big series in the Ken Engine cars and does a uh, ripping job, always presents it very, very nicely indeed. I reckon we've got a field of Formula Fords that are red-hot, rip-roaring, ready to go here. Paul and uh, we are looking forward to the start here. It's a bit of an interesting camera angle here. As, uh, as you can see, it's moving around a little bit there, but that's uh, on a wire running between uh, the front of the grid right down to the middle of the grid there. So it gives us a bit of a unique perspective of uh, well, at least the second row of the grid. We don't get to see the front row. There we have we the head-on shot. Yep, it's revs are rising. And Cody Mains, Rutty, and that's a long hold again today. Boy, yeah, we had some they go. long holds. Great start, great jump by Mains, Rutty. What was the second phase of uh, Cody's start like? And it looks like it has been another textbook start from Cody Mains, Rutty. He will hold that position into turn one. Now let's see how the field settles down behind them. Yeah, Jack Bassey, also a good start, holds on to two. I say good start to hold on to your position because it's such a long run from the start down into turn one in Formula Ford that the, the draft actually comes into play even off the start. So. Ethan Fitzgerald, 56, getting loose through the one and two there in the work zone. Green car there as well. This is the uh, shot out of turn number four. None of these Formula Fords running wide this time around, but I can guarantee before the end of this race they will be and this is uh, going to be an interesting run at the top of the hill here. The field fans out. Gaines Ruddy comes under fire now from Jack Bussey. Holds on in the number 69. Does very well to do so. The 74 logs in behind. The 27 always, always, always carries a lot of pressure. That's Alan Jones' world championship number. And Casey Stoner's world championship number. It's a brave driver that fronts up with number 27. Indeed it is, but but doing it quite well at the moment. Hanging in there in, in fourth position and right in there as we keep talking about the, the slip screen makes such a difference in these Formula Ford racing cars. So we'll see how the field settles down over the opening laps. That's a drone shot, I believe, and fantastic footage coming to us courtesy Blendline TV. We've got uh, a defensive line there from Cody Mains ready saying, you want to pass me, uh, Jack? Let's see if you can go around the long way. Jack n covering off to make sure he doesn't leave that gap open as he did in the second race, first race today. And that allowed Edison to, to get through on him. Great to see Eddie Bezik playing in on this one as well. Now it's about time you need to start applying some pressure to this uh, front end of the field. Eddie and really start to uh, work them over very, very hard. Got some good experience on and the car number 31 just sitting back there in P3. Comes out of the stream now. The 74 joins him late on that as well, which is Jack Bussey. But none of them being able to make any impression on Cody Mains. Oh, there's a bit of a touch of the contact there. And he basically gets uh, the oh, big touch like a up. couple off by the looks of that one. The first one, I think, was a bit no harm, no foul. The second one, I think, maybe still a bit balked. <laughs> and uh, that that's how that happens. You, well, you charging down that hill fully committed someone props where you don't expect them to we're now we're not out on the prince's highway where you're meant to leave five cars gap and be able to respond right this is this is racing so i think the stewards will look at that for what it is i, I totally agree with you if you uh if you look at a gap and you think you can fill it have a red hot go and then uh if it doesn't look like you can then you've got to take an evasive action after that but uh certainly very willing this is there's nothing new about this sort of Formula Ford racing. It is, uh, if you want the spot, you've got to go out there and get it. No one's going to open the door and lay you in. And has gone back to spot on this, this lap around and needs to apply the low torch onto the back of uh, Frugus there as well. That uh, front group, it's a big operating pack at the moment. There's about 10 or 11 cars in that front pack there in the, what would be the Duratec field. 
And here we go back to uh, a couple of Ken engines. Some cars. of these magnificent looking Formula Ford 1600s. I said it earlier, if you are out here, take the time to go and have a look at them. Beautifully presented. The owners have uh, put a lot of work into restoring them to their former glory. And some of them much, much better condition than they ever looked you back in the day when they were racing, that's for sure. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? Those things, you look at championship cars and everything on them is of effect. And it's not until they hit a restoration phase that people start to look at those uh, things that, that uh, are more aesthetic, I guess. And uh, if, it's, uh, if you're running in a championship and it means you can put a new set of tyres on rather than touch up some paintwork, guess what you get? New every set of tyres. Every time. We've got a yellow flag being waved on the back straight. I just caught a glimpse Ooh. of Oh, there's a bit of airtime there. Time there. there. Between Radburn and, oh, sorry. Was that Imogen? Number 29. And a 48. 48 there uh, is uh, Jamie, Jamie Rowe. Rowe. And oh, Jamie Rowe goes round. That was a difficult one to call. Away from that, and that's looking okay. It looks like he's out of harm's way right there. Well, that's a good few hundred metres of a racetrack that was uh, got hairy and ended up with you pointing the wrong direction. Yeah, so we'll get it. here we go. Replay of that. We've got suspension. a. Looks like we've got a broken wheel on that may have been one of the cars that made contact. So, as we spoke about earlier, oh, we've got here, sorry about that, we've got a change of position here as Mains Ruddy gets the draft down into Danning on Road Corner. Oh, yellow's there. Now, did, did everyone get those passes done prior? That's the yellow for that car that we saw earlier with the broken wheel. So... Let's, uh, I'm sure people will have a look at that and sort it out post-race. Um, but, yeah, what we were saying, great draft by Cody down into Dandenong Road corner and got that move done. Uh, Jake then got up on the curve, just run, Jack got up on the curve, ran a little wide, and that enabled him to fall from, from the lead right back to fourth. That is how tight racing is in Formula Ford. I tell you what, this is uh, textbook Formula Ford racing. A couple of comings together, a little bit of uh, rush of blood here and there, and then get back on with it, focus with the job at hand. And that's what our front pack are doing. Turn four, this was the last time round. And that Very was unfortunate. Nice that looks like Rowe may well have done that on his own very easy to do though like it's these cars are on a knife edge uh first first time he's out racing for jamie so yeah little mistake not a big one jamie Rowe went round down at turn four there we just saw that replay now they're touching each other up at the front of the field now as well we've got we've still got a fair old whack of time here there's eight, over eight minutes left in this race yellow's still out for that uh, car with the broken wheel or broken suspension down sort of entering turn uh, 11 there. And, and that is nullifying a really strong braking manoeuvre, isn't it, as you come into yeah, the uh, definitely. There is that is definitely a passing um, a, a passing zone, one of the passing zones on the track. So, But look, if that car is out of harm's way and it can be controlled under local yellows as the very experienced flag marshals are doing and the very experienced race control, then that's better than us. If we watch this, we'll see a touch Replay. of... Replay. Oh, there's yeah. a touch of wheels to between rear. Frugus and Mains Ruddy. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that's at over 200 kilometres an hour. So that's, <laughs> that is some commitment. Absolutely commitment there as well. That's what I'm touching on. That's what I'm saying. Typical Formula Ford racing, and it is good racing. Just little touches we'll get away with. We don't want to be doing that so we're just getting reports back that it's the 96 of Bailey Collins that's had the uh, suspension or broken wheel issue whatever it was parked up down sort of near the Penrite bridge there in that zone somewhere there's the 31 of Eddie Bezzi up on sitting the in P3 oh. now Paul at this point in the all oh, just dropped back a spot there as well to uh, Eddie Bezic going through with Six laps remaining. I'm going to say the best part is still six laps to go. Are we are we looking for uh, that positioning that possibly isn't in the lead of the race to look after the draft, or are we now too far drawn out? You want to be in the lead. Oh, look, I, I think if you believe, if you're Cody Mains ready, you're probably going to have the eyes forward, head down, and see whether or not you can eke out enough of a gap to believe it's... Uh, it, it's defensible or, or race winning gap. You need to bear in mind that five, six car lengths in these things, you're still in the toe. So unless you think you can put that much in, then you maybe see where you're sitting uh, with one to go. But at, at the moment, if you're in the lead, 
you're just going as quickly as you can trying to build that out hoping that two three uh two three and four behind you we've got a car just on right on the apex of the corner there yeah four. saw some yellows coming in yeah, before there it is there car there number we go five. and uh that is james hagan yep, out of new south wales beautifully Wild. turned out car unfortunate for him to have uh, spun that around but yeah, you're gonna, you're leading the race. It's go as fast as you can. Hope that the guys behind you start fighting and holding each other up and that you can just sneak away for a nice little uncontested win. <laughs> uh, that That's always nice in theory. We've got One a- driving through the sand pit there, yeah, all green car. A bright green car. That's as much as I can give you, uh, dear viewer. I'm sorry about that. It's all that we caught through the dust. Is that uh, Liam Locarno? Uh, oh, Eddie be, Bezik's Eddie in the Bezik lane. There's a broken the wheel there. Yep, so we don't right know front. if that's a consequence of contact or what has happened there. Another slipstreaming move as, uh, who is that? I believe that's Will Lowing in the 53, going through four position. Wow, well, Will Lowing now just leading this uh, very, very heated pack here, and that is from 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th and ninth. Oh, here we've got the spinner with, uh, that is... Hagen looping it at four. Fortunately, the RF86 too. Very fortunately kept it off the wall. Got going again after a brief yellow. Oh, wow, look at this, this is the lead of the is, race. That is the challenge for the lead. Frugus versus Mains Ruddy. No quarter given there. We don't appear to have the yellows down there anymore. So they, they've controlled that with local yellows. I've said everyone's now seen the car is there. We'll take the yellows in and let the let the field go racing through there, Everyone which is fantastic to see. <laughs> Very good to see. Yep, Frugus now leads at main ruddy. Four minutes left to go, so easily still four laps to contest in this race. And we've got quite a lot of cars starting to stack up around the track that aren't going to play any further part. Indeed, we've got a couple that have come into the lane. Of course, Eddie Bezik would be the, the one at the top of that list, a title contender has uh, gone into the lane with a broken car and potentially could have been a couple more as we have seen some wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact. There's another it one like off Gavin there. Dumas is off there in the Crabtree's car and is he going to get that going or is he... Yeah, he seems to be. He's doing the, uh, the Austin Powers 74-point turn. <laughs> Green flags there as well, so yellow's been yep, covered. So we are back to, to racing. Straight. And this is a three-way battle. So to your earlier question, um, Cody is now trying to think about positioning himself for that last lap contact. Oh, and Frugus has run wide coming out of Dandy Road. And once again, one small mistake. First to third, Jack Bussey says, thank you, guys. I will have the lead. Yeah, certainly Jack Bussey stamped his authority on that. Took two cars in one fell swoop there as well. Cody Mains running left wondering uh, where he actually came from. So uh, Bussey now leads the race to Mains Ruddy. Frugus, Lachlan Strickland, William Lowing was the next one in the line last time around. There's been quite the battle going on for that. We have yellows now being waved Lots. as they come into one. Who have we got around there? No one that I can see greens after it. Uh, possibly after it, yep. there were greens after it. Perhaps this uh, one of the red Formula 1600s potentially spun and gathered it up again. This is the path in the last lap. Very willing. Oh. There goes Mains Ruddy. Has to oh, check it up. A very slight touch of wheels as Main Ruddy went through. Just arrested his progress as well. And Jack said, thank you very much. Where did he come from, Darren? Well, he was that large green and white thing that had been filling Cody's mirrors for about the last three laps. Have a look at this, Cody. You're at Mains Ruddy. Looks at the inside. Nicely, Affects the manoeuvre there in the number 69. Executed. Nicely done there. And, Payback. And as you'll see, compared to these guys learn so quickly Last time that move was put on him, Jack overreacted, got up on that curb and fell back. This time around, he's much smarter. He said, yep, you got me here. I'm still going to get a good run and I'm going to hang with you. And we've still got a race on. And you want to be pretty careful next time we come down into Dandenong Road because I might be there again. We've at least got two more laps to go as the field streams on around with a minute and uh, 30 seconds left on the clock, plus a lap. 
And there is a uh, older Van Diemen that they're starting to sneak up on there as well. Let's hope the blue flags are out for the 25, which is Jared Hurst. We are hearing, uh, we are hearing that there are two to go. Two laps to go is the word we've heard from our nice man in our ear that gives us these updates. Hopefully is there a man in our ear? Uh, apparently so. I travel every day with this voice. Hopefully this time around he's a little more reliable than he was last time when we had two laps to go twice. <laughs> We cannot fault him, though. He works no, very, very I, I hard. No, I wouldn't dare because he controls the uh, the captioning on the screen and uh, certain things can be put up on the screen about you if you have nothing. We have, nothing. We have, we nothing. have nothing but respect nothing. Yes, that's right. for that individual. As we do for the battle going on on our Absolutely. screens right now, the dip in at the top of the hill here. We're looking at the... Uh, the battle which is just outside the top five. The 53 is Will Lowing, second in this group. Seven is Zach Lobko. Good return from Zach. He started out at 14. Hasn't had a, 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 the best of weekend. Certainly one of the ones with best experience. Last lap board being displayed yep. to the field now as well. Just uh, confirming that. And but let's have a look at this. Will Lowing out of New South Wales. Off the back of this. We're now back now with the what, front runners. What can Jack do? Last lap. Can he hold on? Has he, uh, can he hold on? Is he, is this a game of chess? Is he, uh, no one wants to lead onto the back straight as we can see. Now, is, is Frugus in the box seat to get that run up the back and pass them both? Or has Jack got himself enough of a run to protect? Oh, I'm not going to call this. That is <laughs> They're going to commit to anything. Close to yeah, yeah. And, and that's just because you've been around long enough. And when you see three Formula Fords line us stern with each other yep. in the marbles, going up the back straight, no one's going to commit to no, this. That's nicely this. done. Jack has covered now. Can he cover off? Here is going to be the last. As soon as he gets a good run out of here, this will be close. It's great driving by Jack, a very mature drive. Uh, mistake free so far this lap, he says, hoping not to put the curse. Little black jelly bean on him. Yeah, and away, around he goes he here. He should it's... be able to hold on. Oh, has he overcooked it there? This is going to be so close. Sensational drive. And the win to Jack Bussey by 0 0.028 of a second. Sensational drive and race amongst those top three. Katie Maines, Ruddy and uh, Daniel Frugus for the top three. And as they fl filled across, Lachlan Strickland, Zach Lobko, up to sixth, Fraser High. That's sensational. Fraser High did a clutch at the start of that last race. And so the team have worked tirelessly, gave his dad some good practice in uh, clutch changing, got a new clutch fitted into that, and uh, comes out and drives from the back up to sixth. That's sensational for him. Good drive by the Spectrum Racer there as well. Will Lowing, that was a big mix up. Zach Lobko, of course, I've got to say, the drive of the race there out of 14th to get himself into P5 there. Fraser High with mechanical marvel type attitude going on there with his, uh, with his old man. Will Lowing will go back to, uh, back to New South Wales with a good points haul there. He's had some good steady results. 38 points. It's hard to get uh, taken away from Cody Maines running who uh, has started off his Victorian title hunt very, very nicely. Two wins in a second. Yeah. I, I know he would have loved it to have been three wins. Yep. Yeah, and it almost was. It is so much. It was so close. So it was sensational racing all weekend from him. Uh, and also from Jack, and in fact, throughout the field. And what a way for the uh, for the final race of the weekend to go. A couple of little incidents there, but no red flags, no safety cars. Well done to these young chargers. And Great here racing have... by the entire Formula field, Ford field today. Really enjoyed this. I, I struggle to find a time where I don't enjoy Formula Ford racing. I guess it's when we have elongated safety car races, but when they are released, uh, always fantastic. So and close. He, here you go. The results up there. Jack Bussey, Cody Maines, Ruddy and Daniel Frugus. Quarter of a second across the top three. That's, that's close racing. Isn't it? Lockie Strickland in uh, four. Zach Lobko, five. That's a terrific drive. Should be pretty proud of that coming back from starting off down in 14th. Fraser High, great uh, result there for the 11. William Lowing, big drive back up the Hume. Bit of a scratch of the brow and see what we can bring to uh, round number two at Winton in a couple of weeks' time. Imogen Radbourne, Lockie, Evanet, Lockie uh, Logan Everly there in the 10. Jack Bussey, fastest lap in the race, 116.15. Carly Fleming, Jamie Rowe, Jack Wynack in the 30. Richard Davison home in uh, 14th in the 40 there. Ethan Fitzgerald. Well, in fact, first in the Formula yep. Ford 1600s. Yep. Uh, Andrew Torty, Adrian Wilkinson, Malcolm Coleman, 
Jared Hurst, Mark Zellner there as well, home in 20th place. Gavin Dumas uh, down a lap, Phil Marin on down a lap, and James Hagen, Eddie Bezik, Bailey Collins, and Liam Locano not taking any further part. All three of them would have liked to have taken points away from this one, Paul. Indeed, and all three of them with the potential to have been uh, championship contenders as well. So desperately unlucky start to the year for them. But, hey, it's a long season. You it, stay in there, you keep racking up the points and the chips can fall your way. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Paul Zitti, thank you so much again for your time today. Your insight is uh, fantastic. Really enjoy having you here. And uh, when you're not, when you're out racing, I know you really enjoy yourself a whole lot more. Indeed I do. But mic me up and I'll commentate from there. Yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, you, Paul. Catch you later. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, not too far to go before uh, we have our final race for the weekend. Of course, Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships goes to Winton on March 16, 17. Then we go to Phillip Island on 17, 18, 19 of May. Back here at Sandown in August 23, 24, 25. Phillip Island, 20, 21, 22 of, uh, of September. And then Calder, 26, 27 of October for the Triple Eight Home Loans. Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. We've got the uh, final race coming up in just a couple of moments' time. It'll be saloon cars. Stay with us. It should be a fun race. Track map here at Sandown International Motor Raceway. 13 corners make up the distance. The action zones at uh, 1, 4, 6 and uh, arguably other places around the track. Yeah, big long run down to turn 4. And uh, Dan McCarthy joins me as a bit of footage from XL. You probably remember calling that one, do you, mate? With uh, synchronised rollovers. Yes, me and Steve DeFries couldn't believe what we were seeing. As you say, synchronised rollovers copying each other. A bit of action in HQs this weekend, and that was from last year. That's uh, quite modest for HQ standards. Uh, the big, long back straight always produces lots of action when they get to the uh, tight section down here into Dandenong Road. We saw a few lockups and things in saloon cars, and uh, that'll be much the same in this one. Really, really looking forward to this one. Great way to end the weekend with the saloon cars, 18 minutes of on-track action ahead of us. 13 turns, 3.1 kilometers and over 60 years this track has been here. We know that it probably doesn't have too much longer left in its uh, time span, but we will take advantage of it while it is still here. It's a great racetrack, so much character. And uh, very much looking forward to seeing this. Of course, lots of Fords and Holdens have raced at Sandown over the years. Of course, back in the ATCC days and supercars. And of course, now uh, saloon cars. These guys have been coming here for many years as well. It's been a very popular category. It was a national category for many years. You and uh, the legend GOB used to call uh, those did. races. We did. Enjoyed the dial before you dig era of racing. And... Uh, there's still some of those guys and girls around and uh, Victorians always did very, very well in uh, that. Simon Tabiner and uh, Gavin Ross, who when they do come out in the Victorian saloon cars, still go very, very well. Big shout out to Gav Ross. He's probably watching this from GMG in Box Hill, the uh, mechanical workshop there. He always uh, been a fantastic racer. We're on board with this one with Daniel Johnson and uh, he is currently the Victorian champion and uh, as you just alluded to there Dan it probably is the last bastion of the Aussie built and legendary uh, I guess rivalry between the Fords and the Holdens probably less pronounced because there's really no factory involvement in no, these no. it's uh, it's it's mate versus mate and state versus state really these days but uh, certainly a, uh, a ripping field and uh, have a look at this car leading uh, leading them away with uh, of course Jamo and Pridmore just up the road coming around 
DJ I spoke to him just before this race. He said, I've got the onboard camera. He says, what I want is for a uh, <laughs> quite tame. I don't want to see uh, too much action. I just want you to watch me driving. I don't want to see cars spearing off and everything. So anyway, here is the grid. South Australian Sean Jamison will go from first. He's won the first two races of the weekend ahead of Karen Pridmore in uh, the first of the Commodores, a VT Commodore. Then we've got DJ, the man we just were on board with in third, ahead of Travis Lindorf, who uh, himself has had a pretty uh, up and down weekend, but a brilliant march from the back of the field to finish fourth in the last race. The names continue to come through. Adam Lowndes had a nice consistent start to the year. He'll come out of fifth, head of Kane Baxter-Smith, who uh, was a regular and a regular frontrunner in the Nationals days. He returns this weekend and comes out of sixth, head of Tony Ordino and James Jeske, rounding out the top eight. Beyond that, we've got Kerry Bright, who uh, has entered this series from XLs in uh, the off-season. And we've got Dylan Gray, another newcomer, and is leading the older spec machines in 10th. Ahead of Darren uh, Ke uh, Curitis. I'm still not getting that right, I apologise. <laughs> Keegan <laughs> Gorn. Uh, now 13th will not be William Harris. I'll explain that in just a moment. Then we've got Robert Knight, Justin Shembury, uh, Andrew McSwain, after a big spin at this very corner earlier on. Comes from 16th, Jackson Griffith in 17th. And I alluded to uh, not Will Harris, no. Kevin Stutman is jumping in for this final race of the, the weekend in that machine. So he'll be coming from the back of the grid in the uh, black and green EA Falcon. Going to be interesting to see what uh, Stutman can do. Uh, he, uh, he was originally entered to do the saloon cars this week and then decided just to focus on his sports sedan. But, uh, Bill Harris deciding not to uh, race in this final one. And Kevin immediately put his hand up, ran to race control. This has only happened in a matter of moments before the start of this race. But he is lined up on the back of the grid. Looking forward to this then. It'd be good to see Stoopy in a saloon car, always entertaining. I don't think he's going to be able to match the pace of the cars up the front there. Just watching that third row of the grid here, Dan, with uh, Baxter Smith and Adam Lowndes. But certainly, whenever Jamo takes the grid in a Ford or a Holden, you've got to pay full attention to what's going on there as the field streams away. And it looks like mid-pack, we're going to go four wide. <laughs> I don't think that's mid-pack. That's right near the front. That's the front, think, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, they're at least three wide at the moment, that's for sure. Again, came back to Smith. Brilliant start. Double front lock-up. There's a bit of contact with uh, Jamison and Pridmore, but for the first time all weekend long, it's not Jamison leading. Came back to Smith from sixth on the grid. This is an amazing start. What a good start for the 56 Swift Solar there. And this is what the field need to do to, uh, Scott, uh, to Jamo there. He really does need to be, uh, Sean Jamison, not Scott, Sean Jamison, uh, he needs to be abated before turn one and bottled up. They really all need to almost gang up on him and uh, just leave him back in the pack, otherwise he just drives away with it. The rest of the field streaming on through and uh, the 33 of Darren Kritzis goes through very nicely indeed. But have a look at this, out in front, out of uh, the 56, out of sixth position, and I tell you what, the 66 is going, where did you come from? I was on the front row. I'm Kieran Pridmore. I'm coming at you. And Sean Jamison now in the boomer signs entry, just getting a little bit loose coming out of there. He's eager to run with them. They get mirrors torn off, almost torn off back to Smith's car. It's hanging on by the wiring. But wow, look at this. Sean Jamison's going to go wide, very, very wide. Carries the speed, though. Flows the car, even though he was on the dirt. Crowds over right onto Karen Pridmore. Kieran Pridmore there, and here we are right alongside with uh, Daniel Johnson, and this is what he said he didn't want to see, he just wanted a nice easy race. Yes, is certainly right, but he's supplying great images to us and you watching at home on Blendline TV as they go side by side, they're rubbing door panels. Out wide goes Jamison, but he holds on, and now we're firing up the inside DJ on the inside of Pridmore, there's contact. Oh, Pridmore just about keeps it in a straight line, and so does DJ. And here comes Travis Lindorf. He takes fourth position down there into turn number four. They've certainly uh, taken the gloves off for this last one, haven't they? Very reminiscent of like a Toka Touring Cars type of uh, era. That right there, you uh, you open the door up for one guy to give him a bit of room, and someone else fills the gap yes. very, very quickly indeed. But wow, 
All things oh. change and they stay the same. A lock up in the race. Leader, the 56. Guys, they take evasive action. But, whoa, the 59. Left front slides into, into turn number nine there as well. Gets out of the corner nicely. Pridmore goes through. And uh, that was... Um, Baxter Smith Baxter falling Baxter Smith going back a spot there as well with that mirror hanging off. And Lindorf going around the outside as well at the penultimate corner. And there he goes now up the inside. the inside. He's done. He's done that nicely. And DJ's got a good run on Baxter Smith. We've seen this all weekend from Kane Baxter Smith. Brilliant start, brilliant opening lap, and then he seems to fall back quite quickly. He's already now down to fifth position, and I'm sure Adam Lowndes would like to uh, follow the rest of the group through and into the uh, top five as well. As we go down the gearbox into turn number one, Jamison has bolted. He's only been in the lead three kilometers, but he has taken off into the distance. The fight, though, very much on for second, and this is a bit further back from the uh, recovering McSwain. He's missing a few uh, bumpers and uh, tail lights, but nevertheless, he is out there in the 34 machine. A bit of a uh, smoke signal from James Jeske just ahead there. Good battle here. Actually, uh, Tony Dino's lost a bit of ground in uh, the early stages of this one. He's at the back of this five car train and then beyond that there is uh, Kevin Stutman just at the very back of the shot about to come through now any second there he is Kevin Stutman a uh, good drive he's made up a few places on the uh, opening couple of laps Tony Ordino hasn't really featured in the uh, the racing here this weekend he's sort of just had a bit of a back of shot type of role uh, he was talking, I was talking to him just before this race and he was saying to me, uh, just the engine, he, he says I'm, I'm at least 12 k's down on every single straight to those around me. Oh wow, So I want that at Sandown. No, exactly right. You can, so. you can cope with it at Winton, you can even sort of cope, kind of cope with it at Phillip Island, but not here. No. Not here. There's the 91, we're just getting a good look at, lurching its way through the final bit there. That's uh, Jet Ski there and doing a very good job just in the uh, rear vision mirror as we go back up to the front now a bit of battle scars on the 59 runs a bit close with people gets the elbows out there goes the uh, casey accident repairs car of travis lindor for a moment into second holds on pridmore wants it just as much and they're going to get pretty racy with each other these two commodore races and right in the back of shot there it is daniel johnson going get racy boys i'll uh, i'll just watch on for the next half a lap or so oh, getting really close to the concrete wall aren't they using all of the road out there fastest lap of the race last time through you can see at the bottom of your screens travis lindorf is now in second and he is going to be trying to catch our race leader jamison who so far this weekend has uh, taken both the race victories but uh, last race the quickest man on the track was Lindorf but he had to come all the way from the back of the field this is now a fair fight between those two at the front Ford versus Holden and it's Ford versus Holden for third as Pridmore drops two wheels through the grass out wide on the outside uh, Johnson not quite close enough to uh, take advantage of that on this occasion this time through but uh, they are nose to tail, third and fourth. Really good racing between all of the front-running saloon car drivers this weekend. Eight minutes left, and Lindorf again, fastest lap of the race. Nine tenths faster than Sean Jamison. It is on now at the pointy end of this field. Lindorf is right on the tail of Jamison as they tip it into turn number one. Turn number two now. There he is. This is the first time we've seen Jamison really challenged, closed up. Of course, he did lose the lead at the start of this one, but this is the first time anyone's really matched him on pure pace all weekend long. How's Kieran Pridmore sliding through turn four then? On the full aisle, opposite lock, driving out over the ribbon strips and landing off the back of the Pertec ripple strip and uh, just driving on through there. So using absolutely anything he's got left under the bridge stones at the end of this weekend. But very impressive performance here by Travis Lindorf to come up through the field. And of course, he, uh, where did Travis come up? Out of position four and to now be challenging with the guy that really has just dominated from uh, the gate opening at the start of this weekend. And uh, he is right with him here at the moment. So let's get behind Travis Lindorf in the KC Accident Repair. This would have to be his home track. KC Accident Repair is not too far away from here indeed. Whereas uh, Sean Jamison's got a long old drive home tonight. Back to SA. 
We don't want to be in inhospitable to you and your uh, fellow South Australians, Dan, <laughs> but uh, we certainly want to try and get at least one Victorian win in the saloon cars this weekend. Well, it might be happening right now because here comes Travis Lindorf looking up the inside. Jamison defending fairly and cleanly. Using the curb, bouncing off at turn number one. Lindorf, great run, forcing Jamison to go defensive into turn number two as well. This is a really high quality race in between these two. Of course, uh, both of them former Victorian States uh, Series champions in saloon cars. In fact, three of the top four, in fact, four of the top five, I can keep going backwards. Pridmore, the only one of the top five that hasn't won the uh, State Series. Although Baxter Smith, actually, I'm not sure if he uh, did a stay series. Wait, yeah, Joss has given her a bit of a wave. I'm coming at you. Look at that. I love it. <laughs> bit of personality shown there by Daniel Johnson. Can't be a quietly uh, spoken gentleman, but uh, just giving him the air. Yeah, you keep going, buddy. Keep your eyes in the head, and I'll, uh, I'll let you know as I come through. Love it. That's great. I think he knows that Pridmore has the pace to uh, keep up with those two ahead and he's saying, you just focus on your job. <laughs> I'll follow you along. Let's make this a four-car battle. <laughs> get on you there, Daniel. Uh, we won't be thinking of the camera at all. He'll be just thinking of, I've got to get into this guy's mind. If he's going to look at me, look at me in the mirrors, I'm going to give him the hand signals to tell him I'm coming on through. Good exit from Lindor. That's what I love about this sort of racing, oh, Dan, good. is it's that good. it's just so much emotion with the drivers and uh, they, just, they just love it. Lowndes going defensive against Kane Baxter Smith a little bit further back, but let's look at the lead because once again Jamison had to defend Lindorf right there. There might have been a little bit of a touch up there midway through turn one. Lindorf's going, well, it's a little too early to go defensive here, Sean. Come on, let's. Uh, oh, and again defensive into turn number four. This is fantastic racing. Oh, sliding out there was Lindorf, and so again Pridmore. Spends his whole life going sideways, I think, Karen Pridmore. Really putting on a show, sliding up close to the camera. Lowndes has slightly extended that margin over Baxter Smith, this time through. And then we can see McSwain a little bit further behind as they go over the crest of the hill into turn six. Jamison looks good around there. And then under the brakes, this is where Lindorf is very, very strong. And are Pridmore and Johnson closing? Let's have a look at their last laps. 26-1 for both of the leaders. 25-8 for both third and fourth. So they are edging ever so slightly closer, lap on lap. But they need these two to keep fighting if they want to uh, close that margin down by the end of this motor race. There's four and a half minutes exactly left on the clock as they cross the line. What can Lindorf do this time? Can he go for an inside move? Jamison's blocked that off the last couple of times, and it looks like he's drifting over to do the same again. Lindorf decides the outside line this time for a good cutback, and he's got a good cutback as well. Can he go to the inside in turn number two? He's very close. Again, Jamison defense. This is great racing from the pair. Oh, Jamison kicks it out sideways. Lindorf right on his tail and more sideways action. These two behind the closing. Oh, Pridmore, I think he touched the wall. That was so close. If he didn't, yep, I think there's a bit of damage. Pridmore definitely got the wall at turn number three. We really shot to the, uh, got to that camera angle at the perfect time. Look at this. So much smoke coming from the back of the car. The rear right clouting the concrete wall at high speed. If I was carrying, I'd be lifting here at this point. And it allows DJ to close right up. Can't go around the outside, but I'm not sure that tire on Pridmore's is going to last till the end of this motor race. That is a lot of tire rubbing going on at this portion of the race with three minutes to go. This is brilliant camera uh, camera work from uh, what Blendline TV have done and DJ supplying those shots to us. Fantastic there. I tell you what, though, right at the moment, this is a harrowing ride for Daniel Johnson just watching the car in front. He knows that it's got a tire failing on it because he's getting covered in black stuff being fired at him. Here he goes. They come back around out of turn four. Here comes Kieran Pridmore. Oh. There it is. And I'm surprised we've still got a lens in the camera there with the amount of debris that got blown by. Again, Lindorf having a look and forcing Jamison to lock up that time. So he is right there now, Travis Lindorf, and a change for third position. 
DJ goes through. I think Pridmore might be trying to nurse the thing to the line now. The uh, number 66 Commodore taking a beating. In fact, I'm not even sure that's tracking rides at the back of the car. It's taken quite a hit. I reckon there's a bent something there, some yeah. sort of trailing arm, even a hub or something like that, because that's nasty. The car's not exactly behaving as it has been and uh, he has been driving the wheels off it and uh, well he's been driving the wheels into the barriers that's how hard he's been driving and uh, i've got to say entertainment factor 12 out of 10 for uh, what kieran pridmore's put on this weekend speaking of entertainment factor sean jamison sideways under brakes down into dandin on road he's doing everything he possibly can really showing his uh, his years in the saloon cars he's been around for so many years has sean jamison and so has travis lindorf had a bit of a uh, break for a couple of years came back midway through last season and he really wants the title this year wasn't the race one he wanted but it's been good since then and he's got a great run down the pit straight can he do anything with it this time for the first time he's got the inside line down in towards turn number one but again jamison closes the door but again a lockup this is fantastic i keep saying it but i just can't get over how close and exciting this is we very much have saved the best till last haven't we this weekend this is a cracking battle ford versus holden lindorf comes to the inside he's got aggressive they're banging door panels and he still can't make it stick into turn number four he's throwing everything at it but jamison has all of the answers at this stage of the race Pridmore now coming under attack from Lowndes behind, but we can't take our eyes off the action at the front of the field. I look here, Rob Knight not too far ahead. Will the lap traffic play a factor? Rob's normally very good with uh, the leaders, very heads up driver, and uh, I'm sure he will move out of the way, but there we go, Lowndes through into fourth position. Into, uh, so he's now the second best of the Commodores. Last lap board being readied at the Crow's Nest now for our racers as they make their way around through turns 9, 10, 11 and 12. And uh, we head off onto the final lap of round one of the Triple Eight Home Loans Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. Big shout out to Excalibur Screwbolts for their efforts with the saloon cars here this weekend. Let's run through it as they head off on their uh, final journey around this fantastic racetrack. Jamison to Lindorf, Travis Johnson lounges up one, Pridmore goes down one, Baxter Smith in sixth place, ranging at the front of the field, in fact led the race into turn number one was Baxter Smith, McSwain to Griffith, Bright, Shembury, Kevy Stoopman about to put one of the older cars inside the top ten, he'll be driving the wheels off it after sadly his Evo not performing in sports and here this weekend. Let's watch this one, Dan, all the way through. The two leaders, Jamison and Travis Lindorf. Let's see if Trav can get that chicken flag. Again, it was Lindorf with the better exit all the way up the hill. That'll be playing dividends, or paying dividends, I should say. So go over the crest. Will the number 33 play a factor in the closing corners? Lindorf not close enough to make a move at turn number six, that's for sure. And down into Dandy Road, Jamison defends again. That's a big lockup. That was one of the biggest lockups he's had so far. Had to really wrestle the wheel to get it turned into the tight left-hander. And Lindorf is close enough to have a real look, a real chance at taking the race victory. But I don't think it's going to quite be enough. He's got a good exit, a very good exit. Jamison's all sideways. They're going to be side by side to the line, but. Jamison holds on by <laughs> Travis Lindor bouncing it off the rep limiter to the line there as well. Wow, well done to Travis Lindorf taking it up to Jamo. For him though, three from three this weekend, Dan. Yeah, really, really good performance. Had to fight for it though in that last one. Travis Lindorf certainly the quicker of the two, but could not find a way by. Have to say, well done to uh, Daniel Johnson. Third place. That's three third places for the uh, race weekend. So very solid start to uh, his championship defense, that is for sure. And we have to say thank you for the uh, great camera work that uh, he did in that one. And here we are in the uh, older spec machines. Uh, quite uh, remarkable to see or uh, know that Kevin Stutman is behind the wheel of that one. We've had two different winners 
in the uh, oldest bet class category so far this weekend. This will be a third. So uh, it's between the other two behind, though, for who's going to take the uh, round honours. I'm sure Stutman enjoyed himself out there. As you say, it's not been the uh, greatest weekend for him in the sports sedan, but he comes home with a win in the older spec cars, the EA Falcon in 10th position, and set his PB on the last lap as well at 29.7. So he's uh, getting used to... Oh, sorry, I'm looking at Shembury there, 29.7. He actually buttoned off a little bit. Gray comes home in position number 12. That's enough for him to take round honours in the older spec car class. Uh, very nicely done on his uh, debut in the series. Daniel Johnson on screen now, just waving uh, g'day and thanks to all of the officials trackside. He has not missed a flag point yet to give him a wave and a, a thumbs up. And that's the kind of guy he is. A, uh, a great bloke. Competitors love him. His fellow competitors love him. The officials get always get a good wave from him. And a very big thank you. And I'm pretty sure Daniel typed that up across the bottom of the screen <laughs> while he was there. Thanks to the officials and volunteers to become a motorsport official. Visit motorsport.org.au forward slash officials. So a very big thank you in what has turned out to be quite a warm day with uh, full sunlight. So I reckon we're going to see some uh, red faces and a bit of T-shirt tans as the uh, officials come in yes. from this one. Here's the results, Dan. Absolutely. Sean Jamison. Doing it for the South Australians. Three out of three ahead of <laughs> oh. Travis Lindell. Uh, Daniel Johnson coming home in third. Just 4.2 seconds behind Adam Lowndes in fourth. Kane Baxter-Smith taking fifth place on the uh, final lap there ahead of the uh, wounded Karen Pridmore Commodore. Andrew McSwain coming home in seventh. Good recovery for him ahead of Jackson Griffith, Kerry Bright and Justin Shembury. Travis Lindorf, the fastest lap of the race, and I guess that's one of the telling tales out of this. He can hold his head high, but he took it up to Jamo in the last one, got the fastest lap of the race. So well done to Travis Lindorf and the uh, Casey Accident Repair crew doing a, uh, a tremendous job, as have you, Dan. A terrific uh, weekend of delivering some fantastic commentary for the saloon cars and the, the Vic V8s, the XLs and Formula Vs. You combine magnificently with Steve DeVries. So a big thank you to you and Steve for uh, all of the work that you've done here this weekend. And thank you, Darren no, Smith, not the voice problem. of the uh, Vic State Race Series. I'm pretty sure that's the National Treasure, isn't it, that David Amor? <laughs> no, he's just the National Treasure. You can't have everything, can you? Here's our calendar going forward. We've done round one. I can't believe it's done and dusted. I was really looking forward to this weekend, and it delivered. Winton, 15, 16, 17 of March. You have a great time at the Adelaide Motorsport Festival, thank Dan. You, we thank will you. miss you. 17, 19 of May at Phillip Island. Sandown back here, 23, 24, 25 of August. Uh, September 22, uh, 20 to 22 at Phillip Island. Calder will round out the year 25, 26, 27 of October. We'd love to thank our broadcast partners at Blendline TV, Shane, Trav, Dan down there in the van with uh, Liz and Dot also in the van down the uh, behind the control tower here and all of their crew right around the track side. All of our volunteer officials that make this up and a very big shout out and thank you to the entire competitor base that enable us to go racing each and every round of the Victorian State Circuit Racing Championships. I'm Darren Smith. I hope to see you at the next round at Winton in a few weeks' time. Between now and then, stay safe. See you at the next one.